Welcome to this virtual hearing for the inquiry into floodplain harvesting. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of, of the land on which Parliament sits. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people watching this hearing today. Hearing to be held by electronic means. Today's hearing is this committee's second and is being conducted virtually. This enables the work of the committee to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. As we break new ground with the technology, I ask for everyone's patient through patience through any technical difficulties we may encounter today. If participants lose their internet connection and are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they're asked to rejoin the hearing by using the same link as provided by the committee secretariat. Today, we will hear from a number of stakeholders, including water, environmental and policy experts, organisations representing landowners, farmers and other water users and Indigenous representative bodies. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the virtual hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it's important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days of receipt of the transcript. Today's proceedings are being streamed live and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. Finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise disruptions and assist our Hansard reporters. Can I ask committee members to clearly state who questions are directed to and could I ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking? Could everyone please mute their microphones when they're not speaking? Please remember to turn your microphones back on just a few seconds before you're getting ready to speak. And if you start speaking while muted, please start your question or answer again so it can be recorded in the transcript. Members and witnesses, please avoid speaking over each other so we can all be heard clearly. If you speak over each other, not like basically what you hear can't be heard by, um, trans by Hansard. I remind members and witnesses to speak directly into the microphone and avoid making comments when your head is turned away from the microphone. I now welcome our first witnesses. So could each witness please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation from the cards that have been emailed to you by the Secretariat. I'll start with you, Professor Richard Kingsford. Uh, I'm Professor Richard Kingsford. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Moving to you, Ms. Kate McBride. My name is Kate McBride. I'm an Am Cantor Fellow at the Australia Institute. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. And finally, to Mr. Rod Campbell. Uh, Rod Campbell, Research Director at the Australia Institute. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you so much. Now we we'll move to opening statements. You have an opportunity to make a short opening statement. Professor Kingsford, do you have one for the committee? I do. I acknowledge the Bidjigal people that are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on and also all original custodians of the land where the rivers are that are the focus of this inquiry. I pay my respects to all those elders, both past, present and emerging, and extend my respect to other First Nations people here today. Floodplains are not just administrative or legal entities. They are simply places where rivers flow over their banks. 
They make up most of a river's area. I've heard evidence even in this inquiry that such floodwaters are lost or wasted and we need more efficiency. Floodplain waters connect an incredibly complex network of ecosystems. They infiltrate into soils and groundwater and supply tens of thousands of flood dependent plant, animal and other species. Healthy floodplains are essential to healthy rivers and healthy people because they deliver water and ecosystem services on the river and downstream to First Nations people, fishers and other users. Thousands of kilometres of structures crisscross the floodplains of the Murray-Darling Basin, changing the natural flooding to aquatic ecosystems, including Ramsar listed wetlands. It is not just about the storages or their volume, but also the levee banks and channels which change the natural patterns of floods. I am one of the few scientists who has investigated the effects of structures on floodplains and modelled river flows. There are solutions for management of the issue, but also significant pitfalls. Importantly, we don't need to just rely on models, but could establish flow targets where the amount of real water in the river is measured. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Now for the Australia Institute, would one of you like to give an opening statement? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today. The Australia Institute is an independent research organisation based in Canberra. The Institute has an extensive back catalogue of research on Murray-Darling Basin and other water issues in Australia. The environmental, social, legal and cultural arguments for a major reduction in floodplain harvesting volumes have been well made in other submissions to this inquiry. Our submission addresses the potential economic impacts of such a reduction. Our research found that significantly reducing floodplain harvesting, such as to a level consistent with CAP, would be, would be likely to have minimal economic impact. The reason economic impacts would be limited is due to the export orientated and capital intensive nature of cotton production, which is what the vast majority of floodplain harvesting water is used for. Even in major cotton producing regions, such as Narrabri, cotton accounts for less than 5% of jobs. Furthermore, despite a reputation for high profits, major cotton producers rarely pay significant, am significant amount of tax, according to the Australian Taxation Office data. Our research also compares the types of jobs between the agricultural heavy northern basin to the manufacturing heavy southern basin. Reducing floodplain harvesting in the north could increase water use in the south, where it is used where its use is likely to be more jobs intensive due to the greater level of value adding that occurs there. As a result, reducing floodplain harvesting could actually increase overall employment across the basin. We support the licensing of floodplain harvesting, provided the level of take is brought under cap and the sustainable diversion limit is not expanded to cover historical take. The licensing of floodplain harvesting must address illegal floodplain works. We also acknowledge the current modelling is not fit for purpose. To ensure river connectivity and end of system flows, flow targets must be introduced downstream that are based on environmental, cultural and basin landholder needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McBride. We'll go straight to questions now. So questions from the opposition. Um, is it Ms Rose Jackson? Yes, thank you, Chair. And thank you um, for coming along today, uh, witnesses, and for the written submissions that you've provided and the um, opening statements that you've complemented them with. Um, I wanted to start just with your views on a couple um, of, you know, maybe some of the contested um, evidence that we've um, heard in this inquiry and has, um, you know, been the subject of written submissions as well. Um, first, I, I think to you, Professor Kingsford, although um, others are welcome to comment, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your research um, on the impact of extraction in the northern basin on ecosystems in the southern basin and i know that that you've done a particular um particularly significant body of research around the menindee lakes for example um i suppose just in the context of you know we've heard some evidence that it's really just climatic changes and climate change in particular um that is causing um, negative environmental impacts on the Southern Basin, and I'm sure that's a contributory factor. But I mean, have you done any research on what actual extraction um, in the Northern Basin, and, and I suppose particularly um, floodplain harvesting, what impact that has um, on environmental outcomes in the Southern Basin? 
Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, it's it's important to understand what is going on in terms of floodplain harvesting and the ecology of the northern basin. Essentially, each of those major rivers, the Macquarie, the Guaida, the Namoy, the Border Rivers, Connemine, Ballon, Warrego, right across, have vast floodplains. So the water comes down those rivers and spreads out across that area. It then will come back into the main stem of the river, into the Darling River, and make its way down to Menindee Lakes and where it is stored. In natural flows, it used to make its way all the way down to the River Murray and into the southern section. It's true to say that most of the water in the northern basin is retained, would have been retained naturally in the northern basin. It would have um, gone to a whole range of different ecosystems, including Ramsar wetlands like the Macquarie Marshes, and supported red gums, native fish species on those floodplains, and also the Darling River floodplains. And it's it's um, and then the remaining water would have gone down and flooded the Menindee Lakes, which flooded much more often than people realise. Um, the um, 1901 Royal Commission has some evidence there from a landholder about how often those Menindee Lakes flooded. So, but they would have varied, and then the water would have gone down the two Anna branches, uh, the Anna branch of the Darling River and the main stem of the Darling River down to the River Murray and would have contributed to flows in the riverland around Chowla, and some of it would have gone down to the lower lakes. I should just, just add to that. Um, we know that um, about nearly 90% of the rivers um, in the Murray-Darling Basin are made up of floodplains, so it's a significant area, and most of that is privately owned. Part of um, the conclusion that we can draw from that is that um, the waters on those floodplains are important, not just in terms of the flows and the connectivity down to the southern basin, but actually on environmental outcomes in the northern basin, you know, on those wetlands and other environmental assets that are in the northern basin. And so when we're talking about, um, you know, targets, flow targets or triggers, they would be perhaps not only just in relation to connectivity through the river down to the south, but also environmental outcomes within the northern basin. Is that correct? Oh, that's fundamentally true. When, when, when you talk about the dimensions of this issue, it's essentially one is a longitudinal dimension, uh, dimension down the river, so a flow target at the end of a system, so at the end of, say, the Macquarie or the Namoy or the Guaida, but then ideally you'd also have lateral dimensions because we're talking about floodplains that go out to the side. Some of that water might come back into the river, but a lot of it goes into groundwater. It goes, infiltrates the soils. It supplies water to a whole range of flood dependent um, organisms like, like river red gums and cooler bar and black box. So yes, it is fundamentally important in those dimensions. So flow targets need to be devised for each of the river systems and at different places on those river systems. One more question and then um, hand to my colleagues. I think Mr. Mr. Beach and Ms. Sharp have questions too. Um, in uh, your submission, I think it is, um, there's a statement that there is a direct correlation between on-farm storage development and decreased inflows and catchment water yield. Um, I mean, that's something that's been a little bit contested. Um, uh, you know, evidence from others has suggested that there's not really a correlation between on-farm storage development and, and, and water flow. Um, could you just perhaps, you know, elaborate a little bit on some of the research that's contributed to that conclusion in your submission? Sure. Um, I think it's important to think about um, a, a global water balance. So when you're talking about water from a river, it includes the amount of water that's regulated upstream, how much is pumped out um, with uh, unregulated flows or supplementary flows, and then also floodplain harvesting. As um, this inquiry has heard, those floodplain harvesting um, aspects kick in when you have essentially the, the river overbanks. So at any point when the river starts to flow, or in fact, when you have what are called distributaries, those are creek systems that come in downstream of the major dams, they can also be intercepted. 
So all of those processes can contribute to the take in um, floodplain harvesting. It's true to say that, um, and this is the practice, that obviously in large floods, you get much more floodplain harvesting because essentially that water is going across the floodplains. But it is also those large floods that are essential for these ecosystems. It is at those times when that water spreads out that there's a vast amount of habitat for native fish species, for water birds, for frogs, for vegetation. And even though they're rare, they are critical to the river systems. You cannot just rely on a river system having what goes down the main uh, stem of the river. So to your key question, um, yes, they do have an impact and they impact particularly on those large floods. And they impact both at the scale of actually on the floodplain where they're situated um, in stopping. And it's not just the storage volume. Remember, there are crisscrossing of, of levee banks and channels that are changing flood patterns, but they will affect the amount of water that's going laterally, but also down the river system and affect ecosystems both on the floodplain and those systems downstream that rely on it. Thank you, Mr. Beach. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor um, Kingsford. I just got one question um, before I go to my colleague, uh, Penny Sharp, and it relates to your submission where you make the very clear statement that, that water harvesting licenses should not be tradable. Can you please elaborate on that for the committee and, uh, and provide your reasons as to why you make that statement? Thank you, Mr. Beach. Um, I, I think they're quite different to other license systems. Um, we've got to remember that they are at a particular place on the river. So they are capturing what comes down that river and the natural flooding system of that river system. They are also highly dependent on what infrastructure is there. You know, what are, what's a channel system and levee system and storage system that's there? So if you can imagine a particular quantum volume of license that was there and then was bought by somebody, say, upstream and traded in a, short, a, a simple accounting measure, then you could imagine that if someone had that much water to take, particularly if it's averaged over a number of years, their take might be much higher if they then established the infrastructure upstream where there are more floods, say, in a system or intercepted a particular tributary. So there's all of those complex idiosyncrasies of a river system which make the trading of floodplain licenses uh, a major issue, I believe, both in terms of what it does to the river and the volumes um, diverted, but also what it would actually do in terms of disrupting those, those connectivities. So building more channels and levees without doing the, um, the restoration that you might have to do where those were originally taken. So there's a lots of, um, I guess, uh, externalities that also occur in terms of trading floodplain harvesting licenses. I might just jump in. I think I'm running out of time. Um, hello, Professor Kingsford. I wanted to ask you about um, the temporary licences. I mean, given what you've just said um, about tradability, that would also make um, temporary licences, um, I suppose, more workable if they weren't tradable. Um, why do you think that there needs to be temporary licences? Thank you, Ms. Chap. Um, I do believe there is a lot that we have not quite nailed down in terms of the policy and regulation of floodplain harvesting. And, you know, the government has admitted that. So there's a whole range of very important initiatives that the government has listed that it will get onto in terms of managing this issue. Um, and I think we need to do that before we provide that um, permanent license access to water. Um, the, the, one of the major issues which all governments have had to deal with in terms of river management is the long-term cost of handing out too much water in the first instance. So when the rivers were essentially assessed for their yield, there was a, an incredible overestimation of the amount of water that was in the river. And as a result, there was an overallocation. So many irrigators never got the full complement of water that they were promised by governments. As a result, there was always an expectation that there was a problem and need for more water. The fact is there was never that amount of water in the river. And I am not convinced that we have enough evidence to say how much water there is in the floodplain harvesting bucket to be able to provide permanent licenses. 
I suspect that's my time, is it? I, I just wanted to check, um, Penny, just because we started like a few minutes late, if you have another one, go and I'll just, with the committee's indulgence, might go a few minutes into the next break for this. So go for another question if you like. Yeah. If okay, I've good. got one more question, which it really goes to these sort of flow targets. Um, I mean, we've heard evidence about the lack of gauges in the river. Um, we've heard that there's been a lot of work done sort of on first flush, but I'm wondering if you could just explain to us what other, you know, and you touched on it earlier, just really how other flow targets would work under under this scheme, how you see them work, what, what needs to make what needs to happen to make them work. I think the real challenge here is, and we've heard quite a lot of evidence about all parties being worried about the modelling. Um, essentially, the governments are relying almost totally on the modelling to manage the rivers, and I think we need some real um, metrics around how we do that in terms of flow targets. You could imagine setting the amount of water at different points on a river system. So, for example, in the Macquarie, you might say Marebone Weir, you might say we need a flood of this amount before we open up the river for floodplain harvesting. Um, you might have a similar mid flow target for, say, the Guaida or the Border Rivers, um, and, and then maybe an end of system flow target. And you could also have flow targets on the Darling that it has to meet a certain amount of water. That would that would ensure that some of those first first flush waters get down to places like Will Canyon and Menindi, particularly to avoid some of those sort of catastrophic um, times where we've seen those incredible fish kills and we've seen um, First Nations people running out of water. So I think it is really important that we think about the long term sustainability of, of this system and provide for some policy measures and management measures that rely on actual flows going down the river system that reflect the amount of flooding that's happening in that river and allow for that river to regenerate as, as well as the, the downstream ecosystems. And if I may, I think it's very important yeah. to consider where these um, flow targets actually are. We saw in the last flood that flow targets were in place at Volcania, but the river doesn't end at Volcania. And so making sure that these flow targets are actually ensuring river connectivity, not just the river hitting a certain point in the Darling Bark, is really important as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll move to questions from the crossbench now. I'll kick off. Just wanted to explore some of your submission a bit more um, uh, of the Australia Institute. So whichever of you want to take this, but particularly given the fact that the water taken um, by means of floodplain harvesting is essentially free water and your uh, submission argues that the cotton industry is capital intensive, employs few people. Do you want to expand on that a little bit more um, about the fact that, yes, there's this enormous amount of uh, water that a few people um, up north seem to seem to have um, been able to take for free and what that means across the entire basin. Um, Mr. Campbell, might go to you first. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And just apologies for some erratic behaviour there. Melbourne just had quite a large earthquake and uh, uh, we took a bit of a bump there. Um, so, yeah, just calm down a little. Not, <laughs> um, the, pro not the protesters, not the trade ET. Eh? No, no, I think uh, I think it was just an earthquake. Uh, it was definitely the biggest I've ever felt here. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I, th I think this comes to the, the fundamental nature of uh, what floodplain harvesting water is used for and you know, what, what part of the agricultural industry is using that and how that's linked to other parts of the economy or, or not linked, as, as the case may be. I mean, as, as you've said, uh, the water has been obtained for free. Uh, there's no, and, you know, and to this point, there's been no royalty payment or other form of payment. In our submission, we talk about based on uh, available data, there's very little tax paid um, by some of the major floodplain harvesting operations for which we have data. Um, you know, there's, there's very little uh, going back to the public uh, or the environment um, from, from this practice. And it, as I don't, I don't think is, you know, well, perhaps it is necessary to say, almost 
you know, the vast majority of floodplain harvesting water is used for cotton production uh, and cotton tends to be uh, exported with very little value adding and tends to be very capital intensive. It's, it's based on large machinery, large amounts of water, large amounts of land, very few people are employed uh, in the cotton industry. Uh, I, I think it's, I think in our submission, we're going to the numbers in detail, but it's, it's less than 1% of agricultural employment uh, in, <clears throat> in the Murray Darling Basin, even in cotton areas known for their cotton production, uh, cotton accounts for less than 5% of employment. Um, so it, it's a capital intensive industry, it's a water intensive industry, water that hasn't been paid for. Um, so this, this practice really isn't contributing very much to local economies. Uh, and in, in our view, bringing uh, floodplain harvesting allocations back in line with CAP could be achieved with very little impact on local economies. Certainly a lot of impact on businesses that have structured themselves around the practice, but very little impact on, on uh, parties outside of those businesses. Can I just explore that further? Just how much do you think then, like keeping, keeping, if floodplain harvesting was licensed genuinely within the existing cab now, um, without uh, taking water from the environment, so how much do you think that would impact the the, the scale of the the cotton industry, Mr. Campbell? Uh, I guess it depends on what on what your measure is there. You know, in terms of output, um, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to guess a number, but I, I think in terms of output, it would be quite substantial uh, in the tens of percent. I would imagine. Um, so in terms of cotton output, I imagine, yeah, quite a substantial impact. I guess what our submission is trying to say is that changing the cotton output of the Northern Basin uh, wouldn't have that, wouldn't have very much effect on employment, uh, government revenue, uh, other aspects that are other indicators that have a more direct impact on the welfare of communities in the Murray-Darling Basin and beyond. Thank you. I just I um, don't have much time left, probably for one more question. I just wanted back um, to you, Professor Kingsford. I did want to get your views on what impact the take of rainfall runoff has on smaller flows into rivers and floodplains on the basin. Thank you, Ms. Pearman. Um, it's a really difficult issue, which I don't think has been looked at in great detail. And when we talk about runoff, we should to also talk about runoff up in the upper parts of the catchment. A lot of what we talk about is in the lower parts of the catchment. Um, there are issues in upper parts with small farm dams and in Victoria, uh, they went to a volumetric assessment of farm dams because of the impact on downstream flows. Um, in the lower parts of the Northern Basin, the issues revolve around what I referred to earlier as the distributary system. So these are creek systems that come into uh, the main river stem. Um, the larger ones in uh, things uh, like the Horton in the in the in the Wider and the Talbragar in the Macquarie, but there are many of those small creek systems. And then there are also those creek systems that go away from the main part of the river. And the capture of those in terms of rainfall runoff is is not a very sophisticated approach in terms of measurement of what's going on. So there is another quantum of water that is coming in from rainfall. Uh, it's generally not as large or as important as what's coming down the main part of the river, but it is potentially significant and not very well measured or understood. Thank you very much. We'll now move to questions from Mr. Mark Benaziak. Thank you. I'll, I'll start with uh, you, uh, Mr. Campbell. I, or the committee secretary would have emailed you a document um, and I don't expect you would have had time to read it, um, and it's only just been recently made public. But I would ask, perhaps on notice, that you um, go away and and have a look at that, because some of the chief figures talk about that uh, cropping in the north is only less than one third of irrigation. Um, and I just whether you could come back on notice with some comments about whether that changes your economic analysis at all. 
I've, I've had a I've had a quick look through it. I mean, I don't think there's nothing surprising or even really contradictory with our submission uh, in this report. I mean, it's talking it, it's talking about agriculture quite broadly and certainly irrigation quite broadly um, and its role in the northern basin economy. Um, and okay. uh, I'm, if you've got some questions, I'm, I'm happy. I'll no, I, would, I, I was happy for you to take. I was happy for you to take it on notice. If you want to give us a, a more detailed sort of view of what you think of it, um, I'll, I'll go to a question more around um, some data from the MDBA um, and whether you've taken it into consideration with your analysis. They um, the MDBA says that the Southern Basin extracts 30, 37 percent of their water, um, and the Northern Basin only extracts twenty one percent of their total water and that the Southern Basin has significantly higher inflows. I'm just wondering whether you factored those those figures in, into your analysis when you're looking at the economic impact um, or economic footprint of each of those valleys. I think context obviously is important and, and I guess seeing who's getting the best bang for their buck in terms of water use, was that, was, were those figures factored into your analysis? So, uh, just just un unpicking the question a little bit there. Uh, I mean, I, I think what you're referring to is overall inflows, whereas uh, we've been really trying to focus on floodplain harvesting and what that water is used for, and what the imp what the uh, implications of bringing that back under cap uh, would be, um, and so. You know, as we've gone into, and you know, perhaps based on some of what you're talking about, um, the Southern Basin has industries set up to that add a lot more value to products that that are produced there. There's a large wine industry. There's a very well known uh, rice uh, processing uh, okay. industry. So, so you have you have sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but my time is limited. But you haven't specifically looked at. I, I guess a breakdown of of that economic value or economic footprint based on the level of total take. No, not on the level okay. of total take. Okay, I, I, I might. I think, uh, yeah, okay. I might just move to um, Dr. Richard uh, uh, Kingsford because I've got a question, a couple of questions for him as well. Um, Doctor, the EDO. Um, was quite dismissive of my questioning around Macquarie marshes and the impact that graziers are having at the end um, and potentially using environmental water for commercial purposes. And I know, I know you've mentioned the Macquarie marshes quite heavily in your submission and even today. I just want to uh, get your your take on um, on the potential, you know, environmental and uh, economic um, Things that are happening there with you know the the graziers potentially using environmental water for commercial purposes at the end of the Macquarie marshes. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernasia. Um, it's important to understand that the Macquarie marshes is mostly owned privately and yes. predominantly by floodplain graziers. Um, so the floods that do come down there support them and have done for many generations. Um, the issue here is that there is a dual um, effect here. They have not destroyed the floodplain plants. In fact, many of the colonies of waterbirds are on floodplain graziers areas. So yes, they are, they are um, getting an income from those environmental flows, but there are also significant environmental benefits as well. So when that flooding does occur, there is still widespread use by frogs and plants and, and water birds and native fish species and turtles of those areas. And significantly, the research from places um, like, say, Cooper Creek, which has widespread um, grazing as well on a natural flow system, indicates that those plants regenerate very quickly after you get another flood. Yes, so there is and always has been and I mentioned earlier that most of the floodplains in the Murray-Darling are actually privately owned, and most of the people have an income from them, which 
they would have got with natural flows, but with river regulation and development upstream, those natural flows have been taken away from those people. They no longer get that income that they previously had, and they now rely on on big floods or sometimes, as in the Macquarie marshes, some of those environmental flows. Okay, thank you. I think that's my time expired. Thank you very much. We'll now go to questions from the government. Who, uh, Mr. Farrowway? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, firstly, I'd like to direct some questions to Professor Kingsford. Um, are you aware of the flooding occurring? And uh, correct me if I haven't pronounced if I don't pronounce this properly, but the flooding occurring in the Ganya Nimi Cairo uh, wetlands in the southwest of New South Wales. Uh, thank you, Mr. Farrow, Farrowway. Yes, um, I definitely am because. Um, we are involved with the Nari Nari Tribal Council in restoring that 80,000 hectares of, of wetland down there. Do you think that the management of those wetlands uh, would be a good example of where cultural management can work? Oh, absolutely. I think there's a great opportunity for government, community and traditional owners to work to restore a magnificent wetland, one of the best in the Murray Darling. Okay. Um, so, Professor, I make reference to an article in The Guardian, um, which I don't normally do, to be honest, but the 19th of September 2021, and it's titled It's On at Menindee. Um, you were quoted in The Guardian about the boom in life that's now happening out at Menindee uh, and that there's an explosion in wildlife at Menindee Lakes. Um, would you be able to expand on what is actually happening out there for the committee? Uh, yes, and um, I'll... I haven't actually been out there, but we have been surveying out there and we will be surveying out there in a couple of weeks. But certainly I have uh, talked to people out there and and what happens when those floods come down into the Menindee Lakes is that you start to get that water triggering a whole range of things that are happening like invertebrates and, and water birds and native fish species. And they are capitalising on, you know, that large area of, of habitat that's occurring in Menindee Lakes. Uh, so just staying with that theme, um, are you aware of any like current sort of monitoring or metering of what is occurring out there right now? And and, and if so, what, what they're finding from, from the metering um, and monitoring of it? Um, I'm only aware of what we have been doing. We Every October, we survey up to 2,000 wetlands across Eastern Australia, including the Menindee Lakes, and have been surveying Menindee Lakes since 1983. So we have a significant amount of data on the types of water birds and numbers that are there. But I also understand that uh, the government is monitoring fish populations, although I'm not across the details. Okay. Um, so just to continue, and happy to also have the Australia Institute um, sort of answer this one as well. But what do you believe like the, the, the native title rights over water are? And I say this like following. Uh, the flooding in the North Menindee Lakes, and they're on track to hit over um, uh, two million meg, isn't it? Yeah, two million meg in I think around October next month. It should hit that two million meg of capacity. Um, what do you think is having, you know, in having all that water in the lakes has meant for the local community? So I'll, I won't comment on native title. I do not have expertise in there, but I will say that that is equivalent to the natural floods that used to occur frequently, even around the Federation drought um, in Menindee Lakes, and creates a massive area for the environment and all the aquatic plants and animals, of which um, we know that First Nations people used a lot, and Menindee is well known as a very important place on the Barker for the people there. So it's a fundamentally important part of that ecosystem and important for First Nations people. Did, uh, did Kate or, or uh, Ms. McBride or Mr. Campbell have anything with that question? I think it's pretty clear that the Menindee Lakes are very important for the communities out there, but I think it's important to highlight what Professor Kings had said before is that the Menindee Lakes did fill more often in the past. And we know for a fact that floodplain harvesting has impacts downstream because it reduces the size and frequency of these floods. And it's important to remember that despite the lakes being full right now, a mere two years ago, we saw mass fish kills and multiple reports contribute that floodplain harvesting acted as a contributing factor to the lack of water and resulting fish kills as well. So I think that's really important to remember these downstream impacts that massive take upstream does have. 
Just following on, I suppose the question I'll stay with you, Ms. McBride, if that's fine. Um, are you aware of any sort of environmental metering and monitoring that's been undertaken within the Menindee Lakes system and the Lower Darling? And if so, what they're finding? I'm aware that New South Wales Fisheries is conducting um, some investigations out there, but not aware of the content or what they're finding. Any, does any of the other witnesses have anything they want to contribute to that question? Look, uh, um, just um, Mr. Faraway, I would just refer that the government does collect um, flow data. So that's one of the most important data sets that we have for managing rivers. And so there is flow data at Menindee, there is flow data further down the Darling. Um, there is also satellite data that's also collected. Uh, in terms of environmental data, the real problem we have in Australia and including in the rivers is we're not connect collecting enough of it. There is very little investment in long-term monitoring of rivers and their health. And, and that is causing us um, challenges in terms of looking at both increases in environmental improvement as well as degradation. Um, Professor, would you, do you agree with um, Central Darling Council, uh, there's this um, South West uh, Water Use Association, Graham McCrabb and, and the other locals within the Menindee area um, when they state that the policy around the 644-80 gigalitre rule has not delivered good outcomes for the Lower Darling communities through its management through the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Would you agree with that, with what locals are saying out there with the rule? Look, I, I think it's complicated. I mean, one of the problems and challenges is that the Menindee Lakes is managed with Dartmouth Dam for the whole of the River Murray, for the southern part of the Murray-Darling Basin. As a result, um, it means that decisions about the local environment at Menindee play second fiddle generally to the lower lakes and, and um, the, the lower Murray. And so it is really important um, for the Menindee to um, take more control of that local management so that we can actually also look out after the environment at Menindee and not just um, look after environments elsewhere. So, you know, it is a very important part of this debate is, is how do you look after your own environment as well as the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin? So, okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, to Ms McBride, just following on from our question and discussion earlier, 2 million megs of water uh, in terms of capacity in, in Menindee Lakes by next month. That's that's a significant amount of water. Um, clearly, from, from uh, obviously the article that we've been talking to the professor about, um, uh, things are not dying, things are not, you know, uh, in, in disarray out at Menindee Lakes at the moment. The question that I've got, and, and happy for others to follow with their answer, is what should be done with the water? What do we do next um, with, with such a significant um, significant capacity uh, and water there and also taking in consultation with what the Central Darling Council is saying, what Menindee locals are saying? So where, where to next? I'm here in my capacity as the Australian Institute. I know there's some Lower Darling Barker people joining the call later today and this question might be um, more appropriate to their submissions. Um, so, yeah, I might leave it to them um, to actually discuss it. But I think the most important thing is that we're seeing impacts downstream because of um, the amount of water that's that hasn't come down. Um, the important thing I think we need to get back to is the fact that um, when the basin plan was set, there was a certain amount of water that they set for floodplain harvesting, and that was 46 gigalitres in New South Wales. Now, we know that it's ex like it's extensively bigger, a great deal more is taken in that. So just because there's water at the end of the river does not mean that a massive amount of take occurring further up is all right. And I think what's important is we need to bring it back and make sure that floodplain harvesting, when it's licensed, is licensed to a level that's consistent with CAP and that the SDL is not expanded to take this historical take. Okay. Can, I, can I add to that, Mr Faraway? Um, it, it's true to say that there's a lot happening in terms of the environment at Menindee, and it always happens when there are floods, but those floods are been getting less and there's less water in there. And our data over 39 years on water birds indicates a long-term decline in water bird numbers and, and diversity at Menindee Lakes. Having said that, I'll go straight to your point. I do believe there is an op 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 opportunity for a win-win at, at Menindee where we could reinstate 
better flooding and drying patterns there. Remembering that Kinchigan National Park is 28% of that is in Menindee Lakes and, and its surrounding areas. We could start to dry out some places a little bit better. That doesn't mean cutting off Lake Cordilla, which is one of the government options. It actually means going back to the drawing board and thinking about a restoration. So plan. essentially, Professor, just because I've only got limited time, left, um, obviously, you know, the theme is um, it has been drained too quickly. Um, how do we make sure that um, it won't be drained that quickly again? Look, I think we need a body of work involving experts from government, all, all parts of government, water, environment, and also the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, to think about the whole of that system and say, what's the best way of managing this? And then what are the policy and management levers that we have to do that, instead of treating it like a, it has been a re-regulating storage for shunting water down to the lower lakes and, and, and the River Murray, and, and South Australia, which is how it's predominantly used to save water for the upper parts of the River Murray. Um, just quickly, because I think I've got very little time left as well. In your submission to the Australia Institute, so from maybe Mr. Campbell, um, you described that floodplain harvesting is an illegal practice. How have you arrived at that conclusion, considering this committee has seen independent legal advice from Brett Walker SC that says that it's not? Uh, uh look where my expertise isn't in law um so uh i'm going off you know, media and secondary reports that there's questions around the lawfulness of this um uh, you know they've been pretty widely so discussed. you haven't ever received your own legal well, sort of counsel time has expired for um government questions Sorry about that. If I could uh, just thank the witnesses for appearing today. If you have uh, agreed to take questions on notice, the Secretariat will be in touch with you regarding that. Thank you very much for appearing in the work you do. The committee will now have a break until 10, uh, until 9.55. Just remember to mute and turn your video off. Okay, all right, well, it's 9.55, so let's kick off formally. So we have to do the swearing in part. So we'll, if each of you could state, we'll start with the order I just did the sound check with. So if you could state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation, uh, Dr. Martin Mallon Cooper, I understand that's been emailed to all witnesses. Great, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, Dr. Martin Mallon Cooper, I'm an adjunct research professor at the Institute of Land and Water and Society at Charles Sturt University. Uh, for this inquiry, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now given, about to be given by me, shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Stuart Rowland. Uh, yes, uh, Stuart Rowland. I'm a, I'm a retired uh, principal research scientist. I uh, worked with New, New South Wales fish for over 30 years. Um, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rowland. And finally, Mr. Constantaris. Uh, Stan Constantaris, uh, current president of the Recreational Fishing Alliance of New South Wales. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. We now have time for short opening statements. Dr. Mallon Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to table a diagram I wish to speak to, and I'll make a brief statement. Thank you very much. You've, you've emailed that to the committee, I understand. Yes, and it, it looks like that. <laughs> um, so my, my brief statement is this, I've got most of it in that submission, but in the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, floodplain diversions for agriculture have been happening for over 100 years. But the, the key milestone in all water diversions is the cap in 1995, effectively saying no new diversions. So any new developments in floodplain harvesting that occurred after that date are not compliant with, with the cap. So those irrigators that developed their floodplain harvesting after that time were fully aware of that. So that was a line in the sand 
put down by the Howard government, which sought to have a vision of sustainable agriculture balanced with a range of community needs. So no matter what your view is on floodplain harvesting, this inquiry is another line in the sand. So you will remember the outcome of this inquiry in 20 years time because it is pivotal. So the farm and darling river system has suffered fish kills and blue green algae, but it is recoverable. This is an important point. The science is rock solid and also presents a clear choice. So New South Wales can keep the river in a suppressed fragile state, but we can be leaders in river management. So this is an achievable vision of sustainable agriculture, sustainable rural communities and healthy rivers. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Dr. Rowland, do you have a short opening statement as well? Uh, Chair, I can think of most of it in my submission. I'd just like to make, is that, is that clear to people or is it, it's, I just, might, I just might move to, I might, actually might move to Mr. Constantaris if I okay. can. You seem to have dialed in from multiple devices. Oh, okay. Which is, which is creating an echo. You, We can see your computer screen. We can also see two different, um, uh, two different, well, it's like you've dialed in from three places. So it might go to Mr. Oh. Constantaris for uh, his opening statement first and see if the, no, okay. They they they've been muted now. I've just been informed okay. by the secretariat. So if you sorry, if you oh, will continue, Dr. Rowland, if you have a statement. Okay, I would just like to make a point in relation okay. to my submission. I've had a long association with inland fish and rivers. Uh, it goes way back to the nineteen fifties. As a kid, fishing rivers with family animal, such as the, the Peel, the Namoy, the Murrumbidgee. Uh, I, I first visited the Darling River in 1970 and have been visiting it, it regularly since. And as a research scientist uh, since 1978, and I did my PhD on Murray Cod, and um, have been involved with its research and management, as well as other native species since that time. And uh, although I've been retired for 10 years, uh, I still maintain connection, connections with scientists such as uh, Martin, uh, fishery scientists, fishermen, ab ab Aborigines, river people, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go to you now, Mr. Constantaris, if you have an opening statement as well. Yeah, good morning all. Um, this inquiry is of significant interest to all recreational fishers and the Recreational Fishing Alliance of New South Wales. Fishers living in or visiting the Murray-Darling basement, um, basin, sorry, uh, have told us that they have observed a significant decline in the health of each and every waterway. They have seen impacts to wetlands and to the abundance of our native fish species, animals and birds over the decades that go beyond the boom and bust cycles of the past. Uh, fishers are gravely concerned that management policies and practices past and present have been made at the expense of the overall health of the Murray-Darling Basin. Accordingly, we hope this inquiry considers all issues and impacts from floodplain harvesting against the bigger picture of the New South Wales government's overall water management policies and practices. The Alliance feels that we must try and limit the over-harvesting of any natural water flows, like the flooding of water across any catchment, that has the potential to deliver significant benefits to the natural freshwater aquatic ecosystems, in particular aquatic plants, sensitive habitats, wetlands, and the fish and food webs that support so much life. Many of us do not have university degrees, but what we do have is the drive and passion to advocate for the fish, what they live in, and where they live. Uh, we all know the catchphrase, no water equals no fish. It's a no-brainer for us. Uh, I hope this submission we have provided is a value to the committee a lot of fishers with a multitude of skill sets have contributed to its composition, from painters like me here in Sydney to farmers down in Albury, all with a passion for the fish, fishing and the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go straight to questions from the opposition. Mr Mick Beach. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my first question is to Dr Rowland. Uh, Dr Rowland, um, I'm interested in your submission uh, 
where you talk about the difference in the river in 1970 to where it is now in 2020. And I say that because as a young fellow, I used to go fishing out there with my father and uncles for what we used to call big fish. Um, uh, so around that 1970 period was when I was out on the Darling. Um, and I was told then that the river would, the Darling would run dry about three years in 10. Now, I'm not sure whether that's right. That was anecdotal evidence from a, an old timer on the river. Um, clearly the Darling runs dry a lot more than three times in 10, every 10 years now. So can you just explain to the committee the difference between the 1970s scenario, scenario you present in your submission to that of the 2020 scenario? Yes, um, I'm, still, I'm still reverberating a little bit there. Is it, is it clear to people? Um, I just yeah. wanted to check, uh, Dr. Rowland, you may just yeah. check that you don't have the live stream on in another tab on no, your... No, no. I website. did log in and, and then logged out to do something. And it may be that uh, you've got me there a couple of times. Okay, we'll just continue and you're speaking okay. slowly enough. I think I think we'll manage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I selected the, the 1970 uh, time frame to 2020 deliberately to provide a clear example of the dramatic change, degradation of the aquatic ecosystem in the, the Darling. Just very briefly, there's been long-term degradation. Started back in the 1800s with the development of the sheep industry, the paddle steamers, and so on. For over 100, and there was small-scale irrigation uh, uh, way back in the early 1900s as well. Despite the changes that we saw were associated with that industry, um, the native fish remained very, very strong. Um, we, I suspect that it was because there was continued flows, natural flows, flooding regimes. Um, and, and so I've, I've described it in, in, the, in the submission. The characteristics of the river was it was a flowing river. 92% of the time, even in droughts, 85% of the time. Some great work of Mountain River in quantifying that sort of characteristics and in the history of the river. It, it, it was dominated by native fish, native aquatic bands, such as ribbon weed, so on. The river was characteristically clear as were all our inland rivers. There's a misconception that the inland rivers are naturally turbid. If we look at the history, Aboriginal history, uh, explorers, early white settlers, the reports all indicate that outside of wet periods, freshes and floods, our rivers flowed clear. The Darling at times in 1970s and before, Visibility was one to two metres. And so th this is the characteristic of the ecosystem, the, the species composition, the structure and function of the ecosystem. If we compare it to post-1990, um, say 2020, as I've written there, it's vastly different. Long periods of no and low flow. Virtually no aquatic plants, but that's the root plants, uh, ribbon weed, pond weed, and so on. The flora is completely dominated by algae, at times huge blue green algae blooms. Um, introduced carp makes up around about 90% of the fish biomass. It is a dramatically different ecosystem. Species have been lost. Uh, trout cod, or quarry perch, snails, massive declines in some species, silver perch, catfish, uh, mussels, snails. 
it is a totally di different ecosystem. Commencing in late 2018, fish started to die. There had been fish kills right regularly in the system from about the 1990s. But late 2018, large fish kills, and by early 2019, we're all familiar with the massive fish kills that, that continued for over a period of months near Menindi. Uh, millions of Murray cod, uh, bony brim. The bony brim is actually the, the totem of the Barkindji people. Uh, silver perch, catfish, and so on died in their millions. Those of us that visited the river, and I'm sure most of, many of you did, you could nearly walk from, from Burke to, to Wentworth. There was only water at uh, homesteads, at the deep holes, behind the weirs, and in a couple of the Menindee lakes. And of course, Lake Menindee was completely dry. And, and so, to me, the ecosystem has gone extinct. It, it had changed since 1990 in, in terms of species and structure and function. And to me, in, two, in 2020, that ecosystem was completely different and gone. And I've made the claim that it became an extinct ecosystem. There was warnings of this, and I'm not sure whether you want to talk to me about it now, but from about 1990, many, many of us saw these dramatic changes, uh, as, I've, as I've mentioned, low flows, algal blooms, fish kills and so on. In 2003, the New South Wales Fishery Scientific Committee declared the Darling River and its catchment an endangered ecological community. And it, it, it outlined the key threatening processes that it had, had changed the system. And it warned and that unless action was taken, the system would go extinct. That was 2003. In my opinion, the system's gone extinct. There's water gone down the Darling recently, water in the Mindy Lakes. But the whole species composition and structure and function are so different, um, it's gone extinct. And there'll be species, uh, there'll be some recovery of species of, of fish and uh, crustaceans and, and mollusks. But in my opinion, it, it, I can't see it batting back to, to the original ecosystem that even white man knew through the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rowland. Can I just, my next question is to, uh, to Stan, if I could just, uh, from the recreational um, fishers, can I, do, do you think there's a sufficient weight being given to the impact on our fish stock when decisions like floodplain harvesting are, um, are, are being made? Um, no, absolutely not. I, um, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, I, th I think we're just running around in circles. I think the, the departments don't speak to each other. Um, for the last sort of six months, the Alliance has been trying to determine uh, who's responsible for the millions of fish that die each year. And, and we're concerned that it's been allowed to happen, considering the multiple legislations um, that apparently protect, you know, fish and habitat. Um, we look at this as unregulated killing of fish and aquatic animals, and it has some huge impacts for us as recreational anglers. We pay a fee to fish, um, and it needs to be addressed immediately. I mean, we've been reviewing the Water Management Act, the Fisheries Management Act, and other legislation. I mean, we've spent a lot of time writing to ministers, um, and our experience in dealing with the various agencies who administer these acts is that not, not one agency seems to be taking it seriously. Um, we have correspondence that fails to answer simple questions from agencies. We're still waiting for advice. Uh, and we're happy to share all this with, with the committee as well. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great concern uh, that agencies um, continue to work in isolation. Um, and our recent experience has us worried that these issues are being handled in a disjointed and piecemeal manner when it comes to the fish. So. Yeah, I mean, um, we cannot get an answer uh, to that question. It's a really hard one that's, it, it's driven us mad. We've spent hundreds of hours reading acts. And again, we are 
we're, we're really passionate fishermen. We, uh, we don't have a background in interpreting legislation. All we can do is read, try to interpret, uh, communicate with each other, email, fire off the letter and just keep prodding and prodding, uh, prodding and probing until we can get uh, the answer to that, the question you asked there, um, Mick. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great concern to us. That, the disjointed uh, manner in which every agency seems to operate is of great concern to us, yes. You indicated you had some documents there. It would be really good if you could uh, table those with the committee secretariat. And uh, I think Rose has just got a quick question, Chair. Yes, thanks, um, Mr Veach, and thanks, Chair. I just wanted to ask um, Dr Mallon Cooper, um, in your submission, you talked about the potential use of screening technologies to protect native fish um, in the licensing of floodplain harvesting. I wonder if you could just elaborate on what options there are to use some of those technologies to ensure that any licensing doesn't have an impact on native fish or, or has a, a minimal or minimized mm. impact. Um, can, can I use that table diagram? I've, I've seen it, so that's all good. Yeah, you, you've seen it. Okay, if, if, you, if you've got that in front of you, it, it explains probably a major impact here. So it, there's, there's one aspect of fish biology and one aspect of the mechanics of floodplain harvesting that we, that's important for the inquiry to understand. So one thing is that native fish spawn and have larvae that drift downstream. As they drift downstream, this often happens in floods, they will end up in flood runners or in gravity diversion channels. And under normal circumstances, they would end up on floodplains and then continue down the flood runner back into the river. And under normal circumstances, that produces a lot of fish. On the right hand side of the diagram, I show you what happens in floodplain harvesting. Those larvae drift down, they end up in these channels, which can be, you know, flood runners that have been blocked or purpose-built channels, and the larvae are then trapped in that channel or they're, they're pumped into that off-stream storage. So if you have a pump in the river, you can screen that pump and protect those fish. That's larvae and other fish. In this case, you can't protect the larvae. In this case, you, you would have to, the, the larvae end up in that channel and they either end up dry in that channel or in the on-farm storage. I, I think if there's a future here for floodplain harvesting, they actually have to pump from the river like other irrigators. This is actually a trap for larvae and it happens you know, every time there's a flood and it happens to coincide with the peak of breeding as well. So you know, when, it, when fish often spawning in spring, this is the start of irrigation season and a flood comes. So these two things coincide. So if we're serious about a vision where there is floodplain harvesting and really prior to the cap in 94, there was floodplain harvesting, that is legitimate floodplain harvesting. We should look towards those irrigators pumping from the river and screening at the river. And you can do that quite effectively. Thank you. Um, we'll move to questions from the crossbench. I'll kick off with a few. Dr. Martin Mallon Cooper, firstly, thank you for your submission and the diagrams. It was all incredibly helpful and uh, useful. A very good submission. Could you please explain to the committee how the environmental sustainable level of take informs the sustainable diversion limit? Yeah, this, this is a, a, a pretty important point and um, because there's a, there's a lot of discussion around, so let's just get my own diagram up. That's figure three in that submission. Um, yeah, I, I see a lot of narrative around, oh, we, we have unaccounted water, uh, we underestimate a flood, floodplain diversion, so, so therefore we have more water available. So th that is not the agreed process that the states and, and the federal government and NDBA have set up. So the, the first step here is to determine what the yeah, environmentally sustainable level of take is. So you also calculate the total volume. So I, I have seen some diagrams that say, well, let's look at the outflows. No, actually, they're very smart modelers and there's been a lot of information about this. So you work out the total volume and then what level you can take 
in terms of being environmentally sustainable. Now, there may be lots of arguments around that, and that leads to 2750 gig of the basin plan. That may be too much, it may be too little. My view is it's too little. And, but that number is the number. That then, that, that becomes the sustainable diversion limit. That is then compared against the baseline diversion limit. And if it doesn't meet that, then you have water recovery to bring the basin baseline diversion limit back to the sustainable diversion limit. Now, it, there, there's so much information around this, but that logic is very, very consistent. And the numbers and the modeling can vary, but, but the, there's uh, a sort of narrative that we underestimated floodplain diversions in 94, that is absolutely correct. That has nothing to do with the environmentally sustainable level of take or the sustainable diversion. So, so, so that's what's agreed upon. That process is locked in. So, you know, th that this inquiry should reaffirm this. And um, so that you can't- can I, can I jump in there? So in other words, what you, just, what you just said, so if, for example, there's an argument that the baseline diversion limit or the take has been underestimated mm, mm, mm. Um, as a result of floodplain harvesting, and therefore we need to increase the baseline diversion limit in various valleys, that shouldn't mean that there is a is a um, increase therefore in the sustainable diversion limit, yeah. does it? So yeah, absolutely. So the sustainable diversion limit is an independent, you know, uh, process, and then it gets compared against the baseline diversion limit. So so all the scientists and all the models get together and say, this is a sustainable diversion limit. This is our environmentally sustainable level of take. Then you compare it against the baseline di diversion limit. So, so that is, um, yeah, that, that, that narrative is incorrect. Dr. Mallon Cooper, just pushing that a little bit more then, what are the ramifications for just randomly increasing the SDL because of this supposed increase in BDLs that um, yeah. are happening? What's, what's the ramification if that happened? I think it's absolutely huge. I, I think it is absolutely huge. I think right now, my view is the allocation, the basin plan of 2750 gigalitres is insufficient. And I know there's other views around that, that it is obviously too much. I'm going to table a document, um, a paper I wrote, I've just emailed that, to confirm what Stuart Rowland was talking about, about the character of the Bow and Darling. So, what has happened in past droughts? I've looked at discharge from 1886 to 1950 to compare that with the present droughts. So what's happened now is that Bow and Darling is on a knife edge. So we've seen yeah, catastrophic loss of fish, mussels, snails, blue-green algae. Now, there's a lot of narrative around that to say that's due to climate change, it's due to the drought. Actually, that drought is similar to past droughts prior to any regulation. The inflows are similar. It's documented in that paper. No one disagree with that paper. That's just the data. And that is really accessible to anyone. So, but what's happened now is, yeah, through water abstraction in droughts, we push that, that river to the absolute edge. If we push it further, I, I think it will be absolutely catastrophic. Now, the, the flip side is it, it is, some of it is recoverable. Stuart is right, it won't be the same system, but some of it is recoverable. And, but it needs base flows, it needs flow pulses. So even those worst droughts, and, and this, this is where floodplain harvesting comes in. In the worst droughts in the past, you had these big pulses of flow. Every, every 14 months, you had these big pulses of flow. In the worst droughts on record, no one disputes that. Those pulses are gone. And the reason they're gone is for well, three reasons. It's all water abstraction, so dams upstream, other diversions, but also floodplain harvesting. Floodplain harvesting is one form of flow diversion, but in this case, it's very, very significant. And it gets those pulses that just go over the bank. Thank you, Dr. Mallon Cooper. Unfortunately, my time has expired. We'll go to questions from uh, Mr. Mark Benaziak now. 
You, I might just start with you, um, Mr. Constantaris. Um, just picking up on the question from Mr. Veach, I just wonder whether you could elaborate more in terms of where, where you see the deficiencies are um, between where these acts intersect or should intersect, like the the Water Management Act and the Fisheries Management Act, and and obviously the 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 agencies that are charged with enforcing them. Yeah, well, thanks, Mark. Um, look, a water management. Um, under the Water Management Act cannot occur in isolation of other legislation. And the agencies that administer those acts and also exercise jurisdiction over the waterways uh, must consider uh, the following legislation. Uh, I mean, the one we look at as recreational fishers is the Fisheries Management Act 1994. It's the one that, um, again, dictates our bag and size limits, what we can and can't do, commercial fishing, pretty much everything to do with, um, with fishing in New South Wales uh, sits under that recreational uh, sorry, the Fisheries Management Act 1994. But it's also the objects of this act include to conserve fish stocks and key fish habitats, to conserve threatened species, populations, and ecological communities of fish, marine vegetation, and promote ecologically sustainable development, including the, the conservation of biological diversity. So again, that's that should for us, it should be the overarching act that the Water Management Act sits under. Um, the Water Management Act should also look at things like the um, the objects of the Protection of the Environment Operations Act 97, Environmental Planning and Assessment Act 79, Biodiversity Conservation Act 2016. I mean, so arguably regulations and other legislative instruments made under the Act ought to be prioritised, ought to be prioritising the protection of the waterways, including its water quality, its dependent ecosystems, including the fish in the waterways. Um, and it should consider these things over um, economic consideration when it comes to water use. I, again, um, I'm quite happy to, to table all the uh, the letters that we have sent in, and it'll give you a, a sense of the frustration that we feel um, and the, the the circles that we just get, you know, we get run ragged trying to get answers from departments, um, which is which is again, it's really uh, concerning. It's um, it really worries us. Um, so potentially, um, you know, we might need to review the Fisheries Management Act, uh, strengthen it a little bit more, and prioritise the act and see exactly where the Water Management Act sits in terms of relevance with all these other acts. It's uh, the impression that we're getting, and our opinion is that the, the Water Management Act is operating in complete isolation. We we cannot find any agency or department or under which act, um, you know, can claim responsibility for the millions of fish that die each year. So it's a, it's a really big um, issue. It's taken a lot of our time. And I, I guess when we share and table the, the correspondence that we have, it'll give the committee an idea of, of where we're looking and, and where we think the deficiencies are. Okay, thanks, thanks, Dan. I might move to Dr. Martin Mallon Cooper. I um, tabled a document on Monday, and I think the committee secretary have emailed it to you as well. It was a uh, advice from the state government talking about um, the allocation of water for downstream near the Barma Milawa area, and that there was three hundred fifty-eight thousand megalitres borrowed against the environmental water allowance, which was then having to be garnished from general security allowance from the users down there. What can you can you contextualize that for us in terms of the impact of ex essentially extracting that amount of water um, against an environmental license compared to the impact of floodplain harvesting? Mr. M uh, Dr. Mallon Cooper, just I think you're on mute still. <laughs> Oh, okay. no, sorry. Yeah, cool, go. Huh? Okay, okay. Thanks for the question, Mr. Beneziak. And and I've just had that document emailed to me. Um, so look, what I'd like to do, especially when I see a document with numbers in, I like to check numbers myself on the gauges. So may I take that on notice? Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely, if you can okay. take that on notice, that, that'd be yeah. good. Um, can I just move to another point? What's, what's your understanding of... Um, floodplain harvesting in the south. It often gets suggested that there is floodplain harvesting in the south. And when I've asked questions of the department, they basically say they haven't done any work 
in 20 years, 21 years to understand this. Have you have you done any work in terms of uh, floodplain harvesting in, in the south and, and what its impact is? I, th I think it's an incredibly good question. And no, I, I haven't done any work in the south and um, I'm aware of sites uh, in uh, Queensland and the Condamine and I do you know, a lot of work you know, in New South Wales. So no, I'm not aware. I think it's a really good question. I, I think that data should be available with the government. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, I can't really address that one. No problems at all. And just picking up on the question about fish streams, would you, would, is that something you'd like to see built into the regulations uh, um, on floodplain harvesting if we go down that track, that, that it becomes a mandatory component? Look, I, I, I think so. Uh, so, so. So I think in terms of all water diversions, that, that, that this, this needs to be something the industry is, is, is taking up. Now, whether it's a carrot or stick approach, I'm not sure. There, there's a lot of positive response from the industry. So this is not just floodplain harvesting, this is all diversions. Absolutely, a lot of fish get diverted. Any water that's diverted, you know, the fish are going with it. So I, I would absolutely like to see this, but uh, it needs to be, I, I wouldn't want to say it's suddenly mandated and suddenly have to everyone apply within 12 months to apply screens. I think we have to work with the industry to do that. I think industry is on board, um, but you know, there's, there is some legislation around it, but I, I'd rather see the industry take that initiative and have a 10 year vision. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. My time has expired. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'll just go to the government, Mr. Ben Franklin. You're muted. There we are. Sorry. Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you all for being here today. I guess um, I'll just start with a, a, a contextual question, um, and this is, um, I guess, to everybody. Um, the I believe the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder has over 2.6 million megalitres of entitlements, and um, state and other uh, other reforms such as Living Murray, they've recovered another 1.4 million megalitres. So I guess my question is, do you think they're doing a good job with the water that they control? Um, you know, do you talk to them regularly? Do you know what's planned for the environmental releases out of the Menindee Lakes, um, particularly since it's now forecast to hold 2 million megalitres by mid-October? So maybe I'll start with you, um, Mr. Constantaris, uh, and then move to Dr. Rowland and Dr. Mallon Cooper. Uh, so I'm not aware of anything um, sort of way beyond my uh, my pay grade here. So I'll, and that's I'll no be, problem if you're not. I can do a, to listen to uh, to Martin and Stuart on that one. Thank you. Sure, Dr. Rowland. <laughs> I'm going to flick part as well. You're on the spot. I, 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 I can talk. I talk about fish directly in the rivers. And uh, if, and if I want to know, know something about flows and rivers, I go to Martin. No problem at all. Yes, uh, Dr. Mallon Cooper, it's lovely to see you again. I remember you from the Dam's Inquiry, and uh, um, so do you have any comments on that? Uh, look, th 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 thank you, Mr. Franklin, and I, th I think it's it's a good question. Um, look, I I think I uh, personally I'm in, sort of involved on on the fringe of some of those flow decisions, so I'm not actually in the middle of it, but I see the outcomes, and. I, th I think it's a learning curve for all parties involved. So I think there's some outstanding outcomes in some cases and others where we're learning from. So, 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 so I, think, I think that process is excellent. Uh, I think uh, there's monitoring of those flows, which I think is also excellent. I think there probably should be more monitoring of the flows. You know, in, in terms of um, the, the basin plan, I, I think a major risk is we're not monitoring enough. So we're not seeing, you know, what are the positives and what are the negatives. So look, the, the basin plan is not a single answer. It's an adaptive management framework, really. It gets it has reviews. So yeah, I, I see some excellent wins in it. I see some excellent learnings in it, and um, it's still a, you know, a bumpy road to go. Thank you. Um, let's stick with monitoring, but I'll move on to, to fish numbers and stick with you, Dr. Mallon Cooper. Um, so what um, monitoring um, and metering of fish numbers has been done um, in the Darling and the Menindee Lakes uh, since the fish kills in 2019? Actually, that's also a good question. I, I'm going to have to take that on, on notice, Mr. Franklin. Um, no problem. Because I, I, I certainly have, have colleagues that are doing that, so I'll, I'll take that one on notice. Good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Do you, do you know if we've seen any improvement in the fish numbers in the Menindee Lakes with the recent floods? I don't know. Um, again, I think I, I could ask around for you, so I could also take a notice. Yep, that that would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the the structures. There's been obviously a lot of discu discussion about the in river structures, which clearly are ca causing a problem during low flow events. Um, uh, but now they're drowned out or they're overflowing, and so I'm wondering whether fish have been able to move along the Bow and Darling um, because of them being able to get over those structures mm. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. That's another good, good question. Yeah, we, th those weirs do go underwater, and at that point, and for example, Burke Weir goes under at ten thousand megalitres a day, um, and so yeah, in those big flows, that's how fish uh, get over. So what, what I found in, in in my research is that often there were small flows that the weirs are a barrier and the fish couldn't get past, but. But there are lots of fishways going in, and uh, I'm involved in some of those projects, and so that 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 problem is heading towards you know a, a solution again over you know probably another decade. Okay, so how do they currently get out of um, like Lake Condilla and and Lake Menindee, particularly um, given that the weirs don't have fishways? How, how does that happen at the moment? At the, at, at the moment in in Condilla, uh, as Condilla's drained, they're released into the Anna Branch. Right. And in Menindi, again, there's an outflow, so some fish will go out through that outflow, and then, and then, under natural conditions, in fact, Menindi lakes would drain naturally back to the river, and there would be a remaining pool of water. And usually, that's probably for the Menindi is probably about five to ten percent of that volume under natural conditions, and yep. and of course, that would support those bird populations. So just just sticking with the fish for a moment. Can, so can they normally swim back out of the Menindee Lakes and back up into the into the Darling towards Wilcannia? No, no, and okay. and I, I think I think that that needs to be addressed, and I think there's discussions around addressing that. Okay, okay. Um, can I move on just to um, environmental water and ask what your thoughts are about um, environmental water being released down the Darling Anna Branch? Uh, that's a, that that that's a good question because it, because the Dalian branch was uh, absolutely another thriving very very much an, an ephemeral system you know with water holes connected it was a thriving uh, system and um, it has been impacted highly by you know reduced flows. I I have actually some documents around that. So actually, uh, Mr. Franklin, may I also take that on notice? That would be, yes, please. Yeah. That would be wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the bevy of information <laughs> that we're going to be, <laughs> we're going to be receiving. No, that'd be wonderful, Dr. Yeah. Mellon Cooper. Um, and I guess sticking with that sort of fear uh, or that sort of issue, um, do, do you think, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of discussion around Menindee. Do you think we should be dropping water out of the Menindee um, to keep Lake Victoria full? You're you're asking very good questions. I, I think um, because because that, that's that's all about these multiple objectives and mm -hmm. uh, multiple environmental objectives. Multiple. This is water storage for Adelaide water supply and potentially irrigation. That is a, a complex question. I Happy for you to take I, it on notice. I think yeah. I might have to also take that on notice. <laughs> no problem. So um, I guess bringing the issue back a bit. Obviously, Menindee Lakes is is now 100% full without limits on floodplain harvesting. So, while it's in Commonwealth control, how do you think the MDBA should be operating the lakes broadly? Uh, gee, you're asking excellent questions. <laughs> I, I I have a, a few ideas around this, and um, and and they're, they're pretty well compatible with, with other other scientists, but. There, there are two views, you know, on on Menindee. One is that uh, it could be operated as a semi-terminal system. So you talked about the fish ending up in Menindee. Well, then you add fish passage, so fish go back out of Menindee, back up through Lake Wetherill and up the Darling. So it becomes a connected system. So it's it's one way to operate it, and then you also operate operate the Darling as a lower darling as, as a separate system but there's also a, another view of, which is you can operate the darling as a connected system and then fish you know flow out out of Mindy lake as well and flow out of Cornvilla. so so there 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 are different options and whenever whenever i've been involved in those flow decisions 
you realise there are so many, you know, competing objectives. Mm. So, so it's hard to have hard to have one model. But I, I would say there is, you know, I talk about a vision for the Darling. Menindee Lakes is absolutely part of that vision. I, I think it was such an extraordinary, um, and still is very productive you know, in terms of native fish. As as you as you said, ha, how those fish get out. I, I think that's absolutely a key to, to how the system uh, must work. The fish can get back out and up the Darling. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Mellon Cooper. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to reading further uh, those responses. Um, could I move, please, to Mr. Constantaris and just ask one question to you um, in your obviously capacity? Do you think that the penalties um, for illegal fishing offences are high enough? I was just um, thinking about when you were talking to Mr. Banasiak, and and that question just occurred to me. Oh, I guess the the, um, the the penalties should fit the offence. So hmm. I guess maybe we need to give uh, the courts a little bit of latitude. Um, and really treat serial offenders completely different to um, first time offenders and depending on the nature of the offence as well. Uh, recreational fishers are, are not adverse to seeing those who do the wrong thing and there's only it's a very small minority that do the wrong thing. Um, yeah, get um, get the, the, the punishment they deserve. And again, it reflects badly on us that uh, we, we see maybe 10 stories on social media put up by the department yeah. every year and they are and and they reflect badly on on recreational fishers and and again even seeing some of the comments uh, from fishers out there it's just you know it's just a slap on the wrist and these guys will go out and do it again and um so and these guys aren't uh, recreational fishers as well we don't class them as uh, very similar to us I mean if you are out there intentionally breaking the the, uh, the rules um, we feel that the 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 the, um, the fines and the punishment should fit the offence so absolutely uh, there's a again there should be some distinction between an innocent mistake. Um, a lack of understanding, but again, some of these uh, offences that we see are, are really targeted and um, and they're very specific um, outcomes, and that is primarily for black marketing and taking the excessive um, numbers of fish. So, yeah, it's uh, quite happy. Recreations are quite happy to see uh, those reviewed. We're also quite happy to see the fine revenue go back into our recreational fishing salt yeah, and as well. So that is a a, prior, a priority for us as well. We don't want to see the the fines going to consolidate our revenue. Um, fishers, recreational fishers, invest 15, 16 million dollars a year. 550 thousand of us pay a recreational fishing fee. Uh, any money we can put back into that fund goes back into uh, bettering recreational fishing in New South Wales. So, yeah, some some big fines would probably send the message home. We think. Thanks very much, Mr. Constantaris. And just a final question, uh, if I may, to Dr. Rowland. And Dr. Rowland, you may uh, prefer to take this on notice. Um, uh, basically, I was wondering, I guess, in two parts. Firstly, what sort of data was collected on fish movements uh, in the basin, in the Murray-Darling Basin, when you, uh, during your time, your long and distinguished career with the government? Um, and what sort of monitoring should be improved, um, do you think, to understand what we need to do to improve um, the whole of life fish cycle? Happy for you to have a crack at it now, or happy for you to yeah. take it on notice, whichever you prefer. Well, I'll make a, a few new general comments. Uh, in, in the early days of my career, we, we looked more at what species were aware. We weren't looking so much at fish movement. There have been some work done in South Australia, but it was more quantifying fish, looking at their distribution, describing new, new species, actually, as I did in in, uh, in the late 70s and early early 80s. Um, but there has been some good monitoring. Um, uh, there certainly, there was a large uh, research approach started in the early 1990s when there was con concerns about the inland rivers. And it was supervised by uh, Dr. John Harris and Peter Gurkey from New South Wales Fishing. It was uh, a big report written in the 1997 uh, and basically said the rivers were in some severe stress. Um, and uh, there's been some monitoring cis associated with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Um, so that there's, fa there's fairly good data, uh, background data on fish, where they move, where they're abundant, where they're rare. Uh, I'm told there's really good, the good work again now with uh, various ta new tagging techniques and monitoring of fish. So I think we have a fairly good understanding of, of the biology of many of our native fish. 
um, and their and their movement. I can't make a comment because I wasn't involved in movement and association with environmental flows because that's a fairly sort of new field of research. Uh, and young scientists, a lot younger than me, have taken that up and, and working hard at it now. Um, so I think that's perhaps uh, perhaps a, a, a quick summary of for that question, Ben. Thank Thanks you. so much, Dr. Rowland. And if you wanted to, if you had any further thoughts and wanted to put okay. them on notice, that would be lovely. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, if I can find some uh, recent papers from colleagues, I'll certainly uh, send them on to the to the inquiry. Yes. That'd be thank you so Thanks. much, Dr. Rowland, and thank you to all of our witnesses. That is the end of this session. Uh, the committee secretariat will be in touch with you in relation to questions taken on notice. So I believe we have a few and interest. I'm um, looking forward to reading some of those documents. So thank you very much. The committee will now break until 10.55. So we'll kick things off by formally swearing you all in now. If you could all please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation, the words of which have been emailed to you by the Secretariat will go in the same order. Mr. Chris Brooks. Uh, Chris Brooks, I'm Chairman of Southern River Rainy Irrigators. And um, you want me to take the oath as well? Yes, please. I uh, haven't actually got it in front of me, but uh, the evidence I'm about to give um, to this inquiry uh, is the truth, the whole truth. So help me God. Thank you. Perfect. Pretty much. Great. Um, then we'll go to you, Mr. Tim Horn. Timothy Horn, uh, Principal at Horn Legal. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. And finally, Ms. Rachel Strawn. Uh, Rachel Strawn, representing Southwest Water Users, Vice Chair. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thanks so much. We'll go to opening statements as well. If they could be kept brief, please. Um, the Southern River Irrigators, who's doing that one? Oh, I am. Um, okay. Thanks, right. Madam Chair. Thanks for the opportunity to present our case to the inquiry. Um, I really commend the politicians that are responsible for this inquiry. I've enjoyed uh, working with you and, uh, and providing information relevant to, in an attempt to try and hold people to account and comply with the laws in, the, in this water space. And, and seeking the right answer, I find, you know, is it's, it's always difficult. But in this case, it's, it, it gets terribly distorted by those with a conflict. Um, it depends on the questions asked. And uh, you know the big one that's been going for years is the legality of this issue, which is point one in your terms of reference. And and I suppose you know it is it is one of the many things that you have to resolve the legality. And I think the the, the simple analogy I've used to my people is when a policeman asks the guy who roars into town in a fancy car, is he allowed to drive that? Yes, he is because it's his car. But you know, he has to have a license, um, otherwise it is illegal. And uh, if he's drunk, it is a, it is a crime. And and this is where the diversions and distortions of so many of these water plans and gazettes and proclamations made to the Water Act have made it a very very complicated issue. And and the one thing that I would really ask and direct the committee is to focus on the who and the and the how and the why that all these these changes were made. But, um, you know, we have given previous advice to the New South Wales government and the New South Wales government um, in an attempt to show what, what we thought of, of, uh, of floodplain harvesting being illegal. We know and we have shown and gone to great ex uh, lengths and expense to show the, the impacts of the lack of flows coming down the Darling, you know, the impact it has on our region. The environment all the way along it, you know, when there's no water in the Darling, there are no fishes, there are no birds at Menindee, which is a picture behind me. And um, and it has a massive impact on our economy. And I just, I don't think it's fair or right that, that, that you expect the people in the South to comply with rules and, and regulations and metres um, and, and, and take a massive hit, you know, of, of, of nearly 50% of their water 
allocation and right that they've paid for when there is uh, no control on, on what has been taken up north. We've had to kick in, you know, personally, it's a, it's a non-profit organisation, uh, SRI, but we kick in a few bucks to, to do this work. And we're up against the New South Wales government with a budget, I hear, of $17 million just on this particular subject that makes it very difficult from, from, um, from our position to, to, to prove this point. But I think we have been able to prove the, the legality. We have been able to prove the volume of the storage is a triple. And we have been able to prove the massive impact it's, it's had on the food bowl of Australia. Um, you've got 373 floodplain harvesters versus about 12,000 growers in the south that have produced $25 billion worth of food in a pandemic so they can grow a bit of cotton. It's just something that it wants uh, looking at. And I would ask one question um, that, that is all of this process in line with the objects of the Water Management Act, the objectives and the principles, you know, that listed from from A to H, and principles from one to eight, you know, for for environmental benefits, environmental flows, you know, the degradation all the way down the Darling is the one chunk of water that falls up there, and if there's nothing coming down the Darling because it's taken out of a system without regulation it does impact everyone downstream. There is no other way it gets around the Great Divide or under, under, under underground water. And if you think that it's okay to spend, the federal government has spent $13 billion to buy back, about 83% of that water came from the south, which is nearly 2 million megs, to gift it to the guys in the north. Um, just doesn't make any sense at all. So we're hoping and praying that uh, we can get some some fair and reasonable outcome of, of these these rules and, and clarify them and, and, and just get a, a fair and reasonable outcome for all all water users, um, environment and economy. And and the, the, the sort of one closing statement that I do have is it's two rules for one state, it's not acceptable, you know, if, if these people are allowed to take whatever volumes of water they like from the system, then, then why can't we out of the Murray, which is going to have a drastic impact and we know it. On, on downstream users and uh, we are backed into a corner we are fighting for our lives uh, financially and um, and we and we believe that there's a, a hell of a good opportunity for us and we have litigation funders running the ruler over the damages inflicted on the 12,000 downstream users and it, it, it is in the order of a back of the envelope calculation of approximately seven billion dollars to date um, and here we are Try to determine how much, whether we're going to make it permanent or not. Thanks, Mr. Brooks. Thank you very much. I assume, Mr. Horn, that 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 you don't have an opening statement as well. That, that that's correct, Madam Chair. Yeah, okay, great. And we'll move yeah. to Miss Ms. Strawn, please. Uh, Rachel Strawn, representing Southwest Water Users. Uh, our opening statement is. Um, the New South Wales Southwest Water Users Association represents New South Wales licensed water users in the Murray River downstream of the junction with Murray, the Murrumbidgee River to the South Australian border, the Murray and licensed water users on the Lower Darling River downstream of the Menindee Lakes Water Storage Scheme. Our members use water for domestic and stock purposes, as well as irrigation of high value permanent plantings, horticulture and viticulture and annual crops using both New South Wales high security and general security entitlements. Located at the far southwest of New South Water, southwest of New South, our water needs are reliant on the supply of water from the Murray River and the Darling River and influenced by water harvesting and on farm storage surface water extractions and water management practices upstream. Priorities need to ensure that the water needed to maintain the health and productivity of the river and the communities that depend on this need to be a priority for water managers. Floodplain harvesting issues for southwest water users include the impact of floodplain harvesting on downstream users, which is typically no different from over extraction of surface water. The primary impact on downstream stakeholders is following especially extended dry periods. At these times, the immediate needs of the river, floodplain environments and critical human and cultural needs should take precedence over floodplain harvesting. Legality 
Floodplain harvesting in northern New South Wales has been occurring for decades, but increasing more so recently. At no stage has there been um, any real professional assessment process to determine what is or is not appropriate. And as a consequence, there will be some floodplain harvesting works which are justifiable and others which are not. And equally, there will be some times when floodplain harvesting should not occur and other times when it is valid. Southwest Water Users Association are strongly of the view that the assessment of the above issues is not yet of a standard which would justify the formal granting of floodplain harvesting entitlements. As a general principle, policy for floodplain harvesting needs to be articulate enough to maintain the integrity of intent and not to be manipulated in years to come. The Southwest Water Users Association believe that all water use, including surface water extraction and floodplain harvesting, should be included in the total sustainable diversion limit for water source. This should be driven by the 93-94 numbers, and when an increase in floodplain harvesting occurs, there should be a reduction of other extraction in that water source. Thank you very much, much Ms. Strawn. Um, okay, we'll now go to questions. We'll go to the opposition, Mr. Adam Searle. Uh, yes, uh, Adam Searle for the Labor opposition. Uh, thank you for your opening statements. I, I might direct my questions to uh, Mr. Horn, um, but if anybody else wishes to answer, they should feel free to join in. Mr. Horn, a lot of focus is being paid to the legality of floodplain harvesting practices. <laughs> Can you can everyone hear me? Yeah, I think what might have happened is Ms. Strawn may have been yeah, into okay. Yeah, I think if Ms. Strawn, I think you might your connection may have gone just then, but if your opening statement, sorry, that has finished now, maybe send it to the secretariat if you didn't get to finish it, and we'll be sure to ask you some questions. We'll continue on, Mr. Sell. Uh, so, Mr. Horn, there's two as a lawyer, there's essentially two types of unlawfulness, isn't there? There's there's activity which might expose someone to a criminal offence or some kind of offence under an act. And there's actions which may simply be said to be unlawful in that they're not expressly authorised or permitted by a piece of legislation. At a broad conceptual level, that's correct, isn't it? That's correct, Mr. Sir. So this committee sought advice from Mr. Walker SC about whether floodplain harvesting activities would constitute an offence under uh, various water legislation in New South Wales. And essentially his answer was no, but that that's a different question, isn't it, to whether or not floodplain harvesting is expressly legally permitted under state legislation, isn't it? That's, that's correct, Mr. Searle. Um, there's, there's a major difference between the practice of it being legal and, and the current um, volumes um, that New South Wales claimed to have been legal and permitted in 1994 and again in, in 2009. Okay, and, and if it wasn't in the floodplain harvesting was not expressly authorised by statute, even though it may not constitute an offence under, legis under legislation, nevertheless, there may be other legal consequences that flow from it of the kind that Mr Brooks has uh, touched on this morning. That, that That's correct. And I mean, I can, I can step you through um, no, I'll just, I'll just ask some questions, Mr. Horn, and if I've missed anything, you can come back to that. Yep. So, Section 393 of the Water Management Act, New South Wales, 2000, essentially abolishes all common law rights to water and vests them in the state. That's correct, isn't it? That that is correct, Mr. Sir. So unless so unless there is an express authorization by the state, you're not permitted to take water, for example, in the way that floodplain harvesting is occurring. That's correct, isn't it? That's that's correct, and and all water vests in the state under Section three nine two two of the Water okay. Management Act. So if it's not authorised or permitted or licensed, it may not be an offence under Section sixty capital A, but nevertheless, it's just it's not lawful in your view. That's that's correct. Okay, now um, under the Water Act nineteen twelve, it was possible to be licensed to engage in floodplain harvesting. That was correct? That's correct. The licensing okay, provision. But no, yeah, but no licenses were ever issued. That's correct, to your knowledge? With respect to floodplain harvesting, no. With respect to floodplain harvesting. 
And under that act, it was simply an offence to engage in floodplain harvesting without a licence, wasn't it? That's correct. It was it was an offence, but it wasn't an offence yep. to receive water. But if you used a work, um, yep. then to to impound water for for use later uh, for something such as irrigation, that was an offence under Section Twenty One Capital B One A yep. of the Water Act. Yep. But that act is no longer in place, is it? That 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 act uh, still continues in Part Two of of, of that. I don't, act. I don't like that. Yep. So, but 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 as it. 30 June 2009, which is the, the time at which the cap under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan kicks in, to your knowledge, there was no licence or authorisation or legal permission to expressly allow floodplain harvesting in New South Wales. That is correct, Mr Sell. So that means that the volumes of water that are authorised under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan cannot include floodplain harvesting amounts. Not in its current form, no, unless there is a, a, an equal offsetting um, of volume or reduction in another form of take, such as general security or high security. Okay, but absent that, uh, floodplain harvesting simply can't be counted within the cap in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. That's correct. And any any action by the New South Wales government to legislate, to authorise that in some way would be contrary to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and the Federal Water Act? That is correct. And therefore, in that sense, would be unlawful? That is correct, Mr Sell, yes. Um, thank you. There was a, a letter to the editor from Ms Baldwin, the Executive Officer of the Southern Riverina Irrigators. You're aware of that letter to the editor? I am aware of that letter, Mr Sell. Uh, I'm sure Mr Faraway will be taking you to it, but in that letter, it asserts that Mr Walker provided advice that floodplain harvesting had never been legal and didn't sit within the legal limits of the Water Act or the Basin Plan and any attempts to increase water take through water sharing plans would be a contravention of federal legislation. You saw that? I did see that. So is this the way we sort of reconcile the sort of what is said to be the sort of the difference in Mr Walker's advice to the committee versus what appears to be his advice to your client. That is, the committee essentially asked Mr Walker about whether offences had been or might be committed, but that's not the same as Mr Walker agreeing that floodplain harvesting is otherwise lawful, authorised or permitted. That, that's correct. There's a nuance to uh, what he has given to the committee in, in his opinion. Um, floodplain harvesting per se is is a legal act. However, if you combine that with a um, uh, with a work, or if you don't have a right to take that basic landholder right or some other right or exemption, then it is um, an unlawful activity. That's correct. Right. Um, so, so is that the way we should understand Mr. Walker's advice to this committee that he was asked a series of important but very narrow questions about whether certain activities would commit would lead to the commission of certain offences that that's that is correct um he there, there is two um ways to, to i guess his advice is quite narrow um it is correct however um it doesn't tell the complete story um because um, he wasn't asked to to elaborate upon that and importantly, the offence under 60 capital A of the Water Management Act is a lot more, um, well, it's different to the offence of water take without a licence in terms of floodplain harvesting under the Water Act 1912. It's not, it's not the same offence. That's correct. There's a few more things you have to, well, that have to be done uh, to come within 60 capital A. That's, uh, that's correct. Okay, so essentially under the federal legislation, it authorises the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Uh, it sets limits on or a process by which limits of water take can be determined. Uh, and that legislation is binding on federal agencies, but it's also binding in New South Wales on DPIE and the Water Minister here in New South Wales. That is also correct, yes. It is binding so, on the agencies of, of the uh, Basin States. So if New South Wales then sought to uh, include floodplain harvesting takes 
for the purposes of baseline diversion limits or sustainable diversion limits. That would not be consistent with the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and would not be consistent with the Commonwealth Water Act and in that sense would be unlawful. That, that, that's correct. That is correct, Mr. Sell. Okay. Um, have I missed anything? Um, I, happy to where, I mean, the, with respect to the, to the Water Act 1912, um, it, it, in 1999, um, New South Wales, um, in recognising that a, that a licence was required under part two of that act, it brought in the Water Legislation Amendment Act, um, which effectively allowed the ministerial corporation to make harvestable rights orders um, to exempt landholders from, from complying with that part um, when conducting rainfall runoff harvesting, which we know is a form of, of floodplain harvesting. So this was recognised um, by uh, New South Wales back in the 90s. Um, in, the, in the previous inquiry uh, in 2020 um, that we had into the floodplain harvesting exemption that New South Wales tried to introduce, um, border, border Rivers Food and Fibre actually stated to the committee that, um, and I quote, it is important that the committee understands that many applications for these part two, um, which is the licenses and part eight authorizations remain unprocessed by the New South Wales Department until 2018, when NRA took over the responsibility for them and finalized them. Some of these applications dated back to the 1980s. So were sitting in a department filing cabinet for more than 30 years. Such was a low level of priority put to them. So we understand that um, th there was application, or most likely was um, applications for these licenses. Um, for whatever reason, they were never granted. Um, the cap refers to 30 June 1994, and what was permissible under state water management law as at that point in time. Um, so if if floodplain harvesting um, was being legally conducted uh, somehow uh, with some other license or or uh, without a work involved, then potentially that could come under the cap. Um, but the current volumes that are being proposed by New South Wales, we understand, to involve the use of levees, structures, um, floodplain harvesting on, a, on an industrial scale. Um, and we think that this relates to perhaps a misinterpretation by some people that only a Part 8 works approval um, uh, was required in order to conduct unlimited floodplain harvesting. So what Walker says in his advice um, is correct. You could floodplain harvest, um, but you needed a right, an authorisation, a licence to use a work if you were going to, to impound that water and use it later on for irrigation. And, and that's something I think listening to, to some of the inquiries or some of the, some of the questions from, from some other committee members that perhaps there's a nuance that, that they haven't quite um, taken on, on board and, and they just think that this is some kind of blanket um, uh, right to, to floodplain harvest as much as you want back in 1994 and in 2009, I, I expect. So failure to commit an offence does not equal authorisation or approval? That's that, that's that's correct. Yes. Okay. Those are my questions, Madam Chair. Over to Mr. Veach. Uh, uh, thank you, Adam. My question is to uh, Ms. Strawn. From um, it relates to uh, your submission, where you make a very clear statement, uh, your organisation, that floodplain harvesting licences should not be tradable or transferable. Uh, and I'd really like uh, you to explore that with the committee. If you could just advise the committee why you make that statement. We feel that floodplain harvesting is truly connected to the land that it's associated with and that it shouldn't be able to be moved to another area of the river where it would um, either flood out the upstream communities or neighbours or also drought out the communities or neighbours below. So floodplain harvesting being the particular form of take that it is, is, is definitely linked to the land. Uh, it's also a way of controlling it that you're not putting onus on areas that can't meet the demand of an additional transferable right. So we are very much against it being tradable or transferable. Thank you. And in your submission, you also talk about um, 
triggers, the, the flow triggers in the northern tributaries, the Barwon Darling, the Lower Darling, etc. We heard yesterday, uh, sorry, on Monday in, in um, testimony, I think from the Border, Border Rivers Group, that there's an issue about the, the data, the transparency around the data that's available and the, and the number of gauges, in-river in, in gauges. Um, is that an issue in your part of this, uh, this important waterway? I, I totally agree with that. Um, we need adequate measurement all the whole length of the river systems to um, know exactly what is going on and, and where the water is. At the moment, we have the biggest problem where the northern basin and the southern basin are basically broken in two where they've separated the Darling River at Wilcannia, where we have um, minimal flow targets at Wilcannia of um, 10 days, 400 megs, which doesn't actually make it to Menindee at all. And we feel that the um, storage targets at Menindee and flow targets, the length of the Barwon Darling and the tribu northern tributaries should provide critical needs right through to the Murray Darling Junction, not just to Wilcannia, which is um, not where the Darling River finishes. And so my last question then, Ms. Strawn, to you is, um, so essentially if floodplain harvesting, if the floodplain harvesting regime uh, were to work, it would need substantial investment in, uh, in metering and gauging. I think that's a given anyway, um, government, it should be a priority to government to be as transparent and clear on, on all measurement, um, not only of metering on properties, but also within the river system. I know most farmers, you could ask them exactly how much diesel, fertiliser, fuel, water they're putting on per hectare. And I don't understand why government um, with resources at its hands can't be as accurate in all of their measurement of take or um, transporting water through the river. Uh, thank you. Uh, last question. So that's uh, up to, over to you, Rose. Thanks, um, Mick. I don't think there's a lot of time left, but um, I'll put my chuck my question in anyway. I mean, look, I think the issue of whether the current um, regime of floodplain harvesting um, that we know is occurring is impacting on the southern basin or not is a contested point. And we've had evidence from other witnesses and from DPIE essentially suggesting that the current floodplain harvesting that is occurring in the north has minimal impact on the Southern Basin. And I suppose then to you, Mr. Brooks, is that your view? Um, you know, what, what would, how would you describe the influence um, of extraction in the Northern Basin on the Southern Basin? Um, look, it's, it's pretty simple. They've actually produced a lot of facts and figures from previous days when there was the design of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, you know, these hydrologists took all these numbers and measured the flows. And the long-term annual average flow of water from the Darling River into the Murray River was uh, 720,000 megalitres, which made up 39% of the contribution to South Australia's fixed volume of 1850. And whilst that volume was coming down there, balance was made up between from the Murray River between 50 50 between Victoria and, and New South Wales. And because there's now nothing coming out the end of the Darling and they are making no promises to make any contribution and even their own twisted reports say that there will be 1% difference. I mean, there was nothing coming out the end of the river before this extremely wet year. Whilst that's not coming out there, the, the increase in floodplain harvesting is effectively taking our water out of our storages, which is why we're seeing a flooded Murray River going down to make up for the shortfall. And that's, that's the argument we have. Now, you take out 720,000 megs out of this, this area, our entire 100% allocation is only 850,000 megs. So, you know, it's, it's, it's affected our, our water allocation and subsequently, you know, cut our production by, by 40%. Drought years has cut it by 100% because we have a zero allocation. That is mega dollars of, uh, out of the food bowl and, and all of the environment suffers in between. Thank you. Great. We'll go to questions from the crossbench. I'll kick off with a few. Firstly, to Mr. Horn, if I can. On Monday, the committee heard that if the 500% carryover didn't exist, that New South Wales 
would license 3.2 times. I think the current proposed floodplain harvesting thought you manually. What are your thoughts on that? So if the 3.2 times um, 346 gigs is 1107 gigs, um, more than two times um, what was the storage as at 30 June uh, 1994 in, in, um, uh, in 1994. So even if the, the statement that, you know, this is what was being floodplain harvested back in 1994, there was no actual way, they had less than half the storage capacity to even capture that much water back in 1994, um, let alone all the other license entitlement that they had from, from, from their storages. Um, so, you know, and, and going back to what Border Rivers uh, Food and Fibre have said in their submission to this current inquiry, um, they said that there was no requirement um, to account for floodplain harvesting under the 1912 Act because it was considered by the government as unnecessary as it was so infrequent and such a small proportion of flow. Um, New South Wales have now submitted to this inquiry that, that, that this volume of water is going to amount to 25% um, of all the irrigation water in, in northern New South Wales. So, um, you know, we, we have this situation where, um, you know, there's a proposal to, to, to license what was once a, 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 you know, minimal amount of water, um, you know, somehow the models have produced and justify um, something that in a practical sense was not even possible to have been captured and stored back in 1994. And, and, and I guess that just that just shows um, how far out of whack everything has, has become. Thank you. And what about, so if the licensing of floodplain harvesting volumes were kind of over the existing limits, what would that mean for environmental water or planned environmental water? So all water which is in excess to the long-term um, extraction limits, um, so in, in excess of what the water sharing plans have provided for, that is considered by the Water Act um, as planned environmental water um, in, in, and therefore is protected and, and cannot be allocated for any other purpose. So. Um, 21.5 of, of the Water Act um, would also prohibit that water being um, given out for another purpose. Uh, it, it would offend um, that federal legislation. Okay, thank you. And I did want to get your views on the emergency works exemption regulation, actually, which hasn't been covered by this committee to date, but I did note that you um, mentioned it in your submission. Will the emergency works exemption allow for the diversion of overland flow without a license? What's your views on that? So the emergency works exemption allows someone to determine, um, self-determine whether or not there is an emergency um, and then to build some works and, and, and to hold that water. Um, they're able to hold that water for as long as they like and then if they want to use it for irrigation purposes, perhaps in the next season, um, then they can do so by converting it across to a supplementary license, a groundwater license, any other form of license. Um, we, our view is that if there is no restrictions around this, um, it's said that it was to do with urban um, situations, um, then you know, a 10 megalitre capacity could be, or, or limit could be put, put on it. Um, it just provides, you know, if someone has utilised all their licences um, and a flood is going through, then it, it, it gives an incentive for someone just to stop as much water as they possibly can um, and determine in the following years whether or not they converted across to a licensed entitlement or not. Um, and, you know, there's no skin off their nose if, if that happens. Um, if at a subsequent date, um, that, that, you know, NRA arrive and, and determine that there was an emergency or something, then it's a, um, a $1,500 fine for, for not notifying them of that. Um, so, yes, we think that without any limits and restrictions um, placed on, on that exemption, um, then it's open for abuse. And, and previous to that, there was, you know, state emergency services and so forth um, do have the authority to determine an emergency and, and, and can act accordingly um, to uh, to deal with those issues. And we think that's the most appropriate way to deal with emergencies. 
Okay, thank you. And I wanted to turn to NRA, who are appearing, NRA is appearing um, at Friday's hearing. Just wanted to get your thoughts, um, Mr Horn, as well, about what NRA's enforcement is like of floodplain harvesting breaches. To, to date, um, we understand that NRA has used its discretion um, to not to not to uh, prosecute any floodplain harvesting breaches. We're, we're not aware of any prosecutions that are, that are ongoing. Um, we have seen the uh, board papers for thanks to Standing Order 52, um, where they determined following the disallowance um, of the floodplain harvesting exemption uh, last year, that they determined um, to follow that path of least resistance um, and, uh, and, and not um, enforce these. Um, we've seen statements from from um, NRA that uh, they will only prosecute serious and willful misconduct. We, we we don't know what they determine as being you know that um, that level that standard, um, but certainly there has been not much activity from NRA to date uh, on this uh, on this um, you know illegal activity. Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Brooks. And then I've got a question for Ms. Strawn, if I still have time. Kate, my concern with with uh, with regards to NRA's performance actually goes uh, one one step further. Um, there is there's uh, copies of communication and boardroom notes from within NRA there where they're taking instructions from DPI about what they can and can't do with regards to enforcing floodplain harvesting, and that was after the disallowance motion to remove an exemption for these people against prosecution, whilst the argument was fairly clearly um, spelt out by your own um, your own uh, Crown Solicitor's Office that in their view at the time floodplain harvesting was unlawful um, and the exemption was defeated, the DPIE was still instructing NRA what they could and couldn't do. That didn't seem to sort of provide any independence sort of as per NRA claims. I was wondering, um, actually, if you could just provide those documents that um, you say that you do have, if you could provide them on notice to the committee, that would also be, be useful. Um, I'll just go to you, Ms Strawn. Um, you say in your submission that floodplain harvesting licences should not be tradable or transferable. Could you um, explain to the committee why you think that should be the case? Sorry, you're just on mute. Sorry, um, as as stated before to um, Mr. Vetch, we think they should definitely be linked to land so that it doesn't put onus on any other areas and, and it is truly related to a specific piece of land. Uh, the documents that they initially released to the public said that it wouldn't be tradable or transferable and we um, have support that the uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Strong, your internet connection is um is not playing nicely today. Oh. You may need to just so, keep okay. your video off for future questions. Yeah, we, we think that the, yeah. uh, it's, it's just that we think that it should be um linked to land because it is a very specific um, product that is it is only going to be traversing over that particular piece of land and it's not going to put the onus on other areas to then make up the shortfall. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to questions from Mr Mark Benaziak. Uh, thank you Chair. Um, I might start with you um, Mr Brooks. The Community Secretary would have emailed you a, a, a document which was a statement put out by the department um, around water allocation. And there's, you know, arguably when we talk water, there's a lot of big numbers thrown around. Um, and I just want to try and contextualize um, what some of those numbers are. So it talks about 358,000 uh, megalitres having been borrowed um, from an environmental water allowance, um, which is close to half of that. 750 megalitre figure you just you, you just spoke about in terms of what used to flow from the Darling to the Murray. Um, 
how much of an impact on allocation has that, I guess, borrowing that you have to now pay back had on compared to um, the impact of floodplain harvesting, in your view? It, thanks, Mr. Benaziak. The Barma Millowa volume of water um, is an interesting one, and I'm glad it is for contextualising because that came about, and this is the difference in the in the people, of, the attitude of the people in the south. When they were doing the Murray Darling Basin Commission, were actually drafting the the works and try to determine baseline flows and and um, and were very reasonable people. They identified that the extraction of water in the Murray Valley was such that it was effect, having a negative impact on the Barma Forest. And the Barma Forest is a very beautiful part of the world. It's spectacular with the red gum, red gum trees and, and native animals and all the rest of it. But the farmers in this region, not only New South Wales, but the Victorians made a voluntary contribution of 10% of their allocation to make up what is known as the Barma Mellower water. Now, back then that was general security water. The rules of of the basin plan are that you know they can't change the uh, they can't change the category of the water. Somehow that became high security water, and it's also water that is above the choke um, to be used for the flooding of the choke. And now in drought years, when we had a zero allocation, somehow this accounting, this modelling process, where the documentation actually continued to extract those fictitious volumes out of our allocation while it was on zero, have made it high security water. And then when we finally get an allocation, they, they then turn around and say to us that we owe them 350,000 megs that we borrowed during the drought while we're on zero. Furthermore, initial granting of that water by the local people for the benefit of, of, of saving the Barma Forest is no, no longer necessary because simply because the, the Murray River has run so high now that the Barma Mellower Forest that needed a, an irrigation or a drink once a year or once, uh, once every 10 years or once every five years is now flooded up to twice a year, at least four out of the five last five years, and it's being destroyed by too much water. So, you know, do we borrow from the environment? No, we don't think so. We granted water mm -hmm. out of our allocation for the benefit of the environment, and now it's being used against us in this, you know, fictitious modelling and accounting of water that is uh, eroding our allocation. Okay, thanks for that clarification, Chris. Um, in your, I think it was in your opening statement, you talked about that you just want fair and equal outcomes um, for, for everybody. So I guess my question is, what's what do you want out of this inquiry? What do you want out of, I guess, the licensing and regulation of floodplain harvesting? What does that what does that fair and equal outcome actually tangibly look like? Well, we we want everyone to comply with the rules. We just see, you know, a constant distortion of of the, of the what was the ba the Murray Darling Basin Plan, the subsequent Water uh, Management Act in New South Wales. There are set limits per valley that are capped. They're in legislation. They're not to be fiddled with. There are end of system flows supposed to be guaranteed. And you know, when I say the the uh, the objectives and the principles of the Water Management Act, which are similar to the to the objectives and outcomes of the Basin Plan, you now the old triple bottom line and all of that uh, all of that propaganda that we were, we were preached when they were implementing the Basin Plan, it became federal law in 2012. Water Act of 2007, um, the triple bottom line, you know, firstly, for the environmental benefits, secondly, for communities to have guaranteed water, and thirdly, for productivity. And that productivity was capped to a limit. Now, you cannot have, as I keep saying, two sets of rules for the one state. There is caps in the north and there are caps in the south. And if everyone sticks to the rules, there's sufficient water to flow to do all of the things that were intended. Now, the distortion of reports and the stacking of committees and the changing of rules with proclamations and gazettes is all doing one thing, and that is taking water out of the environment and, and, and gifting it only to the north. No instances of that in the south that I'm aware of. 
and it has is having a massive impact. And all we're looking for is for people to comply with all of the rules in all of this state for us all to be able to survive the environment. Okay. As can, well. can I just can I just thanks Chris? Can I just ask about the one thousand seven hundred twenty nine gigalitre figure that you had in your submission um, around the five hundred percent carryover? Um, is that is is that predicated on on the situational fact that every floodplain harvesting license that came into existence um, would do that five hundred percent carryover in the same year? So every every license holder would take up that opportunity at once. Is that what that figure is predicated on? That figure is predicated on the 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 maximum um, the proposed volumes that the DPIE are putting up to to license floodplain harvested by five hundred percent, and that's that's the, that's that maximum volume. Now our lack of of um, our lack of uh, I suppose. Uh, any faith in the in the existing compliance and measurement metering um, of any of this water in the north, we would assume that uh, you know that is the maximum volume they would take whenever that water is available. And let's let's face it, it doesn't come every year, but whenever it does, every every you know few years, they will take that maximum volume. They have the storage to take it. There is no no control or measurement up there that, that we have any satisfaction in. And, and that number is almost the equivalent volume of what was bought back by the government and given up by the people in the south. And that's just an example of the distortion of what we call, you know, the water flows. Okay. I've probably only got time for one more question, so I might go to you, uh, Mr. Horn. Um, in questions from Mr. Sill, you were talking about uh, Part Eight renewals and 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 how they were sort of put in a a uh, filing cabinet and sort of forgotten about. Um, do you think do you think now that they are sort of sitting in in regulatory limbo um do you think it was foolish by the the department to put them there before actually having the regulatory machinery in place the the issue is that um everything is sort of moved on from that so um it, the the cap crystallized on 30 june 1994 and what was um uh, the, the rules for allocating water um, and for operating water management systems as, a, as at that date. Um, so if those licenses were issued and it wasn't legal um, to use war works to, to floodplain harvest at that point in time, um, it's now been superseded um, by the Water Act, which, is, which has provided that legal limit. Um, and, and remember that New South Wales keeps referring to the fact that it wants to return floodplain harvesting to the legal limits. Um, we would now need to have a situation where New South Wales pleads its case um, to uh, the, 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 the Commonwealth Government um, to explain why we need to change the legal limits in the federal legislation uh, to include something that they hadn't licensed um, and, and left in the bottom of the filing cabinet uh, back in, in the 80s. Um, you know, th th that's the unfortunate reality of it, but that is the, the federal law overrides uh, the state law. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go to questions from government members now. Mr. Faraway, is it? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question to Ms. Strawn, uh, I take it from, I, you would agree with the Central Darling Council and um, obviously a lot of user groups and locals in Menindee that uh, the policy around the 640-480 giga rule, a gigalitre rule, has not delivered good outcomes for the lower Darling communities through its management through uh, the MDBA. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think the, in the original intent of protecting water for the critical needs of Menindee and the lower Darling have um, been, been overlooked and, and we've been a detriment to that. Um, so just following on, would you be able to explain to the committee, that, like with Menindee Lakes, it can hold more than 100%, and that is that obviously it's more than the, the 1760 gigalitres, but can be uh, pushed or surcharged to the 2050 gigalitres? And why is that? So that's currently at the moment. So we're sitting on about 109% at the moment, and that is to take pressure off the Murray uh, storages and they will be delivering that, I'm sure, um, 
under MDBA control operationally through uh, Christmas this year, so they don't have to put so much pressure on the Barmera choke and uh, a lot of environmental assets throughout the Murray, and they can still have their capacity delivery to meet all their, their irrigation needs on the Murray. So if we had um, another three years uh, of very low flows into Menindee again, how do you think we could um, more currently, so with floodwaters, how can more floodwaters be stored um, in back into Menindee Lakes uh, if you had another three year period of low, low flows? The critical part about Menindee Lakes is maintaining water in the upper two storages of Lake Wetherill and Pamamaroo. So, I don't think you'll be able to expand the storage at Menindi, but um, our main argument is that we're seeing water drawn out of the lakes very, very quickly, but we've also got reduced inflows coming into the lakes from the northern basin. So you've got less coming in and more going out, and that leaves absolutely nothing left for the local Menindi environment, community or industry. So it's critical that that two to three years uh, storage is maintained in those upper two lakes how they draw down Menindee and Lake Corndilla is pro it, it needs to be used operationally to take pressure off the Murray system and, and deliver South Australia's commitments. So just back to the question obviously around the, the 1760 gigs but can be surcharged the 2050. Would it be correct to say that um, it's because of cultural flow reasons? Is, is that why it's done or can be done? No, it's used as a storage for when it is needed um, to the south. Um, I think, and I can't speak on behalf of the Bukindji, but, but culturally, I think some of the biggest issues they have is in the dry years when there aren't flows and we don't have storage targets or flow targets throughout the river that adequately keep a healthy base river for, for everyone, which is, I think, absolutely paramount for government to make sure that those protections are there. So does the surcharge uh, of water above that 100% full supply limit that we've been talking about, does that have to be released quickly down to South Australia to protect um, I don't know, like the cultural values such as the burial sites around the Nindy Lakes? So there are rules that they can surcharge it up until the 31st of October, but then it has to be back to 100% capacity by the 1st of January. So it, there are varying rules that will actually protect um, floodplain areas and cultural assets throughout the area. So would you, do you agree with the release strategy? We're in constant discussion of how that would occur. Yeah. Okay. And how much um, does it take obviously to run the, the lower Darling? Under base flows, they run about 300 megs a day. So it's very minimal to actually um, have connectivity through to the Murray River. Okay. Um, are you aware, Ms. Strawn, of any rules that the New South Wales government has changed in the last three years that would protect or go to protecting low flows to Menindee? No, the only um, fl changes that they have done is actually create a, a first flush policy that reaches Wilcannia. Um, there are no protections in place to actually protect Menindee or the Lower Darling. Thank you, Ms. Strawn. Um, Mr. Brooks, um, obviously, uh, my co uh, parliamentary colleague, um, Mr. Searle, touched on this before, but um, Sophie Baldwin obviously wrote in the Daniloquin Pastoral Times that SRI had raised enough money to pay for Brett Walker SC to make a report to this committee. Um, I was just wondering what report that article was referring to. Uh, well, we, uh, sorry, um, Mr. Farrow, I yield. That was in response to some funds we raised from growers to, uh, to commission Mr. Walker to give us advice with regards to the legality of, of um, floodplain harvesting and review uh, some of our claims in, in the submission. So as we were factually and legally correct. So, I say Mr. Horn also had his uh, hand up there. We'll go to Mr. Horn as well. Yeah, just with respect to that, um, Mr. Faraway, I think you've heard probably uh, some of those views um, and we will be providing a, a, a summary um, of that uh, at the conclusion 
um, of this inquiry. I understand that Mr Walker is going to give evidence on Friday to the inquiry. So um, again, you can you can direct some questions um, at him as well. Of course, thank you, Mr Horn. Obviously, it's important because um, this committee, as you know, and, and Mr Brooks, I think, touched on it sort of in, in the opening remarks, but uh, this committee um, engaged Brett Walker SC for independent legal advice on the legality of floodplain harvesting. And yes, there, we've, we've spoken about the questions, um, but so you're happy to um, you're happy to provide a copy of that report um, from SRI that they, uh, in terms of the, what they engaged Mr. Walker on as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, we have no objections to that. With, just, just just with respect to that, um, there's, there's, it doesn't actually say report um, in that letter. Um, we can give you a summary um, of that, um, and you know that's that's. Um, that, that, that won't be a problem. Yeah, as long, and um, obviously in context, maybe to the questions that were asked of, of that legal advice, because that's obviously to be read in context is very important to what the answers are. We'll be submitting Apologies. something to the inquiry afterwards. Um, at the end of the day, um, the opinion um, of Brett Walker is is something that, that uh, he, he will be forthcoming with um, and will provide um, our summary of that as well. No worries. Um, to either, probably Mr Brooks um, to begin with, but if Mr Horn wants to answer it as well, but uh, in particular, just with uh, Sophie Baldwin, your um, CEO, I saw a video recently um, in where she suggested that floodplain harvesting had caused the uh, Darling River to run dry and claimed that if floodplain harvesting is licensed, the Darling River will never flow again. So I suppose my point is, is that if floodplain harvesting does cause the Barwon Darling River to run dry, then how would we? How would you explain that the Barwon Darling has essentially been flowing strongly since February, um, and we're seeing Menindee Lakes forecast to fill by summer, if not earlier, um, and that's despite floodplain harvesting uh, happening during the flooding events in March. Well, it just goes to show, um, Mr. Faraway, what an extremely wet year it was. That there was the capacity to fill all those storages uh, to the brim before water flowed past them, which is always the case, and, um, and, and enough to still film in India. It's an extremely wet season. Right. Right. So you, you would say that even though floodplain harvesting, so you're just saying it's, it's just a, an extremely wet year, that's the answer? Well, we, 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 have commissioned, we have commissioned a report with our pennies that we, 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 we get the farmers to contribute. Um, to give a report on the on this on the size of the dams built in New South Wales since 1994, which is something the DPI haven't been able to do, and have had a budget of 17 million dollars to do. But you know, it's 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 tripled in size since 94, and I fly over that region regularly, as you know, um, Mr. Faraway, and those storages were filled to capacity at the start of the cotton crop. You've grown a massive cotton crop. It's continued to rain. Your cotton crop is harvested and your storages in the north are full to capacity, every one of them. And there was still sufficient rainfall, fortunately, this year to flow downstream to fill Menindi. That's that's just a sign of a wet year. But but in Miss Baldwin's video, she's correct in saying that in a normal rainfall season, rest assured, if the dams up there are filled first, there will not be enough water to flow down the Darling to 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 give connectivity to the Murray. Um, Mr Brooks, in your in the submission from SRI, uh, it claims that floodplain harvesting licences will be issued above the cap volume. Do you think, isn't this despite there being ample evidence in DPI's technical reports to prove that the water tape will be kept within cap? I was just interested about what evidence do you have to sort of substantiate that claim? I, I'm, if I may first, Tim, the, the evidence that I'm working on is, is the difference between the, the federal legislated cap and, and DPI's made up cap scenario. Um, in the legislated MDBA cap, um, I would see that as being 46 gigs. Um, you know, and the, the proposal to give up, you know, I don't know, it's 350 odd gigs times 500% is, is, is just short of 2 million gigs. And that's, that's 
the, the, the insane part that I just can't accept. You know, you've, you, we all have to comply with the same legislated federal cap, and we don't accept we don't accept uh, fraudulent reports by DPIE that make up new cap scenarios. That's the issue with this inquiry, and that's what I'm directing the inquiry to investigate the construction of those types of reports by stack committees, the how and who and why. Well, I think that in itself, you know, choosing deep high fraudulent reports on the cap, that's, that'll be obviously something that we talk about well after the inquiry, I suspect, as well. Um, SRI uh, has previously stated that floodplain harvesting does not occur in the, in the southern New South Wales basin. Now, I'd sort of ask you how you form that view when there's, there's a fair bit of media coverage and, and um, findings on the public record that suggests that it does, um, especially, you know, we've got Murrumbidgee Chief Executive Brett Jones with the view that it happens in the south as well as everywhere else. You've got obviously the Weekly Times article that, that uh, talks about members of parliament and, and the Murrumbidgee, um, uh, the Murrumbidgee and SRI down, down your part of the world there. So I sort of say to you, do you, um, obviously you have to agree that it does occur in the south. No, I don't have to agree, um, Mr. Faraway. You know, those couple of very strong National Party supporters are entitled to their opinion, but the, the, the thing is, I don't, you don't, I don't think the member for Murray is the a National Party supporter. No, but you can't, you can't, you can't get the, to, to pick the facts. There is no floodplain harvesting down here of any relevance. I think there is, you know, bits and pieces that are all sub sub one gig. Um, that's a bit different to the millions of megalitres that are extracted from the northern basin by comparison um i think my i think the chair may have been asking this question earlier and i just wrote a note to follow on and it was around the rainfall runoff exemption um and obviously so some are advocating that 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 the rainfall runoff exemption reg uh have also insisted that somehow that that is our back door to floodplain harvesting um are you aware of the, that the regulation would cease to have an effect in the Northern Valleys when floodplain harvesting is occurring. And obviously to that point, while I've got you, Mr. Brooks, um, you know, the rainfall runoff exemption is required by irrigators in both the North and, and Southern basins, uh, and that is to comply with their farm works authority conditions. So what I don't understand is why would SRI oppose it when their members actually require it? Rainfall, uh, rainfall runoff exemption is controlled by a percentage, a very small percentage of the, the area that you're, you're capturing on your farm, which, which is, is, is allowed and acceptable um, in both the north and the south. I just want to clarify that you're not uh, confusing the emergency works exemption, which really does muddy the waters, and it allows people in the north to capture massive volumes, claim emergency works, and at the end of the day, it is just to get out of uh, jail free card uh, if they fail to report it. It's a, it's a $1,500 fine for people that are growing many, many millions of dollars of cotton on free water, and that's, that's a concern, not the rainfall runoff. Um, just while I've only got a little bit of time left, so just quickly, maybe Mr Horn can answer this, but I'm happy if you'd like to, Mr Brooks, but Southern Connected Basin Communities uh, in its submission claims that floodplain uh, harvesting licensing will rob Southern Basin Communities of 720 gigalitres a year. I just wanted to know sort of how is this justified because I, are you suggesting or is it being suggested that the annual floodplain harvesting take of 720 gigalitres when the current estimated take is actually less than 400 gigalitres and, and even, even the 400 gigalitres, um, even that would be cut by a third when regulated. I can answer that. I'm the chairman of the Southern Connected Basin Communities and the 720 megalitres that will be, will be taken from this area is a simple calculation of, of, of the fact that if you allow floodplain harvesting licensing as per proposed by DPI in New South Wales, uh, government at the moment, it will remove 720,000 megalitres of long-term annual average flows out of the Darling into the Murray, which were destined and set up as part of the baseline flows for the South Australian volume. Now, when that doesn't come down to Darling, as we've seen in the last few years, that volume is, is taken from our storages here on the Murray in the Yume Weir. And that is equal to the, our 100% of our allocation or close to. 
So that's why the southern people are concerned about restricting the floodplain harvesting take to the regulated Murray-Darling Basin legislated cap volumes because effectively, if you take any more than that 46 gigs, you are effectively taking water out of our storages. Um, Madam Chair, I think my time's expired. I just wanted to confirm a point um, for Mr Horn um, with regard to the taking on notice of um, the Brett Walker advice that SRI had commissioned um, or engaged themselves. It, it clearly does say in Ms Baldwin's um, letter to the editor from the Denny Times that there was a report um, that SRI had received. She clearly states that in the letter to the editor, and I noticed you said that there was no report. So, um, you know, the CEO of obviously the organisation, SRI, clearly says that there is a report. So just wanted to clarify that. Understand. You're taking that on notice. Can, can I... Point of order, point of order, Madam Chair. Point of order has been taken. The issue is whether the report was written or verbal, surely, not whether there was or wasn't a report. I mean, Mr. Faraway should be very clear about this. Thank you. I'll just, in relation to Mr. Horn, I think you were just about to respond to that. Yeah, Madam Chair, I was just going to note um, the reference is to Brett Walker's report um, to the uh, inquiry. It's not in reference to his report to SRI. Um, again, it's a nuance but it is a difference and uh, his report has been uh, provided to the inquiry. I can confirm that SRI uh, wasn't aware of actually what was in his report or what was going to be in his report um, at, at that point in time, um, except for the fact that, um, uh, and, and I, I won't put words into um, the mouth of Brett Walker, um, however, um, Floodplain harvesting is not a lawful activity without a right or a license. Um, and so um, there may have been, uh, you know, some paraphrasing going on there, um, but that's the report. Thank you. Sorry, I thought that was going to be extremely quick clarification. So uh, a little bit of uh, let's we need to um, we need to finish this session. So thank you so much for appearing to all our witnesses. The Secretariat will get in touch with you with any questions you've taken on notice. So thanks so much for appearing again. We'll have a very short break. We're back at 12.05. Thank you. Thank you. Let's kick things off. We'll just begin by formally swearing all the witnesses in. So we'll start within uh, with the order that I um, just did the audio check. So if you could please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. I think the Secretariat has emailed that to you. So we'll start with you, Mr Terry Smith. Uh, I'm Terry Smith. I represent the Menindi Lakes SDL project stakeholder advisory group and I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you Mr Smith. Well we, I think we will have to get you to turn your video off because that was difficult to hear and I think Hansard would prefer that. Um, so thank you. We'll go to you um, Mr McBride. Um, I'm Robert McBride, Grazier Western Division, New South Wales. I actually found my Bible from school. I haven't dusted it off since then, but I swear the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Great. Thank you. And finally to you, Mr Ledrow. Um, Ross Ledrow, President of the Darling River Action Group and uh, former owner operator of the Broken Hill Indy Mail and Freight Contractor. Um, yeah, we'll go to the, what are we doing? Go on to the yeah, the oath or the affirmation? I haven't got that in front of me, so you'll have to. So, what is it? I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So, oh, my God. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank right. you. Okay, now, would you like to make short opening statements? I'll go to you first, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Um, yes. I, uh, I grew up in the Darling, about 50 kilometres south of Menindi. My parents um, grew up on the Darling, the Lower Darling. All my grandparents grew up in the Lower Darling, as did uh, a lot of my ancestors. I have a, a, a history there stretching back um, almost to the European settlements of, of Menindi and will 
Wolkania and Wentworth, which gives me a, a great understanding of knowledge of the river. Uh, there seems to be a direct correlation between increase in development and extraction in the north, including floodplain harvesting and its associated infrastructure over the past four decades with reduced flood heights in the lower Darling South of Burke through to Wentworth. Um, if floodplain harvesting is to be licensed, there must be stringent and enforceable laws to protect first flush and low flow events in dry periods. There must be science-based flow targets all along the river that dictate when and how much water could be extracted under any new licensing regime, and every effort must be made to prevent the environmental disasters we have seen along the Lower Darling and at Benindity particularly over the last five years. New rules safeguarding these flows need to be in addition to existing water sharing plan measures which are failing dismally to protect the Lower Darling. And New, New South Wales DPI water staff are telling the Indy Lake stakeholder group that due to climate change, there could be 30%, up to 30% reduction of inflows to the Northern Basin system over the next 50 years. This is cold comfort for industry in Indy with already a thousand part-time jobs and 150 full-time jobs lost out of that community alone <clears throat> in the last 10 years. And that's been caused because of unreliable flows which have been partially caused with extraction in the north. This environment and the community is already under immense stress due to diminishing water resources. It's now an appropriate, it's now an appropriate time to be adding additional licenses and further extraction. I would ask that the members of this inquiry panel consider very closely what negative effects licensing, floodplain harvesting and extraction in the north may have on those of us who rely on the river in the south. If floodplain harvesting is found to be legal and therefore must be licensed, there must be absolute transparency around take with a register of license holders and remote telemetry monitoring and metering. There can be no carryover provision on new licences as this has been detrimental to the river in the past. There must not be the ability to transfer a floodplain licence from one location to another in the same valley or a different valley. It must be attached to a location of a specific harvest infrastructure and used for take in that spot and remain there. Any new licences issued must not be a compensable asset in the future event that New South Wales has over allocated this asset and needs to recover the some quality of the licences used. Floodplain harvesting, if it's licensed, it must also be sustainable for the whole of the Darling. Um, and I will finish my presentation with one question to the panel is um, how many of the panel members have actually been to Menindi to see the river itself? Long may the barker run. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. We'll go to you now, Mr. McBride. Thank you very much, uh, Lady Chair. Stealing water is a heinous crime. It's not short term, it's long term as well. We're destroying the environment as a national sport. The Northern Basin love this. I mean, if you've got bank robbers and said, steal as much money from a bank as you want, and we'll give you a slap over the wrist or a $5 fine, they'd continue to do so. So with the help of the National Party, they have destroyed the integrity of a river system, a great river system, the Darling Barker. It's destroying our environment, our communities, our families, your food security, and I'm a broken man because of it. I'm one of the largest landholders in New South Wales by area, but what they've done in the last five years is criminal and more destructive than we've ever seen on this planet before in this country. So I pay my respects to the Bakinji and I look forward to discussions today. The fact is, Floodplain harvesting is not harvesting at all. Harvesting is when you sow, you reap. The fact is floodplain harvesting is the murder of the river system and must be regulated highly and stringently in extremely large rain events. But for most of the time, um, the environment is paying the price and the rivers. Thank you, Lady Chair, for your time. Thank you, Mr McBride. And finally to you, Mr Ledra. Thanks, Kate. Um, river flows and connectivity are the main issues facing the Darling River and the Lindy Lake Scheme, and really the entire Southern Basin. Since the 1990s, the increase in water usage and on-site storages have dramatically increased, the enormous stress on a fragile Darling River system that depends entirely on rainfall. Regardless of whether floodplain harvesting is licensed or not, the effects will be felt by communities and the environment, especially the Darling River. Floodplain harvesting license policy cannot be considered as it is, as there are too many grey areas which appear to be 
based on modelling assumptions and not science, a trait that is common within the New South Wales government water agencies and their consultants. How can a floodplain harvesting policy be considered when New South Wales water sharing plans are not completed? Prime example is the Mindy Lake scheme. Licenses will not bring savings back to cap levels. They will still exceed the 1994 levels. Science is also an issue. Water agencies have failed dismally in the past for police events. Once again, the New South Wales government appear to be window dressing. Removing all structures since the cap was introduced, levees, river diversions, etc., and let all benefit, including the environment. The entire Darling River Menindee Lake scheme and Anna Branch have been hardest hit economically, environmentally, and culturally, and the flow on effects reach the Murray River. Fish kills highlighted, highlighted the New South Wales government's water policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will go straight to questions from the opposition. Ms. Rose Jackson, I believe. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks everyone um, uh, for coming along and your written submissions um, and your contributions today. Um, I'll kick off um, with a question um, to you, Terry. And uh, in response to your question, yes, I have been um, to Mindy Lakes. It was lovely to meet you there <laughs> um, and get a little bit of a tour um, around that beautiful and unique um, part of the world. And one of the things um, that I reflected on um, when I was there and, and hearing you talk about it was obviously that incredible depth of knowledge, that local knowledge and expertise um, that you and others um, from that part of the world have about that um, significant and fragile ecosystem. And do you think the current control and management system of the Menindee Lakes gives enough prominence to those local voices and those local expertise, the current rules around, you know, who is in charge of making decisions about when water is taken from the lakes and where it's stored in what lake, does that give enough prominence and centrality to local control and management, do you feel? Thank you for the question, Rose. Uh, no, I don't I don't believe I don't believe so. Um, there have been mistakes made in the past uh, with with increased outflows from the lakes which which have left many Indian and lower darling stranded and without water uh, and it exacerbated our, our problems there but that's uh, not necessarily pertinent to Menindi south Menindi has to fill up from the northern basin um, and what happens in Menindi is only part of part of the picture it's actually the bigger problem is getting a reliable water source to Menindee uh, under the current water sharing rules in the north, which are inadequate. Things that um, has come up a couple of times is, you know, the importance of those um, sort of first flush and first flow events after droughts, you know, droughts are unavoidable. We know that we know we will have another drought. Can you talk about how, how important they are, you know, your long-term experience as someone who's working and, and um, it, you know, active in the Menindee Lakes area, how, how important are those first flush and first flow events um, to the ecosystem there? They're, they're a hugely important um, part, of, part of, of how the river, river works. Um, and under uh the flows that's, that's, which have now thankfully filled the lakes up um you know there was allocation given to extraction in the northern basins for abc class and consumptive use when people in the lower lower darling had not had access to high security water um but the township of burn Kerry was still struggling to get water the water quality there was abysmal those small flushes and those first flow events are crucial for the health of the river, they they flush they flush the weir uh, the weir pools, all the pools, not just the weir pools. Um, the stagnant water give everything a chance to have a bit of respite um, and breed and feed, and you know they they underpin the entire river system. So they they must be protected at all costs um, from 
from extraction, and I don't believe they are at this stage. I might ask um, Mr McBride a question. Um, I just sort of wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on some of the longer term impacts of the current arrangements on you and sort of the work that you're doing in your business. I mean, you know what, I think sometimes we can get a bit sort of lost in the, the sort of the technical detail, but what, what are the impacts that the current arrangements are having um, in your part of the world? Thank you for the question, Rose. Look, as a young man, I'm fifth generation farmer. Uh, we've been farming in Australia for about 170 years. Uh, I took it upon myself to give it a red hot go. And <clears throat> I'm, you're sitting to, with a broken man now. Um, the greed and corruption, the destruction of the environment. Um, I was one of those dead fish guys holding up one of millions of dead fish um, when you know it's got nothing to do with nature. Um, there's a term called post-traumatic stress syndrome, apparently, and uh, your fight or flight type mentality. And that's what I've become over the last four or five years. And it's affected me as an individual, probably destroyed my marriage. And um, I'm a very different person than I was probably five or 10 years ago. And I'm not proud of it. Um, and it's not to do with drought. Droughts are something that farmers have done so and, and put up with for generations. That's occupational hazard. But we, what we've faced is bullying. Um, I've still got the card here from the cotton grower communications manager. <clears throat> when I was at a Sydney meeting about a year ago, shoved it in my face and said, you stop everything you're doing now or we're gonna destroy you, your family and your business. Now I did write a police report. There was two other people present, but the police decided not to proceed with that, which is a bit of a tragedy given this, this lady's communications manager for Cotton Australia. Um, look, all forms of intimidation have destroyed the river system and the integrity of the river system. So, Rose, look, it is personal. Watching, you know, we employ five families um, and I guess indirectly probably 50 or 60 more when you think of all the shearers and all the people that come and uh, spend time on Tolano. Look, we've had a proud basis of history running back 151 years. We've worked closely with the Barkindji and to watch the Barkindji nation collapse and die is what we see as well in our own communities. Um, we've always acted with integrity. We, we trusted the government to do the right thing and we believed every Australian would treat the river with the respect it was warranted. Um, clearly that's not the case. Um, it's a national sport. It's a national disgrace what these vermin can do. And they know look better than vermin because they're intentionally killing the integrity of the river. Uh, we've had satellite imagery from the 1950s and 60s. Um, why aren't these exposing all the illegal floodplain harvesting that's taking place? Um, these are some of the issues. So look, I'm a broken man. I'm trying my guts out to become a better man. Good to see the seasons return. And, and please, a lot of the national people seem to focus very much on the Manini Lakes are all full now. Um, great, let's give up this inquiry. Um, remember, twice in four years, the Manini Lakes were drained by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority uh, one time they let seven years supply of water down in four months. Um, those at the top of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority are still there. Uh, it's been split up into two groups, but um, uh, the people who have done the damage are still in place and we're very cognizant of that. So look, Rose, um, our communities, it's personal. And at the end of the day, um, you, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a Bakinji elder or anybody else, you expect there to be integrity in a river system. And we ask you all and sundry to really look at all these issues. Um, you know, modeling, valleys, all these words that really are just absolute rubbish. Um, there's a river system called the Darling Barker. Uh, the Menindee, uh, the Barkindji have been along it for 60,000 um, 60, years and they deal with trust and integrity and have looked after it. Uh, there's a lot of people on the river system using terms like valleys and modeling. Um, there's enough technology out there now so that you can, when rains come throughout the year, telemetry, et cetera, will tell you what's coming down the river. And you need connectivity, you need protection of the river systems and human needs and the environment must come first before short-term profits on industries and man-made dams that effectively with evaporation and water loss might be 10 times worse than the Menindee Lakes. And the fact that uh, 
uh, species of fish are dying out. Um, to watch your environment collapse um, is the worst thing I've ever had to see. It's not short term, it's been going on for years. That doesn't make it any better, whether you see dead fish or rotting fish or a dry river darling barker. It's a catastrophe that no Australian should have had to have seen. And it's straight out of the worst case scenario of greed and corruption, because you can get away with anything in Australia, just top of a, a small fine of 50 or $100,000 and go for your life and take what you want. And floodplain harvesting has been illegally takes for up to 27 years, unmeted and un, un, um, undeclared. So we've really got to get everything, the ducks lined up through this inquiry. The National Party in the lower house is already saying, well, they'll, they'll wash their hands and start floodplain harvesting tomorrow. It just shows you how they disregard you and the upper house and people asking honest inquiries. So I'm rabbiting on long enough, but uh, there's some of my thoughts, Rose. Finn sold us drawing. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, I wanted to ask Terry um, just one other question before our time runs out. I might pass over to Ms. Mick, Mr. Beach if there's time. You mentioned um, in your um, opening submission the importance of targets of flow targets flow triggers all along the length of the river and i wondered if you could elaborate on that because there's been some you know suggestion that okay there may be some kind of downstream targets but sort of just you know limit that maybe you know to a kind of you know supply volume in the lakes themselves or something like that and why do you think those targets and those triggers along the length of the river um, are so important Well, that, I think they they orbit towards um, towards river health, and the specific targets I guess we would need is is end of system targets, which would be in the Menindee Lakes. Um, and it's no secret that the stakeholder group is pushing for for at least 18 months supply to run the Lower Darling. Um, and if once those once that target's met, then that is um, I guess the trigger point for extraction or or whatever in the northern basin. But there needs there needs to be an end of system target, and that is all along, um, all along the system, but specifically at the end of the system. So we can, I guess, we can work out how much is coming, how much has passed a certain point um, to allow extraction, if that's warranted. And I understand that we can't wait for the water to get to Menindee because then there'll be no, nothing left in the northern basin. But it's a multifaceted um, system, and we, and we sort of can't just put one one measure at Burke or one measure at Kenya, uh, and and on that note, the existing measures um, at Burke and Wilcannia are, are ineffective to sustain water through the system to Wentworth. Uh, but there, there needs to be much more, I guess, metering and modelling or monitoring, not modelling, monitoring of, of the water and how, the, how it works and who, which, which rivers contribute what and, and where the water's going. Um, if we are going to make this work, we need a lot more data on on how to make it work properly because like I've said before, it's not working for the Lower Darling and Mini Lakes or pretty much South of Berg at the moment. If you had a question, you might jump in. I think our time yeah. is about to expire. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just a very quick follow-up question to, to that, that response, which is essentially is, do you think there is a sufficient uh, gauges and metering stations in the system to, to deliver that, uh, that accountability and data you're talking about? No. <laughs> elaborate. Hey, that, that, that's, that was a uh, nice short question considering the opposition's time did it as soon as Mick asked that question. Okay, go to questions from the crossbench. I'll kick off with a couple. Um, go to you, uh, Mr. Ledra. I just wanted, we've had a beer together on your back porch in Sunset Strip and I remember very clearly the story you told me about what Lake Menindi used to be like. You kind of had this story about all of the the um, families along Sunset Strip who had bought that, those homes for their retirement. I think you're, you're one of those uh, people. And Sunset Strip used to be, uh, when the lake was full, used to be this wonderful uh, place with you know families and grandkids running around. Could you paint a picture for the committee what it was like and what it's become? Well, now we've got water, it's a bit returning to what it was, although COVID's put a dampener on people attending. But um, when the strip was built in the 60s, um, it was it was holidays, but mainly mine workers 
and it was their retirement. Um, they built a lot of uh, transportable homes. Um, it took them, it took them years and years to pay off because a mine worker doesn't get a, or did in them days get a, a big superannuation or a retirement fund. So they battled hard to maintain a home in Broken Hill as well as, as well as something here for their retirement, which is it's laid back. You've got Menindi 15, 16 k's away. Um, there's recreation, um, whether it be skiing the kids or uh, you know fishing the abbey and um, everyone intermingled. Um, when the, when the lawns and whatever were, were kept alive by pumps from the from the river, it looked it looked like the front of Sunset Strip was one lawn. You know, it was maintained from two or three k's, whatever how long the Sunset Strip is. Um, you know, people would would group together for evening barbecues with kids running around. Uh, later on, there was a hall built, which got a social club up and running. Um, for the retirees, they'd pay for it over their working life. They um, they were still with friends. It was safe, um, relaxed, casual. You know, a typical a typical bush scene. Um, after we purchased our place, um, prior to that, we lived for 10 years on the central coast. And um, my wife's uh, ex-boss come over when we moved back for a holiday with her family. And um, they camped They camped on, um, on the junction of the Lake Wetherill, Lake Pamamaru and the main weir. They were only going to stay three days because they were up through the centre of Australia um, to get up in the morning and look on the river below them and then be able to walk 100 metres to the Lake Wetherill, 500 metres to Lake Pamamaru, the sunsets. They couldn't believe it. They could not believe it. They then used to come around our place of the strip for lunch or whatever. Their first their first look at looking around the front on the, from the lawns on the lake side, they were amazed. They were amazed. The lake falls so many birds of all description. And I remember at the time they said, now this is nearly 20 years ago, how much would a shack cost? And uh, we said, well, the best one here would probably set you back $80,000. They nearly fell over. They nearly fell over to say, you've got this paradise for such a little amount of money. Um, you know, and they commented how lucky we were. Um, out of the couple of months that their trip was supposed to take um, with their children, they spent three weeks there instead of three days on the Menindee Lake Starling River. Um, you know, so that, that's what it's about when people, now that it's full once again, hopefully COVID will lift and, um, you know, we can get the people back out because tourism alone is over $100 million to the local economies. So going, so going forward then in terms of floodplain harvesting, so what will be the impact then if the level of floodplain harvesting is allowed to to continue and is licensed. So what, what is the impact going forward on the on the lakes? Well, there's a couple of main reasons the lakes get impacted so bad. And that's, as Terry said, we've got to have flows and we've got to have river connectivity. Um, you know, that just keeps everything alive. When you look at now, we've got over 100% in all the lakes. So to maintain the status quo of a full lake and a flowing river, it's not requiring huge amounts of water. It's just maintaining what you've got. So we've got to have river connectivity. We cannot afford any more water being taken out. And the problem I've got with floodplain harvesting is the New South Wales government and its water agency have failed dismally over the last 20 or 30 years in regard to compliance. You know, we look, we look at uh, metre tampering, 
we look at the uh, Four Corners report on pumps, uh, we look at illegal take. Now, whether that's not enough inspectors on the ground, but to me, it's a lack of will by the government. Um, yeah, so we, we, we're very reserved. I mean, licensing will not return it back to uh, the 1994 areas. You know, it'll take a bit off and the government will get up and do a handstand and spruik about what they've done, but it's only, it's only gonna take a wee bit off. It's not gonna go back to when everything was rosy in 1994 levels. So, you know, as I say, when you add that up, you add compliance and all the rest of the stuff. Flood Thank flood, you, Ms. Uh, floodplain harvest licensing is window dressing. Thank you, Mr. Ledger. Um, unfortunately, my time's expired. There's a, never enough time in these uh, in these sessions. But we'll go to uh, questions from Mr. Mark Benazier. Thank you. Um, I think my first question would be to you, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, in your submission, um, you you state that the licensing of floodplain harvesting in the Northern Basin can only add to further stress um, to what's already an already over allocated system. Now, the the department's proposal or current proposal as it stands is talking about room, they're claiming um, that it will take one third of what is currently taken by floodplain harvesters um, and, and give it back to the environment. Um, and just picking up on what Mr. Ledger was saying just then, um, as it's just window dressing, do you think that one third is enough? Thank you for the question. Uh, no, I, I think that'd be that'd be probably doubtful. And I guess that depends on which one third they want to give back to the environment. Now, if they give the first one third of water down the system back to the environment, that will go a long way to fixing some of the problems. But if it's the last one third, the top one third, which this government has a habit of, of purchasing water, which is not the right water to purchase, then I would suggest it would be a dismal failing once again. So it needs, if the one third is going to come back to the environment, then it needs to be the right one third and it needs to be the bottom one third, the most essential one third to provide connectivity through the entire system and protect those low to medium flows, specifically the low flows are the ones that need to be looked after. All right. So, so just maybe to ask the innocent and silly question, would it be better to take the third over the spread and not, not just take the first, not, not just take the last, but take the third over? I guess the spread of the the flows would that would that be better than just taking the first? Uh, I would suggest it would be yeah, you know, and it's one of those things. That it's, it's always every situation with water seems to be different, but generally speaking, coming out of a dry a dry climate uh, or a dry spell, then it would the first one third would be the would be the one third that would need to be protected. If for all intents and purposes, it was a it was a wetter a wetter period then that one third might be able to be to be um to be stretched stretched a bit wider but at, at, at the end of the day one third um back to the environment seems to be be, be a bit of a rip off uh, one of one of my arguments here is that the environment provides all the water in the system but it's the only the only part of the system that doesn't get a commission out of its use um and and then yeah the rest of us are squabbling over trying to get some water back to the environment. It actually came from the environment in the first place. And um, then the government feel like it's, yeah, it blows its whistle, say, are we giving this water back to the environment? It's actually stolen the environment to start with. It hasn't compensated anyone for that water. So as to say, we're going to give a third back. Um, you know, is that just on the floodplain harvesting losses? What about their own, their own admission where inflows are going to drop by one third in the next 50 years? How are they going to address that with the current and existing licences as opposed to creating more licences? I mean, these these are questions that the, only, the government's own information that they are speaking to us that they cannot or will not answer. Okay. Um, just picking up on the opposition's questions, um, this is to all all uh, members, um, about the the need for, I guess, better, better modelling, better gauges, better telemetry. Do you think we, do you think that, when I say we, do you think the department does a, a good enough job in actually measuring and 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 I guess checking that the environmental flows are actually getting to where they need to um, in their entirety. 
and do you think um, we actually probably need to do some better work in in measuring to make sure that the environmental flows get to where they need to get to and actually achieve the purpose they were actually set out to achieve? I'll start with well, Mr. Yeah, Mr. McBride, you had your finger up. Thanks, Mark. Sorry. Look, you just look at issues like cap. So going back to 1994, there was a cap set, 46 gigs. And now you've got the government departments coming out in New South Wales saying, well, we've got a new cap. It's 8.5 times bigger. It's 360 gigs plus 500% carryover. Now, when you've got government departments effectively telling you these make sense, you've got to question them. And so realistically, we, you just need tangible, independent technology and science to come up with the answers. I, don't, I think a lot of the government departments have lost their integrity uh, the way in which the Murray-Darling Basin Authority let the Manini Lakes go dr well dry and, and have the fish kills, that wasn't nature. That was a total lack of deliberate planning and allowing the system to collapse. Um, these are the reasons why I personally don't have that much faith in the government departments. I have a lot more faith in the people like Mary Ann Slattery and independent scientists, the Martin Mellon Cooper and the gentleman you spoke to, to other ladies and gentlemen. They're the ones who act with integrity. I, I'm really concerned. Anyway, they're my thoughts. Thank you for your time, Mark. Ross, uh, would you have any comments about about how we do we actually measure um, environmental flows well enough? No, we don't because um, whether it's, um, I think both New South Wales government and um, especially the Murray-Darling Basin Authority can take blame on this. Um, environmental flows, where are they going though? I mean, how many years has the Menindee Lakes had dramas, been empty, fish kills, um, countless times the triple bottom line effect been totally ignored whereby river communities like Wilcannia, Menindee, Perncarry have had to bring in through donations bottled water to drink, bulk water to shower and for their animals. So then you look at the environment side of it on the environmental water, well, Jesus, the, the, the Darling River, Menindee Lakes, Anna Branch is all but dead. The Anna Branch is an absolute disgrace, talking to a few of the graziers that live there, sending photos back. The lakes of the Anna Branch haven't had water 10, 15 years. That was once a habitat, nearly all the cockatoos, gorillas and all that in the area, in the, in the basin, disappeared. I mean, I get very frustrated when we hear of water for the environment, because out this way, it certainly is not going to our environment. Um, the New South Wales government in regard to water management, I would love to see them stand up more to the Murray Darling Basin Authority, who, after many talks with Philip Glide and Andrew Reynolds, know very little on the Darling and the Mindy Lake system and care even less. So for them to take the amount of water they do as 14, 15, and again in 17 is really outlandish. Uh, they leave the 480 in the system. The 480, a lot of that is water that's kept in Cordilla, which can't be accessed by the local community. So instead of being 480, we're left with maybe 200 gigs. So there's so much environmentally, economically that needs. We'd love to see the New South Wales government, you know, modify their policies, but also stand up for us when it comes to the murray Darlin Basin Plan. Okay. Thank you. I'm, con I'm conscious that we've gone into uh, yeah. government's time Thank quite significantly. So. Yes, we have. Um, who's got these questions for the government? This is Mr. Faraway again? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just following on, gentlemen, from some of the questioning that's been asked, and, and um, probably to you first, Ross, um, from the previous question around the Darling Anna branch. Like, do you have anything, any other views on the on whether the environmental water holders should direct the living 
Murray Water arriving from the north down the Darling Anna branch, like you were just touching on a, a moment ago. So that's something that you would see as being constructive? Well, really, if, we, if, if, if our system's maintained, especially the two lower lakes of Lake Menindi and Lake Kondilla. Now, when you talk to Mellon Cooper and people like that, Professor, you talk to the Barkindji people, those two lakes are the lakes that are the heart and soul of this system, which you include, you can include the Lower Darling and the Anna Branch in that. Um, they're the ones that the DPI in their modelling has said are not needed. It's the upper lakes that they were going to uh, concentrate on. That's why the Benindi Lakes project, part of the reason it fell apart. The Barkindji people called the lower lakes, which the um, DPI wanted to keep, as women's lakes. Take that as good or bad, but uh, that's what they call them. Um, the entire ecosystem stems from the two bigger lakes, Menindi and Corndilla. Now, there's access to the Darling River from Menindi Lake. The water that's in Corndilla now, the Tandow of shut shop, can only go down the Anna Branch. So if these lakes are maintained, there's no need to call on extra water from the north for the Anna Branch. It can go out of Corndilla. Corndilla holds well in excess of 600 gigalitres. Now it's full. Tandow don't need it. They don't use it. They've sold off. Unless they reverse engineering on what's called the Penelco Channel, which was put in by Tandow years ago to pump water from the Lower Darling through to Tandow for their cotton. But So that's been all closed up because it never really kicked off. Now, if they reversed engineering of that, Tandow, uh, Corn Diller can also supply flows down the Lower Darling. So you could have flows from Corn Diller going to the Lower Darling as well as the Anna Branch, in turn um, gets into the Murray. You're not having to call on water up north because there's 600 gigs that are going to sit in Corn Diller. Um, that's not counting when you get into these two lakes being the major um, maturing for the for the um, golden perch, etc. Um, so better manage, management by listening to the people that understand that live in the area, I think, save not only the Murray Darling Basin Authority but also the New South Wales government and the Northern Irrigators. Hell of a lot of worries. It'll save so much because you've got the storage here. Utilise it when floods are about. So um, I suppose just following uh, that theme, um, Ross, and, and to the other witnesses. Um, so it's obviously sending it down the Anna Branch it, it is one option that we're, we're exploring. But it, we've got two thousand megs sitting in like in Menindi Lakes. I think at capacity by next month. Um, I suppose what I'm interested to hear from you, and you're sort of sort of touching on it, is that how if we see another record-breaking drought or another three years of low flows and, and, and drought, how do we how do we make the water last better? Uh, and I know I think I read somewhere, Mr. McBride, that you've said that it could or should last like eight years. As long as it's managed effectively. I mean, the, sorry if I speak, sir, um, Mr. Barraway. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the Menindee Lakes evaporate. It's called nature. And those in the Northern Basin have said, oh, look, it evaporates, so let's get rid of it. Let's send it down the rivers as quickly as we can. Evaporation is part of the rain cycle. And when the Menindee Lakes are full, a bit like when Lake Eyre is full, traditionally we get a lot more rainfall in our area. So it's just part of nature. So it's allowing slow flows coming down. So as you say, we don't know to advance what's going to happen. We know that the continent's getting drier. So I guess that means less, more controlled flows out of the Menindee Lakes, but equally so, more importantly, when small flows are coming down through the system, that they're embargoed to make sure they do get through the system. And that's critically important. It's not the focus of how long can the Menindee Lakes last. They 
been there 30 million odd years, they can last forever as long as they get flows from the river system. And it's not just one river, just please remember there's seven tributaries that form into the, the Darling Barker and all those need to be investigated and monitored and levels of water taken into consideration. So I guess, Mr Faraway, that's where I'd come from, that slow controlled releases. Um, remember, while it's good that the Menini Lakes are full, Equally so, we should have floods over our floodplains. That's why they're called floodplains. Um, literally, we should, at Talano, we should have 20,000 acres under about four foot of water at the moment. That would be what would normally be the case with the amount of water that was coming down through the system. Manita Lakes would be full, but flush would have come through. And species like um, um, yabbies dig themselves in dry periods underground to about five feet and then if it stays dry for about six or seven years, they go down about another two feet. They're an amazing creature, but I've learnt all this from the Barkindji, but our riverbanks now, or the floodplains have been dry for 10 years. So we could have watched another billion yabbies die, species die out, and we just don't see it. So look, the floodplains need flooding just as much as the rivers need river, you know, water. Uh, the Barkindji, again, I'm not taking them out of context, but speaking to elders over time, the rivers are the veins through your system, but the lungs are the floodplains. And unless the floodplains get enough water, they bring food back into the river and allow the environment to survive and thrive, which is critically important. Hopefully that answers the question, Mr. Faraway. No, no, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. McBride. Just, just moving on because of limited time, a question that I did want to ask, um, obviously we've heard about the concern about where the gauges should be placed and what sort of data should be collected. I suppose I'll ask all three of you, um, do you have any thoughts around, and we touched on it before, but I just wanted to see if there were any more thoughts on where those locations should be specifically. My go, why don't we go you first, Mr. Laidra, then you, Mr. Smith. Sure. Um, gauges should be at uh, destinations. I mean, they, you hear there's X amount of water entering Menindee Lakes. There's no gauges at the top of Wetherill. So what we're knowing is what's coming down from Burke and then on wherever the next one is, Louth, maybe I think there's gauges at Wilcana. But we do not know exactly because there's no gauges how much is entering Menindee Lakes. Um, yeah, there's... Yeah, it's it's so hand-picked, random. Um, people out here kind of look through it and say, well, you know, none of this is all fair dinkum because even down to the placement of gauges, you know, it's uh, not in the right places. Not, they're, not, uh, they're not expressing the correct argument. Mr Smith? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Farrowway, for the question. Yeah, and, and Ross is correct that the, the, the last gauge uh, before the water gets to an Indy is at Wilcania. So all the transmission losses and any water loss from Wilcania, um, the year 32 is taken into account of the evaporation figure in Menindee Lakes, which is probably skews the result there somewhat. Also, um, you know, with gauges down along the branch, there's no, uh, I don't think there's any, any real gauges along that way. And, and that's, that's why consumptive water to South Australia can't go down the branch. Um, and if that option is ruled out, it must go down the Darling because there are no gauges along the Annabrand system. Well, if the Annabrand system had some gauges on it, then consumptive water could be sent down, um, either piggybacked onto environmental water or, or environmental water put through first to, to take up the slack. Um, thing, things like that that, are, that I guess are omitted. And, I, and, I, and I'm, yeah, I know there's, there's, there's gauges here and there further north along the system, but whether would more of those gauges picking up flow rates from one from one valley to the next and from one um, from one location to the next so we can i guess work out with a little bit more accuracy of of what sort of water is coming down i mean that some, some of these flows that we've got through the system this time we're getting feedback from new south wales water that there's that there's uh yeah and in the initial stages that there might be 50 60 gigalitres coming and it turned out to be 1100. i mean that's that's a good guess, but I mean, it's, it's way out of the ballpark. And, and you, you know, you've probably got some old bloke sitting on the front of the Tilpa pub that can give you a better, a better indication of what's going on <laughs> than, what, than what their gauges are doing. And it's, 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 um, 
you know, it, it, there seems to be a major lack in, in actually um, working out what's in the system and what's what's usable, and that, and that puts that puts everyone at a disadvantage. It puts the irrigators at a disadvantage, and it puts the guys at the end of the system like us at a complete disadvantage because we hear that there's allocation being given in the north, and we still dry as a bone. We don't know what's coming. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a lot right. of heat in the jobs. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to be quiet there. Sorry. No, that, that's okay. I've only got less than two minutes. So, so an important question that I wanted to pose to you three gentlemen that I did pose to some of the, the, the um, Professor Kingsford and others earlier in earlier sessions that you may have heard is that would you agree as, as stakeholders um, involved around the Manili Lakes area, would you agree with um, the Central Darling uh, Council that the uh, South Western Water Users Association, Graham McCrabb and other Manindi locals when they state that the policy around the 640, 480 gig a litre rule has not delivered good outcomes for the lower Darling communities through its management by the MDBA? I just wanted to pose that question because I think it is most relevant um, to the three groups you're representing today. I might just yeah, go to Mr. I'll, McBride I'll, I'll first. Just, yeah. Sorry, just to, just to order this in some way. Mr. McBride first, then Mr. Smith and Mr. Ledger. Thank you very much, DK. Uh, catastrophic. Um, as I said, the Manini Lakes have been treated so shabbily like it's just an overflow or just a holding facility for other uh, river systems. Um, it's, it's really the heart. It's four times bigger than Sydney Harbour. It's an amazing um, natural structure in the middle of nowhere and, and the murray Darling Basin Authority has absolutely crucified it. I remember about a year ago, last little point, I, I was down at Wentworth and uh, after the fish kills and I spoke to Philip Glyde and I said, Philip, in the history of the planet, you could have killed more fish than any other human being alive. What are you going to tell your grandchild when you walk up, when he and you walk up the Darling Barker? What, do you, what can you say to this? And he just said, I don't care. Um, it really, we haven't had people who care. And I really do think until we get people with integrity at the heart of the Murray Darling Basin Authority, you have to remember Mary Ann Slattery was there, Bill Johnson were there, but they saw what was coming and, and they dealt with integrity and good people got pushed out. And it's like science, a lot of good people got pushed out of government because they spoke the truth. And uh, it's critically important going forward that we have people who can speak the truth honestly and not get crucified for it. Thanks. Mr Smith, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the rules have been quite devastating to me. The, the, the 64480, the 480 left him in, he needs to be active storage water. That, that part of the operation needs to change to give, to give some surety for the lower, um, for the lower darling. It needs to be 480, 480 of accessible, 480 gigs of accessible water. And further to Mr. McBride's comments there, um, I asked Mr. McBride in Man India after the, again after the fish kills what they would do differently next time, and his response to me was nothing. Uh, he's playing within the rules that are set by the by the MDBA and by the basin plan, and those rules have not changed. So stay tuned, there's more to come. Okay, and Mr. Ledra, did you have something on this as well just before we break? Yeah, I agree with exactly what uh, Rob and Terry said. Um, as I said earlier, the 480 limit, where it goes back to New South Wales control, there's not all active water. There's so much of it left in Cornbilla that could be accessed. Um, I'd like to know where the 64480 will come from. I'd like to know whose hat it was pulled out of, because there's very little science if you if you try to do a bit of research on the 480 figure. Very little science. So that, yeah, we, we think it should be thrown out the door. The whole lot, and but as Terry and, and Rob said, with a bloke like uh, Philip Bide running the show at a meeting, we said to him, "You keep on saying that the plan's working. You've just travelled up along the river. What you saw is it working?" He said, "You'd have to say no." All right. So what what would you do to change things to improve it? He said, "I don't know." When do you think we might see uh, efforts made to change it by the Murray Darling Basin Authority? He said, oh, that might be 10 years away. So this is what, then you get the executive director of Rivers, Andrew Reynolds, that's been out here on a lot of occasions, and we've taken him with the Barkindji to Morton Booker to show the 45,000 year old sites. I mean, I might as well talk to a blank page. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Ledra. I will just uh, say that um, we have uh, extended two invitations now for the MDBA to appear 
before this inquiry um, and those invitations have been refused. Um, but uh, thank you very much for appearing before this inquiry. I'm not sure if you took any questions on notice, but if you did, the Secretariat will get in touch with you in relation to that. So thanks very much for all the work you do. I'm very glad there's some water in your part of the world at the moment. Must, uh, must be a wonderful thing. And hopefully we can all get out there again at uh, some stage <laughs> to um, say hi and to see it for ourselves. Yeah. Thank you all so very much. much indeed. Thank, Thank you so you. much. The committee much will now break for lunch. The live stream will continue, but we are going to tune out until 1.35. We formally ticked over to 1.35. So we'll start the, the this session by swearing you in. We'll start with you, Mr Rigney. If you can state your name and position title, please, and swear either an oath or an aff affirmation, which I understand you have the words for. Yes, thank you, Kate. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grant Rigney. I'm the current chairperson of the Murray Lower Darling River Indigenous Nations, and I'd like to pay my respects to all countries that peoples are sitting on today and to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, just from the affirmation, I, I solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now and about and about to be given shall be, should be sorry, by me, shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, we will go to Ms. Virginia Robinson first. Um, yes, my name is Virginia Robinson. I am a Gamilaroi woman and I am secretary of the Dariwa Elders Group. Um, my affirmation is I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. And to you, Ms. Wendy Spencer. Thank you. My name's Wendy Spencer. I'm the project manager of the Dariwa Elders Group. Don't know whether you can hear me with my mask on. Yeah, we can. Oh, good. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Shall we start with some short opening statements? Mr. Rigney, do you have one for the committee? Yes, I do, um, Kate. Um, and I'll forward this on to the New South Wales Parliament through Lauren Evans a bit later on. Um, I'm here today to amplify the voices and concerns of many thousands of First Nations peoples across the southern part of the Murray Darling Basin regarding the impacts of floodplain harvesting on our waterways. I'm humbled today to represent the members membership of the Murray Lower Darling River Indigenous Nations, but I also speak as a citizen of the Nutanjiri Nation, whose country includes the Kurong, Lower Lakes, and the Murray Mouth of South Australia. My comments today and the substance of the submission we have provided to this inquiry are not focused on the complexities and technicalities of colonial water law, which is an imposition on our water landscapes. I wish to speak to a higher principles of caring for country of the reciprocal responsibilities of all people living in an interconnected system, of our ethical obligations to our Nazis, our totem animals and birds, and of natural justice. According to those principles, which our people hold sacred, large-scale floodplain harvesting, as we see across the part of New South Wales, is an appalling and irresponsible practice. Our organisation has a vision which is for healthy waters and thriving river countries sustained by empowered and connected First Nations people. We want to see all of our rivers and country connected from the mountains across the floodplains into the sea. Floodplain harvesting is contrary to the First Peoples principles and practices of caring for country. By manipulating our water landscapes through vast structures and capturing the very life force of the floods and rainfall events that nourish our dynamic river systems, Floodplain harvesting inflicts harm on all communities downstream, particularly in times of extreme weather. Floodplain harvesting denies our rivers the replenishment that they need. I know that the First Nations who, since time immemorial, have acted as custodians of the Macquarie, the Lachlan, the Murrumbidgee, the Barker and the Murray River are shocked by the size and impact of floodplain, of floodplain diversions. There have been no proper assessments of our downstream impacts of current water take under floodplain harvesting. Our cultural heartlands such as the Macquarie Marshes, the Medindi Lakes and the Lower Barker, and indeed the whole interconnected Murray system is subject to impacts from this inequitable extraction. 
When I stand on my country, I watch dredging machinery work 24-7 to keep the mouth open to the greatest river system of the River Murray to the sea. I have watched our country suffer as a result of the poor management of upstream landscapes. I implore this committee to heed to the voices of First Nations and rule out entrenching unsustainable floodplain harvesting for the benefit of a few, but to the detriment of many downstream communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rigney. Um, Ms. Robinson or Ms. Spencer, would either of you like to make a short opening statement? And can I just, just before you do begin, because you are both in the same room, if you could, for the duration of this session, state your name each time you uh, before you speak, so Hansard knows who is speaking. Thank you. Um, Virginia Robinson. Today, I have the honour of speaking on behalf of our members who are Aboriginal, people living in Walgett over the age of 60. I remember our founding chairperson, Mr. George Rose, OAM, and his views on the destruction of the rivers and groundwaters around us and will try to continue his hard work today walking his footsteps, if you like, and those of other elders who founded this organisation. The Derriwa Elders Group is a community-controlled, incorporated association in Walgett. After many years of trying to be heard by government, we have reached out to the University of New South Wales and the private sector so that we can be resourced in our work gather the evidence to persuade and influence government of the solutions and approaches we see are needed in our community. We want to share, when we can, our learnings with other communities too. But we want to share where we can and where we don't seek to work regionally, we work deeply and locally, holistically, to achieve outcomes for our community. Um, we will join together in alliances with others when we see that this will give us strength or amplify our voices. After 20 years of operating as an organisation, we have built our confidence and experience. This is my first time speaking at a hearing, but I feel a strong duty to do so today. As you know from our submission, is this one? We are totally against floodplain harvesting because it takes water away from the soil, the rivers, groundwaters, warrenbills, and therefore from our community and from the biodiversity we live within. We live on a floodplain. We think it is unjust that the New South Wales government is trying to legislate and legalise floodplain harvesting, which would be taking away so much water from the system and it will gift a small handful of companies and people with huge million dollar assets while our community gets no water and continues to live in poverty. We try not to get confused with all the jargon, as we have found that a lot of it is used by lying bullies to cover up what they are really doing, and that is giving assets to their mates and taking away again from us. We will not stand by and watch without a fight. I thank the committee for providing this opportunity for us to reach out to voters of New South Wales and when I talk about lying bullies, I say dishonesty and lies breed too much confusion, which opens the floodgates for more confusion and more lies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson, for that opening statement. Um, we will go straight to questions because of limited time. We go to questions from the opposition. Is that you, Penny? Do you, yeah, Ms. Penny Sharp. Thank you. Thank you very much for 
coming before the committee today. Um, and thank you for your submissions, which are extremely powerful in terms of what caring for country means and the fact that the overlaid water rules that we've put a place um, across New South Wales are really in direct conflict with trying to do what you um, want us to do and what you have, what you and, and your families and your peoples have been doing for a very long time. My question, my first question is um, really just to get a bit of a handle on how much contact and discussion you actually have with the water authorities um, generally in relation to um, water. Um, obviously, there's the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, but I'm particularly obviously interested in anything that you've been doing with Water New South Wales in relation to this you know, regulation that has been disallowed by the parliament. Um, if I could. Uh, uh, from uh, the murray Lower darling River Indigenous Nations, we, we've had um, a fair bit of dialogue with um, DPI at the statewide level. Um, we have had a presentation to our um, executive board on the modelling um, around the flood plan harvesting. Um, our board had some major concerns around the modelling itself. Um, one of the key questions that was asked from our board was, uh, where was the climate adaptation processes incorporated into the modelling? Uh, we were told categorically that they hadn't done that and they weren't looking to do that. Um, the modelling around climate adaptation was going to be uh, processed through the regional water strategies, uh, which, which we found was a, um, a bit of a difficult process considering that they hadn't incorporated into the floodplain harvesting itself. Um, and how that might equate down the track um, if they were going to do that process through the regional water strategies themselves and how would that actually feed back into the floodplain harvesting itself. Um, so we, we, we found some really indiscrepancies in that space. One of the other things that um, we had very much, con very high concerns about was the, um, the metering of water coming over bank could be measured and uh, we accepted that that could be measured coming over bank, but what goes across the floodplain cannot be measured in any capacity from DPI, from what they fed um, to our confederation itself. So we don't know the amount of water that goes out across the floodplain, but we did, they categorically did say to us that they can measure the amount of water that goes back in system. So there's the question then became, well, how does that affect the cap? of the SDL. Now, I understand that there is a cap that was um, put in place um, in New South Wales, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was 1994 from what my understanding is. Um, how does that equate from that capping to the cap that's been processed in through the Murray-Darling Basin Plan on their modelling around the estimated sustainable limit of take? Now, th there is no really concise answer around that from my understanding at this moment in time. But from what we envisage, that it would be less water coming downstream. So we see that as a, a major issue on communities downstream um, in not having the sufficient amount of water to run through country, because we have always had the key principle that water is interconnected with the landscape and cannot be compartmentalized. And so we have a major issue around that space, um, particularly of the the breakup and the disconnection of an interconnected river system running from the top of the of the um, of New South of, of sorry of Queensland right down through to the Murray mouth. So we've had some initial dealings in that space. Um, we've asked for um, you know, ongoing dialogue with um, DPI in that area, um, but we certainly have had some initial engagements with DPI around the regional water strategies as a part of the basin plan compliances. And um, I can tell you categorically from Mildred's perspective, it was not good in any facet whatsoever. And I think that's reflected in some of the plans being retracted by New South Wales government through um, Minister Pavey. Um, and there's still an ongoing issue around that space. We haven't heard any dialogue or whether all plans will be retracted or not at this present moment in time. I'm, I'm absolutely positive that um, Minister Pavey has been talking to Minister Pitt in the background about what's going to be processed from the water resource plans. And it's not just from the chapter 10, part 14 of the Indigenous Values and Uses. 
Um, there are some areas around the basin planning that, that New South Wales didn't even get to the baseline um, of the compliances under the Murray-Darling Basin Authority itself. So there are some major, major concerns in that space, and I find it pretty um, disappointing and, and very you know, upset in a lot of ways that the New South Wales government, particularly on the water resource planning, has had multitudes of years to get this done and to get it correct. They were resourced significant amount of money through the intergovernmental agreements that were put in place back in 2012. Um, I'm, I'm understanding it was about $66 million to get those water resource plans processed in order. Um, the New South Wales government, honestly, just sat on their hands for three to four years and done nothing in this area. Um, I shouldn't say nothing. There's more like some things being done in the background that wasn't privy to myself or, or to our confederation. Um, but at the end of the day, it came push to shove and um, the compliances to get those water resource plans were very short time frames. And uh, what had happened from there is that uh, New South Wales government went out and actually put in um, independent consultants um, and went out to the First Nation groups. Um, they were not culturally appropriate. They didn't ask the right questions. Um, nothing was spoken about native title to some of our groups about what their uh, federal um, governments had handed down where they had rights to water as common law rights. Those types of things were not processed through into that water planning. And right across the whole of the basin itself, um, I've been involved in nearly every one of those assessments criteria within the states, uh, Victoria, South Australia and the ACT for that fact. New South Wales didn't even get close to a, a rateable process on any of their water resource plans. Thank you, Mr. Rigney. Um, uh, Ms. Robinson, did you want to add anything to that in terms of the experience where you are? Ms. has spoken about. We're very satisfied with that. We have spoken to authorities, but we're a bit sick of it. They don't listen to us anyway. Thank you. Um, that's not good to hear. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically around um, what uh, the issue of cultural flow and how that has been accounted for. Um, we know, for example, that the Barkindji have it as part of their native title rights, but there's never really been any allocation. I'm just wondering what your experience with this has been. Oh, I was fortunate enough to sit on the National Cultural Flows Research Team for a period of five to six years. Um, it, it was uh, a pretty robust research we've done in this space. It was pretty groundbreaking um, internationally, not just within Australia. Uh, we come up with a model we think is a, an applicable tool, and that's what it really is. It's a tool that can be utilised for nation groups to try to um, underpin their aspirations and their ideologies of what cultural water is. Cultural water is not environmental water. They are two separate things altogether. Um, they do have synergies, there is no doubt about that, but they are two separate things. One is about ownership of water and having the autonomy to actually control that water at the same time with no caveances attached to it. We've had issues already um, in uh, particular states where the cultural flows research was supported by the basin states and the, and the ACT at the same time, but nothing really has been underpinned into a policy or any type of bill for legislative reform in those areas around cultural water. So we, we're still pushing the proverbial uphill um, at this present moment in time, and we're still awaiting on Keith Pitt um, to release the $40 million that has been promised um, in bipartisan support from all parties, and he's still sitting on it at this present moment, and we've been trying very, very hard to get some answers to come out of the federal minister's office. Um, but from the New South Wales perspective, um, there is really nothing that has been done in New South Wales around cultural water. There are cultural licences that are um, available for individuals up, up to 10 megalitres of water, but I have no idea of how many individuals have actually tapped into that because there are so many cavencies attached to it at the same time. There is no equitable process in that area and there is no equilibrium 
at all from a First Nations perspective in that water ownership. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Ms. Robinson? Um, the floodplains are a complex system of rivers and creeks, lakes, warrambles, groundwaters, and rich black soil. Rivers are separate from the floodplain. They are one element of it. Water in the land is vital for our daily life, for our food, drinking water, and the deep history of the community in stories. No one should take more than they need. This excludes all external parties, such as water traders and speculators. Darriwa Elders Group supports the objects and principles of the New South Wales Water Management Act 2000 and the Commonwealth Water Act 2007 and is horrified to witness daily that they are being ignored. How can we think otherwise? We see what we see with our own eyes and we taste the salty water from the groundwater. We are forced to drink when the rivers are dry. Our nutrition suffers because we have lost our regular fish and river foods and our well-being suffers and we can no longer revive our spirits down on the riverbank. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's Ro Jackson here. I might just ask um, a quick question before the opposition time expires. Thank you so much for coming along. I wanted to ask about the impact of the damage that's caused on native wildlife um, when river flow is interrupted and environmental degradation occurs. And, you know, um, uh, there was the sort of mention of the importance of native wildlife in terms of the cultural significance to Indigenous people. I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on how important it is to have flowing rivers that support native wildlife. Thank you. That's important to us because our native animals, a lot of them, the animals and plants, are our totems. We call them meat, our dinga and it determines who we are, our marriage systems, who we can marry and who we don't, and other aspects of our culture. We see bird habitats, gilar habitats destroyed because there's no water. Our totem animals are no longer around. I don't know where they've gone. Are they dead, died from lack of water and, you know, the river supplied them with the food. We have no fish anymore. We can't go fishing. Fishing was a, a very important part of our daily lives. The river was like our heart, if you like, the heart of our country. Our country is our heart, but the river more so. So it certainly impacted our totemic system, which is a vital part of our kinship system. To me, it's almost like a third wave of destruction and we are just further and further being colonised in, in our country. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with Aldi there. There. Um, there are major impacts in spaces around native wildlife in these areas. The water is becoming scarcer. Um, the river systems are dropping down. Our animals, are, are, um, fish and birds and um, reptiles are exactly like us as human beings. We require water to sustain ourselves they require water to sustain themselves as well. But with the lack of flow that's coming down the system, animals are having to move further away from their natural habitats to find those water sources. They need to go you know, across those um, Western processes of bringing roads into spaces for us to travel to get through parts of country. They have to cross those areas. There are major impacts and kills in those spaces at the same time. Um, the groundwater tables are dropping in so many areas it's not funny because of the over extraction of groundwater at the same time and i, I would um, dare to say that mining has a major impact in that space also in those areas of those groundwater tables being um, you know been dropping down to a significant rate itself uh, right down to the artesian basin to the aquifers which replenish the surface water again it's all interconnected and you know we have the a dire um, process at the moment going on with so many species becoming extinct that 
um, an exacerbated rate right across the world, but particularly in this country, which is the driest continent in the world. So it does have major impacts on those food sources have sustained our people since time immemorial and they're not being able to practice their traditional cultures because those food sources have been extracted from there because of the lack of water at the end of the day. So there's a real disconnect in that space that we need to certainly address. But and it's not just the native um, wildlife, it's the fish as well. It's the water quality that's been coming down the system that's picking up black water events We've seen the native fish kills that happened within the Barker. Um, and we're not talking just a million or two, we're talking up to five, six million fish that have passed away in that area itself. Another major supplement for First Nations peoples and society in general. So it does have major, major impacts right across the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin. Mr. Ridney, uh, thank you. That's some um, questions from the opposition. Um, we'll go to questions from the crossbench. So, Mr. Rigney, do you know how much water exactly has been allocated for cultural flows as part of the um, Aboriginal cultural water access licenses in New South Wales? Um, I could not categorically tell you that, uh, Kate. Um, I would say you'd be very, very lucky. There was a very good research paper that was brought out by Sue Jackson and Lana Hartwick, um, with, particularly within New South Wales, of water ownership of uh, First Nations people, and it was at 0.02%. So I think that might be um, a suffice answer to your question. Yeah, so I think it is uh, it, um, it is down at that minuscule, almost zero um, level. The Environmental Defenders Office confirmed that yesterday as well. So this is this is a question to to both of you actually. The government, as you know, is wanting to hand out hundreds of potentially hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars worth of entitlements to irrigators that have never had to pay for that water, yet, as you've just confirmed, we've heard that it's 0.2 or 0.02 per cent of all available surface water in New South Wales in the basin has been given to Aboriginal people. What do you want to say to the government about its priorities in relation to the way it's managing water? And I'll start with you, maybe Ms Robinson. Um. Sorry, can you ask me the question again? Sorry. Basically, when you hear that the government is about to hand out or this process of floodplain harvesting licensing is going to give hundreds of millions of dollars worth of entitlements to irrigators, that is essentially free water to irrigators, and that Aboriginal nations have been given less than 0.2% or 0.02% of cultural flows of water in the basin, how does it make you feel? What would you like to tell the government about how that makes you feel? Um, if I could, Aunt, if, if you would, if, if, yeah. if I could answer that first, and maybe only might want to lead on to um, or come on from my lead in this area, but um, I don't. I think you really want to hear what I have to say. Is I, I know I've got parliamentary privileges, but I don't think the language coming out of my mouth would be um, very pleasant. Um, I, I'm really, really angry about it, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I find it really unfathomable of governments of the day, or where is their human element? Where is their humanity gone in, in our race and our society in totality? It's not just about gross domestic product. It's not about economics. It's about sustainability of us as a human race of people. We're only here for a nanosecond in time when we look at the longevity of this whole landscape. But what can we do to underpin, to set some foundational platforms where there is going to be equity across the board for all peoples? So we have given options from Mildred's perspective and suggestions to DPI, um, and not just DPI, but this is collectively across the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin states. When we talk about 
processes and programs and projects around the sustainable diversion limit adjustment mechanisms, for instance. It's a $1.8 billion program. There is not one drop of water as an offset from those water savings to First Nations peoples at all. Everything will go to the 605 downwater that they're trying to actually appease so they don't have to do water buyback from irrigators, farmers, cotton, rice, citrus, almonds, whatever it may be. But there is never, ever offset of water savings dedicated for First Nation groups from a state perspective or from a federal perspective for that matter. So there are ways to go about it, but it's just finding some equity in that area. But it's also caring for your fellow human and your neighbour and your downstream communities at the same time. We say things like, oh, it's the Aussie way. What the hell does that mean? What does that really mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's about people wanting to put what they can in their pockets to make them feel comfortable about their livelihoods and their way of life. It's not caring for your fellow human. It's about what you can get. Because when things are out of sight and out of mind, it doesn't directly affect. So how do we make it directly affect? They are the big questions that we've been trying to grapple with. And I think that we've got some of the answers, whether it's through our confederation at Mildren or within the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations or groups that even sit outside of our confederations. But collectively, we have been trying to get in at the door, to get our foot in the door. At the moment, our backs are against a wall. Sometimes they're actually inside the wall trying to get out to the back of the wall. So we're trying to actually come up with different objectives and different pathways that governments could undertake. But at this present moment, to tell you the truth, Kate, we have absolutely nothing whatsoever. We have hope and we are at the goodwill of government to do the right thing. Thank you. Ms Robinson, did you want to contribute something to that question? Well, it's okay if not. When, well, when the river was dry at Walgut for so long in 2018, 2019, we suspected that water was being taken illegally upstream from us. We actually saw storages filled, being filled, and we knew that something was wrong. We saw water on farms all around Walgut, Weewar, Narrabri, Moree, and Mungandai. And we just feel that New South Wales Depi water is putting irrigators before, or was putting irrigators before the needs of the river and the river people and its people. So we were not surprised to find the, the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption that the needs of irrigation were being put before the needs of everyone else. They take more than they need. As I said before, you only need to take what enough is enough for you. Leave some for other people. It's, it's unjust, it's unfair to do this, to take water this way. Thank you. And just to clarify before I go to Mr. Banaziak, you said at the beginning of that response then, was that were you saying when you when Walgut ran out of water, that is when was running out of water, that's when you saw those storages full? I just didn't get that first bit. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. My question time has expired. Mr. Mark Banaziak. Thank you, Chair. And um Thank you, uh, Virginia and Wendy, for joining us. And nice to see you again, albeit over over a computer screen. Um, just picking up on that that point you made, Virginia, about you saw storages full while Wild River was running dry. Um, did you contact DPI Water? Or did you contact NRA? And if you did, what was their response back to you? Can I answer that? Yeah, um, I'll just get Wendy to check for, on that for me, please. The yep, elders sure. Group, I do remember one occasion at least where the elders group wrote to the water minister saying, um, you know, the water is dry here at Goangra. I remember, you know, can you can you tell us why? And that was just upstream of Walgish. Um, and there have been meetings in Walgut uh, with DPIE 
Um, they've also been, the water minister's been here. Um, NRA was here when they first opened up. Um, we've actually made a report to NRA just in the last couple of days asking them to investigate uh, something. <laughs> so, um, yes, the group is reasonably active in um, seeking out information from agencies. And did you did you receive a response back from that the minister? I imagine that would have been um, the Honourable Noel Blair at the time. And and if so, could you perhaps table that response you received back from the minister? I'll have to um, I'll have to follow that up. Sure. No. And, and Virginia, not to touch on a, a clear sore point about saying that you were sick and tired of um, your dealings with the the, the department, but. Was was that frustration from uh, your group, uh, I guess, a product of being talked at rather than to, and I guess, you know, being talked to, but not actually doing enough listening? Yes, I, I, I felt that it was, um, wasn't even really consultation, um, which I don't agree with. I, I like negotiation between people, governments and people rather than consultation. But no, I didn't feel that. Thank you. Um, I might just quickly go over to um, Mr. Rigney while well, I've got a few minutes left. Um, in your submission, you, you you talked about having downstream flow targets underpinned by First Nations led research and assessment and cultural knowledge. Um, have you presented any of that First Nation led research to government or have they sought it out from you? Uh, yeah, the, the very first of the cultural flows research program and the methodology of that uh, cultural flows uh, research itself was actually undertaken by the Taddy Taddy group um, that sit within the New South Wales Victorian border. They've only just finalised their um, report um, that's actually just gone out live only in the last fortnight or so. Uh, so our deputy vice chair of the of the confederation, Brendan Kennedy, and his uh, his daughter uh, Melissa Kennedy. Uh, worked very, very cohesively with their nation group and getting that process up and running. And it has some really, very good, strong recommendations that came out of that research itself. But to, just a bit more on that question, though, um, also, Mark, is that we have been trying for many, many decades now uh, to underpin our cultural knowledges into the sciences platform. Um, cultural knowledge is a science in its own right. We have sustained this landscape you know, thousands and thousands of years before colonisation came into this space. So we know what our landscapes are actually saying to us. We know what our animals, our birds, our fish, our insects, if they're not in certain areas at certain times, there's impact on country. Science, Western science actually can prove that today too. So we've been trying to underpin these processes into water management planning as a part of uh, the processes around uh, whether it's a wetland management plan or whether it's a cultural heritage management plan pertaining to water, the water resource plans themselves that have been undertaken in the last you know, nearly nine years now right across the whole basin itself. So we've been trying to get these things underpinned in these spaces for a very long time, but we're slowly getting some change, but it's um, a couple of steps forward, then maybe five steps back, then a couple of steps forward again. So. We're getting there slowly but surely, and some some states are actually really undertaking a lot of this um, and and running with it very cohesively. And I would implore the New South Wales government to have a look at some of the initiatives that have been undertaken by Victoria at this present moment in time, because Lisa Neville, um, through her office and her government, they are uh, that they're really kicking ass, really. To tell you the truth, they are streaks ahead of the rest of the country when it comes to engagement with First Nations peoples. Perhaps on notice, um, would you be able to provide a copy of that report to the committee that we could have a look at included in our in our findings? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And just one final question. This you may need to take this on notice, and some of this may be um, included in the report. But you, your submission talks about dispossessed water rights. Um, if, if you had to set the government, I guess, a list of tasks or tangible outcomes. To address this dispossession, what like what would they be, and how would we know? Like how would we keep the government honest in terms of them actually achieving them? Oh, of course, that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question, really, isn't it? Well, that's 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 why I gave the option of going away and taking it on notice, perhaps. 
you, you might uh, need some time to think about that or I could um I think um, Mr. Uh, we have to be mindful that there has never been any historical Aboriginal water rights. Absolutely. So I don't know how we could have been dispossessed when there never was any yeah, entitlements. I, mean, I think that it's more so leading to dispossession since colonization really um of, of those water yeah. rights in this space. Uh we were the um the overseers and the custodians of our landscapes that we lived in. And it was about sharing. It was making sure that people had and no one went without. That's, that's right. That's why I say it's another wave of colonisation, another, you know, bow to the destruction of Aboriginal culture in this country. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, what, one of the damning things I think that's come out just of late is around the closing the gap target for inland waterways. It is um, an absolute disgrace um, that the federal government and even states to this proponent want to come up with a, a percentage or an amount of water within a one or two year period framework to give something to Scott Morrison to stand up at the federal government saying that we're on track for this target is an absolute crock. Um, we need to have robust research in this area I know that the peak bodies groups um, have been talking around a 3% um, water allocation across this, um, the federal government level at the national scale, but you would not find 3% of water in the Murray-Darling Basin in any aspect whatsoever, unless there was water buyback. Now we know that, that categorically, the federal government said that they will not do water buyback anymore, they are more so about appeasing the constituency um, in that space. And if you equate 3% from the Murray-Darling Basin and you reflect that across to something like the Fitzroy catchment in, in Western Australia, where they have 60% exclusive rights of native title and rights to water, they could be looking at 60% water, not 3%. It is unfathomable that you could actually come up with a target until we have the research that we require of human resources, but also monetary resources to do something in that space that would be an equitable outcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Rigney. We will now move to questions from the government. Mm. Mr. Ben Franklin. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And can I start by thanking all of you for being here today for your uh, submissions, for your deeply held um, positions on uh, this really, really important part of the debate. And I just wanted to thank you for the genuineness and passion you brought to um, this, this um, session today. I guess what I'd like to do is to start, and this is a question to all of you, um, to start by picking up on uh, a bit of the questioning from Mr. Banasiak, um, which is about sort of the historical rights. And I guess, can I pull back to a, um, a high level and ask what you think um, native title rights over water are, what you believe that, that they are and that they should be um, for us to consider? What's, what's the framework we should consider regarding native right, title rights over water? Uh, I'll start with you, Mr Rigney, if that's okay. Sure, thanks, Ben. Um, I think native title is the worst piece of legislation in this country. Mm. It is an absolute farce that me, as a sovereign person of my landscapes and a citizen of my nation need to prove to a colonial system of my connection to country. You prove to me who the hell you are and why you have the right to embed your laws over my people, which have been here for hundreds of thousands of years. It is an absolute farce. If we're talking about equity in this area, we need to be talking treaty. Treaty is the pathway. You look around the world, and particularly within the United States and within the, in Canada and even within New Zealand, treaty is the pathway that has given some equity, sustainability economically and health-wise for those peoples to sustain themselves. Why is Australia the only first world nation in the country that will not talk about treaty? What is this country afraid of? So okay, I don't think you. Native Title gives you water allocation because there is no landmark case in this country where Native Title has given water rights. It says that you have rights under common law. Whose common law? 
It's not my common law. I've had the right to that water forever. So I think we need to get things in a bit of perspective around that. Thanks, Mr. Rigney. I, I really appreciate that response. Um, Ms. Robinson, Ms. Spencer, would either of you like to add anything to that issue? You don't have to. If, if Mr. Rigney's made a pretty passionate um, statement, you, if you'd prefer not to, that's fine. Oh, as Mr. Rigney said, you know, it's water has been with us from time immemorial since Aboriginal people populated this country, this land. And it goes against our understanding that the rivers and our lives, that water can be taken this way. Our communities, our ancestors are part of these ecosystems, as Mr. Rigney says. So we find it hard to believe that this water can be taken from so many people and given to benefit just a few people, that is irrigators. We don't understand this continuing colonisation of our country of country, as we say. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just I don't, trying, oh, my apologies. I don't agree with native title. We have the Uluru statement to the heart, from the heart. You know, we want a voice in parliament, not native title. There has never been water, water entitlements or water rights under native title as it was passed. Understood. Thank you very much. I wasn't in any way trying to be disrespectful. I'm, I think, like all members of this committee, are trying to find, yeah, trying to find a way through for proper and genuine engagement with Indigenous communities. And so, on that, um, I believe that Lake Victoria has a cultural watering plan. Um, I wonder if, if either of you again would um, believe that perhaps we should be adopting a similar sort of plan for Menindi Lakes um, to perhaps better protect, you know, those sacred sites from inundation. Uh, again, we might start with Mr. Rigney. But that certainly could be a pathway. Um, I, I don't yeah. know the intricacies of those um, particular water plans or, or those cultural water um, allocations, if there is any such thing there, um, or is it just an oversight of that particular landscape? Um, I, I really couldn't elaborate on that, but you know, I, I think there certainly needs to be uh, looked at is the heritage impacts uh, of what's happening across the landscape and, and particularly with flood plan harvesting. Um, even if we do have a, you know, a private land owner, the, the whole of landscape is a heritage site. It's not just um, sticks and, and bones as, you know, as a lot of anthropologists and archaeologists like to talk about. There are sites that are watering sites, there are women's sites, there are men's areas, there are sites that, have, um, that hold song lines, there are sites that hold ceremony. Um, they're not known sites because uh, a lot of our people don't like to share this information because it's been plagiarised for forever since colonisation in these areas for other people's capitalistic gains and measures. So we're very careful about those particular types of things. But at the end of the day, there are compliances under heritage. But um, I, I assume within New South Wales that that comes under, under parks in New South Wales. Um, but how do they work uh, cohesively with DPI in these areas, particularly around you know, floodplain harvesting, as this inquiry is about, and, and yeah. what are the impacts on those areas, and have they actually done a stock take of what are the heritage sites that are registered on the register within those spaces for the floodplain harvesting, and what works and measures have been put in order to actually mitigate those um, those impacts on those sites? Thank you. That's, That's a very good point. Um, Yes, please. That's right, Mr. Rigney, because as I said, and I'll say it until I'm blue in the face, we live on a floodplain. All our Aboriginal cultural heritage is on the floodplain. So when that water is taken away illegally, it takes away our culture. And all the aspects of our culture, our stories, our song lines, particularly, run along with water. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Rigney, can I just go to you and your organisation? I apologise, I, I, I didn't know much about Mildred until um, until I obviously got your submission and so on. Can I just ask a couple of questions first? Do you, do you rep, does Mildred represent all the nations on the, uh, in New South Wales on the Murray and in the Lower Darling? Is, is that, are you that umbrella organisation? Uh, no, uh, we don't represent all nations in, the, in that okay. particular part of country. 
Uh, Mildren is a confederation of nation groups who are looking right. to have a one unified voice in that particular um, area around water reform as it is today. And, and that's not just compartmentalised to water. It's also about landscape. It's about our animals. It's about our plants and it's about the fish and so forth. So at the moment, we have 24 um, confederated nation groups from Dubbo in New South Wales right, right down to yep. the Murray Mouth. Some groups um, have chosen not to come under the confederation and, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, they are autonomous in their own right and they are sovereign in their own rights as well. But we just try to actually process things as a unified voice into these areas for groups that want to come together to do that particular type of constructive um, input into the Western structure. Understood. And of those 24 nations, how are their representatives um, appointed? Do they do they get elected or do they do they are they self nominate? Do they no, how are they appointed? They're, they're elected, Ben. They're elected by their nations. Uh, okay. We right. we prefer and we have um, put that out to our, our member nations as at the moment we prefer to have a gender balance in that area as well, because we do have a lot of women's sites and on country as well. Um, but uh, they, they are duly elected by their nations. Um, there is a formal process under our constitution that they must abide to, uh, to be member delegates of the, of the nation itself or, or nation delegates. Um, so they're, they're, and, and that gets put onto the register um, with our yep. nation group itself. Cool. Okie dokie. Um, so I guess going to the nub of my questioning, um, I'm, I'm told that you uh, that Mildred was involved with the process to some extent um, for the water resource plans in New South Wales mm. um, in terms of the consultation, co-designing and so on. I guess my question is, um, do you have any concerns about how that consultation occurred and are there any issues that you wanted to raise with this committee um, in, in terms of the consultation with the water resource plans in New South Wales? Well, yes, certainly. Um, we certainly didn't co-design. That, that is a fact, okay. right? <laughs> we, we certainly didn't co-design the processes of that. What we did uh, was uh, our confederation have an agreement with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority who are the ones who do the assessment criteria on all the water resource plans in New South Wales and collectively across the, the whole of the basin itself. But under Chapter 10, Part 14 of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which are the Indigenous Values and Uses, uh, we certainly did push back into the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that they didn't have the, the cultural right or the appropriateness to assess that particular chapter of the Basin Plan. So we have a contract agreement with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that we, as a confederation, in conjunction with nation groups that are impacted on those catchments of, of where those water resource plans are being undertaken, that we do the assessment criteria on Chapter 10, Part 14 of our New South Wales water resource plans. And that's the same for the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations, um, the NBAN group, which uh, Michael Anderson is the current chair of, where yep. they assess the plans up and in the Namoy and, and so forth. So we, I can tell you, and I alluded to this earlier, um, New South Wales uh, water resource plans had major gaps in them everywhere right across the board not just yeah, understand part 14 and um, we have certainly put up documentation back to um, the murray darling basin authority and and also um as an act of good faith and goodwill to DPI as well yep. on water resource plans of what needs to be re-looked at what needs to be rewritten and what was missed um what was around the target and what wasn't so that are you working with there. oh sorry yeah. Sorry, Ben, I was just Understood. going to say the Thanks. documentation's there and it's sitting there yeah. um, in DPI's office. Melinda Pavey's got it, uh, Vanessa O'Keefe, uh, these types of individual peoples within DPI, they, they have all this information. Thanks, Mr. Igney. That's very helpful. Um, and you were, are you, do you work on those issues with the New South Wales Aboriginal Water Advisory Coalition? No, we have chosen not to go down that pathway. We were, okay. we were directed by our nation groups in, in New South Wales that they didn't want us to undertake that. Um, because a lot of the programs are, are part really of the Sustainable Diversion Limit Adjustment Mechanism and those offsets are there for you know the other stakeholders, if you want to put it that way. Uh, so we, we've, we've categorically said, no, we are not going to be a part of those mechanisms. And we will um, sit down and have dialogue with New South Wales, um, DPI in particular, 
about a new pathway of partnership engagement and we're sick of that really we want a marriage we, we want something that's going to be a bit more secure in those areas there's, and we all there's some guarantee also, thank you ms robinson you you go now yes uh, yes i just wanted to clarify a very small point with mr rigney i note on the um agenda that the next session will include Gila Michael and Eckford. Is this the same oh, yeah. Michael Anderson? Or this is a different person? I'm not too sure, huh? To tell you the truth. Is he representing Northern Base and Aboriginal Nations? President of the ULEI People's Republic. That that'll be him. So he's going by two names, and that's hardly fair, and I don't agree with that. Thank you. Do, do I have any more time, Chair? Thank you. We've just, that has just been, no, I'm sorry, your time is up. Did you, we did just have that I last, just, clarifying that if you I needed. Understand. Can I just let Ms sure. Spencer um, and Ms yes. Robinson know, um, I did have some questions here. I'm so sorry, but I, I'll pop those on notice if that's okay and, and ask if you wouldn't mind um, perhaps uh, sending those answers back. But I do apologise about not being able so to get to you. Thanks, Ms Chair. Thank you. Thank you all very much for appearing and sorry that we haven't had more time to ask you questions. I'm sure we could have continued for um, for some time. So thank you for appearing. The Secretariat will get in touch with you in, in relation to any questions or notice you may have taken. So thank you once again. We will now have a short break and we will be back at 2, well, 2.30. I think we'll have a very short back break and be back in 5.00. We'll start at 2.35, considering it's 2.31. Thank you. In the meantime, I think we'll just kick off by swearing in our witnesses that we do have full connection with. So I might, what we need to do is hey, get out, how are you? Oh, hang on. You can hear us. Can we mute? Yeah, okay. Thank you, bye. Yeah, okay. So, Mr. Winters, we might start with you. If you could uh, please state your name and position, title, and swear either an oath or an affirmation. I believe the words have been emailed to you by the Secretariat. Yep, uh, my name's Leon Winters. Okay. I'm a ULEI man. Um, I'm a spokesman for the uh, people of the Miria Borough blood group of the ULEI. And I solely and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Mr. Michael Anderson Eckford, uh, if you could state your full name, position, title, and swear on an oath or an affirmation too, please. Well, um, I'm, I affirm, but my name is Michael um, Anderson, Giller, um, my Aboriginal name, and um, Eckford, I'm also known as Eckford. And I do um, affirm that I, the evidence I shall give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Now, how would you like us to refer to you today? Mr. Anderson, call, is it? Just call, or? Yeah, just call me Gilla. Sorry? Gilla. Okay. Gilla. All right, thank you. Sorry? That's fine. What was that? Okay. No, I All didn't. right, we'll, we'll, we'll keep... Keep on with the technology. I'll just see if Mr. Priestley can hear us now. No, I don't think we have. I don't think that they can hear us at this stage. We might have to get them to uh, dial in as well. So just checking. No, Mr. Priestley, they cannot hear me. All right. What we might do is proceed with short opening statements just to save time. We always have don't have enough time in these sessions. So can I check firstly um, for the ULAE people who is giving us short opening statement? Uh, both of you or uh, Mr. Winter or Giller? I have a I'll statement. Give... Okay. Yeah, Lee, All right. And we both have. Okay. All right. We'll go with you, um, Giller, first then. Yeah, um, all I'm doing is just um, um, supporting what we put in, in writing, but um, want to make some moral submissions in relation to the um, 
our ecosystems that um, have been ignored by Western society. And um, we've now confronted with this uh, floodplain harvesting, which will significantly impact on our on our ecosystems and our our clan and totem um, species around, the, um, and it will have significant impact on our people uh, culturally, spiritually, and emotionally. Thank you very much. We'll go to you, Mr. Winters. Yeah, I've just got written out a bit of a statement. My name's Leon Winters. I'm a, I'm a member of the ULEI Nation. I'm also a member of the blood group of the ULEI called the Miriabara, which belong to the Ligment and Floodplains ecosystem of the ULEI. The, the floodplains have always been sustained by the natural flooding that impacts our native fauna and flora, spreading seeds, delivering minerals, nutrients, and giving moisture to the ground. The plants, seeds, and medicines are still used by our people today, and we can and it can be used in the greater community in the future, but they are getting harder to source because of in, impacts such as the dwindling supply of water and cease of natural flooding. Due to changes like due to changes like capping of bores, damming, and creative div, div, um, diversions such as bunding levels, many of them were constructed illegally and should be removed. As there are too, uh, far too many channeling the overland waters away from the, the rivers and away from the wetland areas on the downward side of the mudding areas, levees. Our totemic and spiritual water and flora have been severely reduced due to the impact of blocking of natural water flows. My spirit and thoughts have been saddened and hurt at the site and the state of our country as we are connected as one. The disappearance of natural reeds, bulrushes and grasses from the rivers and waterways has impacted filtration of our water. I remember my brother was saved years ago because they could see him lying on the bottom of the riverbed. The water was clear. To, to see it in the stagnated and looking polluted makes us all sad and sick. The rain and other waters have always belonged to the First Nations people and our lands. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now I understand the NBAN representatives can now hear us. So we have there, is it Mr. Alfred Priestley? Is that correct? No. No, sorry, I've got the wrong, I've got the wrong schedule mm -hmm. in front of me. Sorry, I don't have it up. Can I? Just could you state your names, please? And Jason, sorry, Jason and Tanya, sorry, I was looking at the wrong schedule. If you could um, please state your, both of you for your your names and your position titles, and then both of you swear either an oath or an affirmation, the words of which I understand are in front of you. So we'll start with you, please, Mr. Ford. Yep, yeah, okay. Uh, Jason Ford is my name. I'm the operations manager with Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations. I've been there for the last 12 months. Uh, I'll just with the affirmation, I'll solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. And Ms Kirkgaard? Yeah, my name's Tanya Kirkgaard. I am the current Acting Executive Officer for Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations. I've been acting in the role for the past 12 months. Um, my affirmation, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Now, would you do you have a short opening statement to make as well? Um, nothing that I actually prepared, but I would like to state that uh, we've been contracted and been involved with New South Wales DPI around uh, delivering floodplain harvesting workshops with First Nations in the five valleys in the Northern Basin. Um, three of those valleys have been completed. Um, and that work will be continuing under a, a deed of variation to our contract when um, time permits with COVID and whatnot. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go to questions from the opposition. Mr. McVeach. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, my question is to, uh, to each of the groups, but essentially I just wanted to get an understanding of uh, whether or not you feel uh, First Nations rights and interests have actually been adequately considered in the development of the floodplain harvesting proposal from the government. 
Maybe we can start with uh, Mr. Winters, Chair. I'd rather throw that question to uh, Michael, if he's around. Okay. Are you there, Gila? Can we hear you? You might. Can you hear us? I think we might have just lost him, actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. That's a good start. <laughs> the tree energy is gone. <laughs> yes. Look, can someone else lead off them with the answer while we get Gila back? Yeah, could I, could I just like respond to that just from my perspective as the operations manager? But first, I'd like to just uh, pay my respects to elders past and present and the emerging leaders and and uh, pay my respects to the people of the lands that I'm meeting on, which are the, of uh, shared country to a number of different tribes up in Queensland, because um, I'm in Toowoomba. Um, but look, just in, res just in response to rights and interests, that's really around native title. Um, from from my understanding, rights and interests go back to the native title groups. And I think in fairness to New South Wales with the floodplain harvesting stuff, they have met with uh, some of the native title groups um, through, through their agency and then they deal with different agencies. There's not many PBC groups within New South Wales at this stage. Um, so the rights and interests, uh, and I'm actually, a, you know, to outside uh, my profession working with NBA, and I'm also a delegate for the Nampa Nyimba Whale Wan Wongai uh, native title applicant group. And I've been part of that for the last seven years. And rights and interests are, have been a, it's, that's a tricky question for us guys, because I've, we've put it back to the state. We're dealing with guys that don't really know uh, the individual nation's uh, rights and interest, because within the different nation groups, there's different rights and interests. There are similarities, but there are, there are definitely are, um, there's a diverse range of rights and interests. So to get that, uh, to, to answer the question around rights and interests, that's a bit of a grey area for us. I think we've touched on it, and I think in good faith, New South Wales um, and NBAN through the consultation process have uh, really cutting edge uh, co design, um, work to engage culturally appropriately with the nations uh, to address some of our core business, which was to gather information um, from the department and take out to our the, the relevant people that speak for country and for those areas and for the other different interest groups uh, around the draft routes, draft rules for floodplain harvesting licenses and also to report, deliver that information into a cultural considerations report once um, the people had a, an opportunity to give their, uh, you know, give their concerns around the floodplain harvesting reforms. So, you know, rights and interests, that's a tricky question for okay. us. Yeah. Thank you. I think we've got Gila back, Chair, is uh, maybe I'm not sure whether he heard the question. Yes. Yeah. Can you can you repeat it, please? It was just around um, whether or not you consider First Nations rights and interests interest have been uh, adequately considered as a part of the, this floodplain harvesting process by government. Well, part of our problem is that we we don't have sufficient uh, length of dialogue in relation to and um, in to, in relation to floodplain harvesting. And part of our problem is that we, um, we're we restricted in our participation because we just don't have the fiscal resources uh, to be able to represent our people properly. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of an issue um, in trying to communicate um, in short, you know, one hour, half hour uh, meetings with uh, bureaucrats around this. Um, you know, we're all they're all endeavouring to do the right thing, but unfortunately, we're we're a little bit stifled um, by uh, lack of resources and um, lack of being able to get at the table. And I think that could be improved if we are in a position uh, to be able to meet uh, face to face, because or Zoom regularly, because I know that we. Um, you know, we're trying desperately, everybody's trying desperately to um, to make sure that voices are heard. But, um, yeah, things are just not happening as, as they would. Um, we've had, and we've had some funding from New South Wales government. Um, in honesty, we had an arrangement uh, to uh, write up um, stuff on floodplain harvesting, but um, we're in a position now where we have to follow up. And um, I think, I, I think um, we're in a position where we're, um, trying to negotiate with the uh, state government uh, DPI to try and um, maintain an arrangement. I think NBAN has just made an arrangement um, 
to extend and, and receive some, uh, some funding to do some follow-up on floodplain harvesting and do some reporting back uh, with the staff. And um, so there's a whole number of things. But at, at a, at a uh, level, at nation level, with our people, um, we just don't have the resources. Our people can't meet. Um, we were unable to be able to get on country and meet with um, um, uh, bureaucrats around the planning. Um, simply, um, we're relying on NBAN uh, to do all the work, and um, and NBAN doesn't have the resources to be able to truly get out there and uh, consult with the nations, and that's that's a bit of a downer for us. Uh, thank you for that. Can I? I just want to talk. About, ask you a couple of questions around cultural water, uh, and and just how that works uh, in this in the floodplain harvesting arrangements that are being proposed. Um, again, I'm not sure whether Giller wants to go first and then and then maybe end band, but I just want to try and get my head around a better understanding of how it works. Let or if me, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's Giller here. Um, let me just talk to you about that. Um, my grandmother in 1902 was born on a um, floodplain water, water area where the old people used to go and camp all the time because of the birds uh, breeding cycles. That was in an area in northern, northern New South Wales at a place called Pine Gobbler, Moongulla. And these are natural water uh, wetlands and they normally get flooded um, when we have the big floods, the generational floods, the 8, 15 to 18 year uh, flood cycles, which are very big, big floods. And they go overland and come down through uh, the Mooney River, in our case, from the Mooney, um, flows into the Big Warrnambool, um, and then the the Narran Lake flows, Narran River flows into that same Big Warrnambool from Angledil, and across those country, that country there, that's where the, where we have a lot of watercourses and big uh, wetlands, and I think New South Wales has a um, uh, a small area there now registered as a um, what do they call them a reserve area, a nature reserve. And my grandmother was born on that plane. My dad's mother was born on a plane, plains, uh, floodplain area that ran off the Bundabrina Ridge south of Colorado Bright. Um, and that area is called uh, Dunhamville, where the late Mr. Ralph Hunt was a member and he owned that property called Dunhamville. And so my grandmother and her family, dad's mothers, come from that area at those wetlands. Now, these wetlands are very, very important to us. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, what we're seeing is massive destruction of these areas because um, under that uh, New South Wales Water Conservation and um, um, Biodiversity Law, they give them a right to clear these floodplains. And I think um, Leon Winters made reference to the fact that he's of the Miria people, which, and Miria is the floodplain uh, lignum. And uh, so his people come from the, those areas. And, um, you know, to watch those areas be cleared, because they're the areas that farmers target uh, to clear, because um, that's where the, where the water lays and where water um, um, pools when we have big rainfall and uh, we don't necessarily need floods. And so floodplain harvesting will also take that rainfall. And, um, and unfortunately, we're going to have massive destruction within those wetlands and those uh, watercourses. Thanks. Mr. Winters, have you, do you want to respond? Oh, I would just say that uh, with the destruction of those wetlands, it has major impacts on the rest of the country. Um, as it all is connected together in one way or the other, you know, if it's, if something happens to a particular thing on country, it is not the only place that it's been affected. The other part, the other thing that, uh, that I'd like to say is the reasoning why I throw to Michael for, for more of the uh, floodplain harvesting uh, political talk is because we're grassroots people and as he stated we don't get the resources and we don't have to hear enough about um, what's going on at that at levels at the grassroots levels about what's going on in, in regards to our country and water so that is one of the major problems sure and uh the good folk from nban is, is there some your views around uh this question on cultural water um, cultural water, I guess, is can be a bit of a contentious subject because it seems, seems that the departments always want to compartmentalise what cultural water is um, because it's also cultural flows. But for First Nations peoples, all water is cultural. And I guess the practice of floodplain harvesting 
greatly impacts, I guess, the results of what that cultural water would naturally do. Uh, there's been so many, I guess, developments and infrastructure and a whole range of things within the system, within the water system itself, that has affected, one, the way water flows, two, the amount of water that actually flows across the floodplains and actually recharges aquifers and recharges billabongs and wetlands and provides a whole range of things with regards to flora and fauna and totems like um, Gilla had said earlier. Um, so I guess the subject of cultural water can be a little bit deceptive because it, it always seems to be, I guess, placed in a little box. Um, cultural water isn't just about um, achieving any targets or aspirations for First Nations in a sense. First Nations look at water holistically and it's all cultural and it has spiritual connotations as well. And I think this is where the disconnect between water management and the involvement or inclusion of First Nations um, rights and interests um, becomes a contentious subject. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just, uh, Gila, in your um, uh, submission, I note you talk about a, uh, a cultural flows nation planning document um, which sort of advocates for extensive range of programs. Can you ex just uh, you can um, explain to us what that, or explain to the community just what that is, how that works? Yeah, yeah. That's um, we we um, talk about uh, the need to have uh, rangers monitoring the rivers. Um, you see, my my area, our, our country, the Oalea country, and um, many of the other First Nations people who are associated with NBAN who have membership to NBAN, our, our problem is that we have all these dams and weirs along river systems, and um, and these dams and weirs are diverted from the main mainstream systems. And so what we need, we, we need to look at how do we develop a range of program where our people have um, the ability uh, to be able to monitor what's going on and monitor our, our wetlands. We were talking about um, cultural water uh, just in the in the last question, and and part of our issue is that we must maintain the base flow within those rivers, and by having ranges within the system, they will be able to monitor those um, key water sites and um, and wetland areas, um, and this is what we need to have uh, to be able to facilitate our requirement in being able to look after our country. And, um, and be able to, I suppose, work with government agencies around the need for water, because I know we're working, NBAN has been working with uh, CHUO to try and get, a, get CHUO to understand um, our cultural requirements um, that they're looking at. And we're saying, well, when we, when we talk about cultural water, uh, this is part of that management. And, the, and only those rangers um, within each of the nations will have those capacities to do that. And I, I notice that there is has been a plan put out just recently uh, for a range of monitor programs and training programs, or at least New South Wales is considering that. Uh, the sooner we can get that program up and running, the better, because that will serve to um, to deal with all of those things that we have talked about in, the, um, in our nation plans. Mm. Thank you very much. The opposition's question time has expired. We'll move to questions from the cross bench. I'll kick off with a couple. I just wanted, just as a general question to, to each of you, just wanting to know if you could describe the impact on your country of the massive increase in floodplain harvesting storages that have occurred over the past couple of decades. We've heard obviously a lot from different witnesses over the last two days of hearing. I just was wondering what you could tell the committee about what impact that has had on your people and your country. We'll start with the first person I can see on my screen here, Mr. Winters. Yeah. Um... After doing some uh, research along the river systems of the Narrow River and so forth, um, we found that uh, there, there's so much stagnant water that that is out there in blackened, brackish water that uh, it was uh, chemicals were, were in, when we were testing the chemical amounts were far over what they should be within the river system. Um, the flow and heights, the natural flow and the heights of the river, aren't at acceptable levels to. Uh, look after things like our uh, shrimp and crayfish that, that breed at a certain level. 
in the in the river system and the the trees. Can I ask to Mr. Winters, sorry to interrupt, but just to kind of be a bit specific in terms of the location for us as well for the where where you're. Okay, that, that that was along the uh, Narran River that we done the uh, research. Um, yeah, and you know the amount the amount of uh, birds that we would usually see nesting were were weren't around. Um, taking going away from the river out on onto the plains where those natural flood waters would flow and would actually pick up seedlings, would spread uh, nutrients. Um, our uh, native fruits and foods, are, have, uh, even the plants that are, are still existing, are very, very, uh, they lost all the bushels off them. Um, lots of our uh, medicines that we still use, our, our trees right. aren't um, producing the medicines that we used to Get out there because they're not getting the, the the water flow to to make that happen, and um, they're they're all a community and they work off each other. And because of that water flow isn't there, they can't work together. They can't survive. They're not surviving. And even if you look at the, the gum trees alone, the amount of foliage that's disappeared. You know, you, you drive along, and years ago we used to be able to see it. Things like a, one of the Insects that used to be on our country were the uh, hairy caterpillars that get along. And we used to know when the floods and everything, we don't were coming because they get in a big line and they go across the country. They're no longer there. The, the, the sounds and the, the feelings that were there a long time ago are just gone because uh, we've, we've lost our what we can do with our connection because we can't get to those things because they're not there no more. So it's Simple killing thing. it's killing your country, Mr. Winters. It sounds like it surely is. It, it 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 really is. It's having a major impact on it. And if if we don't work on it soon, you know, and get funds to work on it soon to bring that type of country back, and and have discussions about how we can get these major flows back onto country. You know, it's not yeah, well. a detriment of just. It's a detriment of all humans, not just us, because it, you, you know, in some way, we're all connected to this. Now, we all come from the come from the same thing in the beginning of evolution, and this is once this is what this is going on is destroying it. This is about humanity. Nature will come one day. You know, even if this earth blows up, it comes back as, as science tells you. But you know, we're talking about how humanity. How do we all survive, and how do we make it equal, equal for us all? Mr. Winters, I'll go to Gillar and then and Van. Gillar, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, just just um, just going on from what um, Leon has, has, has spoken about. Um, the fact is that we we must um, have, have access. We must be able to monitor. We must be able to register what's going on. The the fact that um, floodplain harvesting, there's two. We, we're we're focusing on. Um, discussion about overland flows from uh, the rivers. But one of the things that's being ignored and not being discussed sufficiently enough is the rainfall across country. And so if that rainfall is flow is across country, I, I already know farmers who have already made illegal bunding uh, levees and channels uh, to capture that floodplain, even on some small flat country out here in the West. Um, that these fellas are actually making these illegal, um, creating these illegal bundings, and that water is now is then being directed into their own uh, water catchment now illegally. They don't have a license for this already, and um, you know we, we've got satellites up there, and I go to the satellites every now and then, and I can see all these illegal um, um, uh, infrastructure programs that are designed to stop that rainfall. Now our problem, uh, the, the problem with that is that a lot of that rainfall that we know, as I grew up as a child on the riverbanks, we'd see that more big rainfall maybe up around, you know, St George somewhere or during Bandy, and and this rainfall would then go back into the river, and that would send a small fresh, what we call a fresh down the river system, and then all the fish would move, and that, and the you know, old people would say there's a fresh there coming now. Go and catch some fish because they the fish are starting to move because of that fresh. We start interfering with that natural process 
on capturing that rainfall that falls onto that country, then we're not going to have that fresh. We're not going to be able to see that. And um, and this is our big concern because the, the impacts are, are very significant. And unfortunately, you know, people have, um, we, we've had people living in our country all this time and they still don't understand the country. They still don't understand how it works. And we're trying to work hard with government through consultation processes to be able to inform them of of what we know. But no one, not enough people are listening and we need to start planning this. We've got to look at being able to balance our interests and our cultural and spiritual interest against the need for economic development. And I, I don't think one should give way to the other. Thank you, Gila. If um, With the committee's indulgence, can I just get um, Mr Ford or Ms Kirkyard's response to that, even though my time has expired? Um, thank you. I, I do see that you're wanting to answer that as well. Yeah, yeah. Jason, yeah. Jason Ford here. Um, look, so the question was impacts since uh, floodplain works or floodplain harvesting had taken place. Look, from from floodplain harvesting has been going on for years and years and years and years, well before these reforms or rules were been you know suggested or proposed to whatever people whoever the powers are to be. But my my thing is is that yeah, we never had the illegal stuff that's going on. That's uh, you know, not the majority of the people within the industry, but it's it's there are there are people within the industry that are uh, abusing that there are no rules and then and, and they can't be and the regulations can't um, prosecute them. So that's a problem for us guys as First Nations people. And and my response to um, that is that is that you know the impacts for us as First Nations people are as what uh, Gilla and also, and also, Mr. Winters have said, um, you know, we're, we're experiencing the side effects of not being able to regulate this. So, in any in any form, we can't ring anyone, we can't do anything with anyone. And you know, this is why NBAN, you know, and the nations, when we're going out, we're we're looking for a solution. Um, there's got to be some reforms around this and some rules around it because the people that are in the industry and the, uh, are, are getting away with doing what they want because there's no legal avenue for anyone to prosecute anyone and the you know it, in just to just to keep it short this is why you know i believe nban as a peak body for the first nations people have engaged with and are, are very interested in, in working with um or, uh, you know are committed to working with new south wales to see what the people think about the reforms to make sure and then we can get the you know their feedback to go back into a cultural consideration report that can support trying to have a sustainable system in place because the current the current status quo is is totally unsustainable um there's no no way that we can uh, regulate it and for us guys you know we want we want to be part of something that is contributing to the system as holistically as first nations people and that's what the feedback we're getting. I know the feedback we are getting, they say that we don't want any floodplain harvesting whatsoever. And that's the truth of it. That's what a lot of our people say. But, you know, if they are going to continue to not have any rules, I'll tell you, it's open slather for us, for, for the, the guys to continue doing what they're doing. We're going to have experiences like we had in Brewarna at our famous fish traps and further down the line like that in Wilkenia. So that's my response to, you know, the impacts for us guys. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll um, go to questions from Mr. Mark Benaziak now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I might start with um, Gillo and, and Leon. Um, outside of this inquiry, um, how would you describe the engagement you've had with the state, state government and the department regarding uh, these floodplain harvesting proposals? Because I note in your submission, you were fairly scathing um about a, a non-adherence to the commonwealth water act in, in including first nations if i can it's killer um just the, around that one of the one of my um uh, criticisms i guess of the of the um commonwealth water act is the fact that they they're subject to um what do they call it the uh, convention on Des desertification 
Um, they're also they also have obligations under various um, uh, international uh, treaties, like the Jamba Kamba um, uh, uh, treaties of uh, migra migratory birds, and unfortunately, they're not properly um, dealing with those matters in all this water planning. They seem to be a, a byproduct right now and they're not really focusing uh, much attention on it. The one that we're particularly concerned about and um, with the Uali is that mate, I, I live on the Bakara River and the, the Balandu River, these are what they call intersecting streams coming out of the lower Boulogne area of uh, Queensland. And we know this is a major area for, um, uh, for harvesting water. Uh, for cotton. Now our problem is that in from 2012 uh, to 2019, we had the driest area, uh, time ever. And part of our problem was the country almost turned into a desert and it still is like that, it's still trying to recover. And um, unfortunately, because of the wind and the, de and the uh, you know, the enormous dust storms that we experienced in that time, that flew from you know far west and south Australia. One of the things that's happening is we're starting to see a lot of growth of um, um, uh, what do they call them weeds and pests uh, that are not natural to our environment, and this this has become a major concern for us. So the desertification um, uh, convention is not being complied with, and it's not being part of the discussions either with the state or Commonwealth in terms of uh, water resource planning. And I'm, I'm, I'm just disappointed that uh, they don't live up to the Ramsar uh, commitments that they have on the Narran Lakes and, and feeding the Narran River, um, because the preference, of course, is uh, Cubby Station um, and all those big uh, cotton stations, Clyde, Clyde interests that are on the Narran all the way up the lower Bruin to St George. And so we've got a, we've got a major problem. The, the data that we have uh, as a nation is that 24% of the total water mass in one year gets across the uh, the, the uh, border of New South Wales Queensland, and that's that's not that's not good enough. And so we need to um, uh, be very mindful of of this desertification. If you travel in our country out here now, between Walgett, Lightning Ridge, Collarindabri, right to the border, the number of trees that you will see out there on the floodplains that have died and on the ridges that have died because of lack of rain. Uh, it, it's quite frightening. And um, yeah, it's, it's a big concern to us. So climate change and adaptability and adaptation is totally necessary for us to really get into. I think, I think um, the state government and the Commonwealth would do very well to work with us on this as, as First Nations peoples, and also with the uh, farmer community and irrigating community, because we'll all benefit if we plan this properly. Can I can I also just um, just touch on another matter in in your submission you you talked about I guess a, a notion of solastalgia where you which has been exacerbated by not being able to access key water holes springs uh, river reaches um, for fishing um, does it also is that solastalgia also frust um, I guess further exacerbated by the fact that we had this fisheries management. Uh, amendment passed in 2010, which properly in, or tried to enshrine cultural fishing in, in law, and this government still hasn't actually, to this day, enacted uh, legislation. It's 11 years, and we still don't have a proper recognition in, in law uh, around cultural fishing in this state. Yeah. Well, can I, yeah, I, I just responding to that, um, along right along the river system, our old people, when the colonialists first came out here, when they were droving, all the droving uh, periods, they showed them where the, all those big water holes were. And quite frankly, they made the government back then made it so that they were accessible for water, stop watering points. And it was these points of these big water holes um, and river reaches that our old people used to always have free access to. Then the New South Wales government leased these lands to the nearest farmer or adjacent farmer. And he's, they've actually fenced these these areas off, and we don't have access to it. And and mate, seeing a locked gate is a real shock to our people, and and you know the the, the mental harm that it's done to our people 
is quite significant because they complain and they always talk about, you know, these white fellas always locking gates on us. That one time we used to have free access down there. What's wrong? What happened? How come the government never told us they were going to stop all that, you know? So this is the sort of um, um, solastalgia that happens. And that in itself goes into me the mental health side of it. And, it. and unfortunately, you know, this mental health turns to other things like um, we've got no place to take our, our children. The old people got nowhere to feel comfortable and being being able to connect to their country and being able to connect to their culture. And so they don't pass on the knowledge to the kids. I asked the question one time in, in St. George, Queensland, how come you're not talking to the kids about story in the backyard at a barbecue? So they can always the same thing. Nah, that's not the same because it's better for us to sit on the river and tell it because then it's real. And so this is, is cutting out our cultural knowledge and it's having significant impacts on us. And so, the, you know, we need to look at uh, and revisit uh, those old watering stock points to make sure that we do have access to them. It's, you know, you have easements for, for a lot of other things, um, and I think you know we need easements for this purpose as well, and that would that would contribute significantly to our people. And that way, then we as a nation are able to talk about the health of the river because we're watching that water all the time, we're monitoring it, and so the people become the rangers themselves just by being there. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, my time's elapsed. I'd love to pass to the government. So thank, thank you, you Mr. Benaziak. So, government, yeah, Mr. Franklin. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And again, thank you all for being here today. Um, we're really, really grateful for your insight and your for your perspective in this uh, critical area. Um, I just wanted to ask a question that sort of followed up on Mr. Veach's question about rights and interests, and a question that I raised in the last session too, which is, um, what you what you believe and what you think that native title rights over water are. Um, and uh, if you could talk about that issue a little in terms of um, uh, your perspectives, that'd be great. Perhaps we might start with um, uh, NBAN with uh, Ms Kierkegaard and Mr Ford. Sorry, in my experience with native title, there's not actually a lot around rights and interest in water other than access. Um, we're beginning to understand, I guess, that during the time of a native title application and the process before consent determination is the time to actually negotiate any rights to water. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot in the Native Title Act that gives us any real rights and interests in water other than access um, and being able to fish and hunt and, and all those kinds of things. So it's, it's really minimal and quite tokenistic, to be honest. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Winters or Gilla, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I do, as Gilla. Um, Please. I, we, I, I sat on the science on, the, um, on a committee uh, that went for three and a half years looking at cultural flows. And, uh, and we did that with um, Melbourne University um, and uh, the National Native Title Tribunal um, uh, auspiced everything for us. And one of the things that we, we, we came up with and we looked at, and that is the question of uh, uh, rights versus ownership, uh, rights versus, um, uh, what do they call it, um, uh, entitlement. And we um, argued, and, and um, the law, the legal law faculty of Melbourne um, also agreed with us from a human rights perspective and the international uh, UNDRIP, and uh, that's the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, along with all the other um, international laws that have now been imported into Australian law through the Native Title Act, the ATSIC Act. One of the things that um, I have access to is a is a brief from uh, Mr. Orr QC, Richard Orr QC, which talks about um, Aboriginal native title rights be um, common law rights. Unfortunately, native title does in fact interfere with um, our rights to ownership as the ancient owners under our law and custom. And so there's this, there's, there, is, there are questions, legal questions, that are yet to be answered in this country in relation to the ownership of water and land in relation to Aboriginal people. The Native Title Service doesn't do anything for us, um, just as because, simply because if you look at uh, when Native Title Rights and Interests are recognised and they say you have exclusive possession to land, there is no tenure that goes with that land 
nearly goes to um, uh, what they call um, st unused state land. That's the title uh, native title land has. And this this is totally racially discriminatory. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gilla. They are, they are very um, helpful perspectives. Um, could I move to just some questions uh, to NBAN, if that's okay, please? Um, uh, just a, a similar question, I guess, to the one that I asked Mildred. Are you? Uh, do you represent all Indigenous nations in the Northern Basin? Is that is that your is that your role, your gamut? No, um, we we more advocate for the nations, and there's, I think there's currently nineteen or twenty member nations of NBAN um, in the northern part of the basin. Yeah, so there's a, a couple of groups that do their own thing, um, and there's some groups that we don't currently have delegates for. Uh, but normally we do advocate on behalf of and work with those nations for their rights and interest in water. And how are the delegates, uh, are they elected by um, by their own uh, mobs or are they appointed or, or how? Yep, um, they are appointed to NBAN's membership through their own nation's governance structures, whatever they right. may be. So that's not something that NBAN, NBAN doesn't appoint people. Yeah. No problem at all. Can I um, ask about the water resource plans for Queensland, which I think that NBAN um, was involved with, might have signed off on. Um, basically, my question is, what was your take on those? And with regard, particularly, obviously, to floodplain um, harvesting, do you think they got it right? And do you have any comments that you want to make about, about the Queensland experience? It's just come up a few times with witnesses already. Yeah, so I was involved in the assessment of those water resource plans in Queensland. I was. Um, the biggable delegate on NBAN at that point in time, uh, which was a number of years ago now. So it's kind of a little bit in the background. Yeah. Um, I think the process in Queensland was quite a bit different to the process in New South Wales. Um, and I actually don't remember floodplain harvesting being talked a great deal about in the water resource plans from memory. Did you, do you want to add anything to that, Mr. Ford? Sorry. I Thought yeah. you were enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to just add to that there, but look, just in, just to give people a bit of background, I was a cons I've got my own company as well that was the this is for the New South Wales water resource plan stuff, but um, and I developed a culturally appropriate methodology that was implemented by uh, New South Wales DPI as a in good faith they wanted to get uh, create a proper or or try a to get it right to speak to the right people on country about how we uh, do business and develop these water resource plans. Um, floodplain harvesting was never uh, um, on the radar at the time. It was around uh, it was around uh, objectives, uh, our objectives and outcomes, and also around our values and uses. We were gathered. It was an exercise, I suppose, in New South Wales, and I was, I'm pretty sure it was pretty similar in New in Queensland. That the exercise was to you know, by the states was being consistent with the Murray Darlin Basin Authority and uh, Chapter 10, Part 14, and trying to make sure that we they were, uh, I suppose, complying with, you know, with the regulation, with what they had to comply with from the feds. Um, but floodplain harvesting was never really, our people, well, this is only an emerging thing for us, even I've been in the water space for a while, while now, and floodplain harvesting and and I've never heard much about it until we had some of the problems that took place within the system and the reforms were I suppose in the pipeline for that as well and our people have only just started to experience that stuff learn about the stuff as well um so to be totally honest I can say from from the New South Wales development of the water resource plants it was absent but as far as um Queensland I'd say it'd be pretty consistent as well yeah okay thank you um in our previous session, we just heard from Milgen and they just mentioned in answer to one of my questions that um, they um, they weren't involved or they'd withdrawn from the um, New South Wales Aboriginal Water Advisory Coalition, mm -hmm. um, which to me on the face of it seemed concerning. And I was just wondering if you have any uh, views or what your um, concern, if you have any concerns about that or if you could clarify any thoughts you have about that. Yeah, so the, the process of actually doing the Aboriginal Water Coalition or being a part of the Aboriginal Water Coalition was a task that was undertaken by a previous um, previous chair. Um, right. When it was come, when it was brought to the board about being involved in that and what that meant, there was a lot of misunderstanding about what that should be or 
or what that act role actually entailed as being a part of that water coalition. Um, and I guess we had similar concerns to Mildred around that. Um, some of the board members expressed their concern about um, the AWC making decisions on behalf of nations and then losing that grassroots voice um, and that, you mm. know, those the people that the delegates at NBAN represent and that same as with Mildred um, would actually be left out of things and that it would rather than being an integrated way of decision making that it would be more a top down rather than a bottom up or any kind of mix of whatever that should be. So they, that's what the concerns were. Um, there were some other concerns also around um, and it always comes back to right people for right country. Um, decision making around what happens on country should be done by the traditional owners of that country, not representatives from other um, TO groups that sit on boards or um, you know, like with the land councils or um, or whatever else. And I guess the other issue, particularly with NTS Corp, I believe um, has nothing to do specifically around native title and native title groups. Um, that that representation on the AWC by NTS Corp is. Uh, the concern for that was more around the fact that um, they're, 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 a, yeah, they're a service provider and not necessarily First Nations people either to be able to speak on behalf of the nations that they represent. They're a legal representative body. So it was, yeah, that's where the concerns lied. Got it. Thank you. That's um, I really appreciate uh, your responses there. Just a final question from me. Um, to the um, ULEI uh, representatives, probably Giller, but but uh, happy with uh, whoever you like. And it was just um, a question, I guess, about when um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I think it's Magilla, Magilla, um, Magilla Station was returned to your people. Um, I was just wondering, did it come with a water license? Uh, and if so, um, were you able to use it? How were you able to use it? I'm just interested in a little bit of background. Um, yeah, it's Gila. Um yeah, we. Um, I, I'm sitting right here at the homestead of Mogla. Um, right, Mogla. Have, my apologies. Yeah, Mogla, and we we do have a license, um, um, a 30 um, meg um, license, and uh, but we we rarely use that because you know you you've got to have all the infrastructure around it as well. Um, the old man James Richmond, who previously owned the property, used it from time to time. Um, just to irrigate a small crop um, of uh, lucerne and um, we and pumps because of the big the floods over the years uh, we've had to replace those uh, those pumps but we haven't really used it we use it um, from time to time uh, but not 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 as you would if you were growing something the other thing we had licenses in Queensland as well on Currawillingai um, which is another property that's on the on the Ballander River and um, we that comes off that um, of the um, lower Boulogne, and we had we had two licenses there. But when the land was purchased, the um, the Queensland government um, uh, took back those licenses, and uh, they uh, they revoked those licenses and took them back into the state government. Now, if I can just add to what um, what Tanya and what your previous question about our relationship to Queensland. I was on that uh, committee as well, reviewing those right. Queensland water licenses. And one of the one of the issues that I had, and the major issue I had, was that when we when we were talking about it, I found it very difficult uh, to participate in approving those water licenses because of the fact that we were told that all the water in the Condamine and the Boulogne and, and the other rivers, Mooney and everything else, even though Mooney is not an unregulated river, was that there was no water, no surface water um, for any of the nations because they'd all, it's all been exhausted. And, and, and so we, we were not, uh, there was nothing planned there and they couldn't plan anything for us. And we thought that was, you know, that was quite, it, it was a bit of shock. And um, I, I thought, well, why are we approving this here when we're not, our people are not going to benefit in any way whatsoever? Despite the fact that Queensland um, amended their legislation um, to say that Aboriginal people had uh, the right to take unused water. 
um, within their system for economic, cultural and social um, purposes and spiritual purposes. Um, but that, that sort of creates a bit of a, uh, a bit of a misnomer because we, we, you know, the people don't have infrastructure. We don't know how much land is owned um, by Aboriginal people. They Only those nations do. Uh, we, we're about to do an audit of those nations on that. But they told us that we could have access to bull water um, that's the upper level aquifers, shallow aquifers, the great artesian basin, and the deep water. Now, you know, our problem is that, you know, it's a long way down there to dig a, dig a well, you know, with our hands, because we don't have the electronic machinery and the big machinery to be able to drill a bore, a borehole, and it's co- it'll cost about $400,000 to do it. Then you've got to do the piping, and I can tell you, it's a long way to carry a bucket of water from those places if we do dig a hole and, and get wells. It's not, there's no way in the world that we... that any of that would be able to assist First Nations peoples because we just don't have the financial resources to do it on the nation so that we can get access to that um, uh, that water, deep water, uh, greater Asian water and shallow water. We just don't have the infrastructure to do it or the ability to be able to do that. Thank you so much, Gillard. I have to, um, unfortunately, we are out of time again. And once again, we could have had so many more questions for all of you. I just wanted to thank you very much for appearing before this very important inquiry today. And uh, yeah, we have uh, taken everything that you said uh, very seriously and deeply. So thank you for appearing. We will now finish today's hearing. So that is the end of the um, live stream. So thank you very much. If you've taken any questions on notice, the Secretariat will also be in touch.